Chapter One of Making Fate. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Making Fate by Pansy. Chapter One Waiting. Mrs. Edmonds had tried every chair in the room, from the straight backed, uncompromising one nearest to the dining room to the wide-armed sleepy hollow in the alcove but none of them fitted her restless mood twice she had resolutely settled herself on the wide old-fashioned pillowy lounge arranged the pillows at head and back with infinite pains drawn the bright-coloured afghan over her and resolved to rest only to spring up again in five minutes and renew her walk up and down the room broken only by a pause to peer out first at the western and then at the southern window it was a pleasant enough prospect outside the rain had been falling in torrents and the little river which it had made still gurgled down the gutters glistening in the brilliant moonlight the street was quite still during the hours which mrs edmonds had waited there had been the sound of many feet and the sound had been listened to by this woman as though her hope of life depended on her finding the footstep she waited for occasionally there had been one so like what she sought that she held her breath for it to draw near and pass all the while her swift beating heart telling her that if it had been the footstep she would have known it oh as far away as the sound could reach her yet still she waited for each new one in the same breathless hopeful way as the hours waned the passers-by grew less and less frequent until now the most belated traveller seemed to have reached home and she was still waiting she turned from the window once more and the odour of coffee reached her it seemed to be hateful to her she went swiftly and closed the door which led from the dining-room into the little kitchen leaving the tiny coffee-pot to its fate they were pretty rooms sitting and dining room with folding doors between the doors were rolled back out of sight and the portieres so looped as to give a view of the dining table daintily laid for two people who must both have had very refined tastes the napery was fine and fresh the china delicate and the silver sterling the edmonds family had lived nearly always in a larger house than this their table had been drawn out often full length and was wont to be surrounded by merry happy people time and change had left only two and the table had to be closed to its smallest but there seemed no reason why the family heirlooms in silver and china should be laid away so the table was pretty as of old mrs edmonds surveyed its prettiness almost with a groan she had allowed herself to become so nervous over possibilities that all her dainty preparations for a late supper looked like so many mockeries still she went once more and sat down in the sleepy hollow drawing a wrap about her and resolving to be reasonable what could have happened she asked herself for the hundredth time not an accident surely because there were so many of them that we should have heard of it before this time as for their not starting for home to-night that is nonsense don't i know that i would never be left here alone more than that she promised her mental argument was interrupted by the sound of footsteps overhead and her thoughts were turned into a new channel mr maxwell was at home then she had not heard a sound from his room before he must have let himself in when she went to the coal closet for that lump of coal it was strange he was up so late or rather so early for the little clock on the dining-room mantel at that moment murmured in soft silvery tones one two they struck terror to the watcher's heart it was actually two o'clock and marjorie for the first time in all her nineteen years was away from her the mother started abruptly and giving herself no more time for thought made her way with all speed up the long flight of stairs and knocked at her lodger's door what if he was a comparative stranger having been settled in her best front room less than a month 
he was a man and would know what should be done in an emergency and she really could not endure this suspense longer visions of what marjorie might say concerning this appeal to the lodger in her behalf crossed the troubled mother's brain as she sped but she resolutely put them aside and knocked at the closed door it was opened on the instant and mr maxwell fully dressed and looking as though he had not thought of sleep that night stood before her i beg your pardon she said speaking hurriedly but i am so worried about my daughter that i don't know what to do i heard your step just now and determined to come and advise with you the door was opened wider and mr maxwell reached forth and took the little night lamp from a hand which trembled at the same time he motioned toward an easy chair come in mrs edmonds and have a seat while you tell me how i can serve you your daughter is not ill i hope oh no why i don't know what she is i have thought that perhaps she had been taken suddenly ill but there were eight of them they cannot all be ill and surely they would have come for her mother all of which did not enlighten mr maxwell she is not at home then he ventured thus helped mrs edmonds gathered her wits and explained a party of eight including her daughter had started that morning on a nutting expedition at the schuyler farm seven miles out they were to be joined by the young people there and go on to the extreme southern part of the schuyler woods some five or six miles farther the plan had been to return to the schuylers for an early tea after which the guests were to drive home by moonlight but they were to have been at home by ten at the latest indeed marjorie had exclaimed over that hour and said that she must be home by nine and now mrs edmonds finished hurriedly her face paling over the thought it is after two o'clock and i know something has happened to them what can i do mr maxwell essayed to comfort her you have forgotten the storm he said cheerily it doubtless came up just at the time they were to start and it rained very hard you remember moreover the storm lasted a remarkably long time no she had forgotten nothing she knew just when that first flash of lightning came and just how long the rain continued and just how brilliant the moonlight had been since the storm was over ample time for them to have reached home two hours ago even though they had not started until the sky was entirely clear again you forget she said pitifully that it will soon be three o'clock in the morning do you know the road to the schuyler farm mr maxwell there is a bridge to cross about five miles out over a very ugly stream of water the embankments there are very high and the sides of the bridge are not protected more than that i think i have heard somebody say that the bridge is unsafe it is possible that they may have driven over the side or the bridge may have fallen and they may all be in peril together he made haste to reassure her oh no indeed he knew the bridge well was over it indeed not twelve hours ago it was perfectly safe and no driver in his senses would be in danger of driving off the embankment had the party not a reliable driver mrs edmonds admitted that mr ralph bramlett was the driver that he drove his father's horses and was perfectly accustomed to them but then they were spirited animals and were doubtless afraid of lightning many horses were and if nothing had happened to them why had they not reached home long ago then mr maxwell had another idea was not the schuyler farm the hospitable mansion where so many young people were entertained he had heard that it was the custom for large parties from town to spend several days there undoubtedly this nutting party detained by the storm had accepted the invitation of the schuylers to spend the night and take an early morning ride it would have been a perfectly reasonable thing to do because they probably feared another storm and besides they would naturally dislike to disturb several families by coming home at a late hour in fact the more he thought about it the more certain he was that there was no occasion for anxiety her daughter was undoubtedly sleeping quietly 
then mrs edmonds rose up and reached for her lamp and her voice had a dignified tinge i beg your pardon mr maxwell i ought not to have disturbed you of course you cannot be expected to understand i am sure you mean to comfort me but my daughter would not for one moment have consented to spending the night away from home and leaving me in suspense and anxiety concerning her even if she had not promised she would not have done such a thing but her last words to me were that she should be at home before ten i knew the storm must detain them however and rested quietly until near midnight but the sky has been entirely clear since a little before ten there is no conceivable reason except by accident which could have kept my daughter from me but of course you do not understand he intercepted her hand and took charge of the little lamp again let me carry it down for you he said cheerily i still think you have no cause for anxiety the company was too large not to be able to be heard from in some way before this time in case of accident still i really can understand something of a mother's feelings i have a dear mother of my own i'll tell you what we will do mrs edmonds if you will lie down and rest i'll mount my horse and take a trip toward the schuyler farm and learn the facts i was making ready for a very early start in another direction and selim will be saddled and bridled waiting for me but i can easily make the trip later or wait until another day for that matter up to that moment mrs edmonds had not shed a tear but at the sound of the sympathetic voice planning a scheme that would at least relieve her of this terrible suspense she lost for the moment her carefully trained self-control and broke into a fit of weeping mr maxwell made no attempt to restrain the tears he gently seated the trembling lady in the chair from which she had risen then went briskly about his room making final preparations for departure talking cheerily the while it will be a very short ride out to the farm mrs edmonds for selim and me and by the time you have had one nap we shall be back here with good news from the truants young people cannot always be depended upon for excellent judgment and your daughter remember may have had difficulty in making so large a party see with her eyes i beg your pardon said mrs edmonds rising again and resolutely pushing back the tears i must seem very weak to you but indeed i am not in the habit of being without my daughter i ought not to allow you to put aside your plans for the sake of relieving my anxiety my daughter would be shocked at such a thought i presume it may be as you think and yet she did not finish her sentence aloud in her heart she said that marjorie would have no difficulty in controlling the movement of ralph bramlett that he was only too willing to do as she wished and that he controlled the horses but of course this could not be said aloud mr maxwell finished the sentence for her and yet certainty is better than surmise he said brightly i know it we will very soon relieve your mind do not be troubled about disarranging my plans mrs edmonds i assure you it is of no consequence i have no business which cannot as well be done another day if that were necessary now i am ready and you will i am sure remember your part of the contract and try to rest may i help to rest you by a reminder that your daughter is in the care of one who cannot be overcome by accidents of any sort oh i know it she said gratefully you will think me very foolish but there have been times to-night when i believe i should have lost my reason if i could not have stayed my fears with that i am so unused to being without my child we have been all in all to each other for thirteen years and yet what is my trust worth there came a time when as you see i could wait no longer yes he said smiling that is the way we trust him yet he bears with us i read with great satisfaction only yesterday the story of gideon do you remember how many times the lord strengthened his wavering faith by a sign we all like props of this kind i think i can bring you word in an hour at the latest mrs edmonds she stood in the hall noting the sound of his retreating footsteps 
she listened to their brisk ring until they were lost in the distance she was alone again but her throat felt less dry the tears had relieved it her heart did not seem to beat in such oppressive thuds yes undoubtedly she liked human props how kind he had been and how quick the swiftness of his movements had had a soothing effect upon her at least the sickening suspense with its opportunity to conjecture all sorts of horrible possibilities would soon be over he would bring her word and he was good too how strong that reminder was about the one who had her daughter in charge oh the mother trusted him what would her years of widowhood have been without his mighty arm to lean upon if only he were her daughter's trust well and if no she would not finish that as thought loyalty to her daughter should make her put it away what was mr maxwell but a stranger come for a few weeks to pay a good price for their vacant room and ralph bramlett had grown up with marjorie and had always been her friend why should she for a moment allow herself to wish that he were like mr maxwell she sat down in her reading chair and drew the shaded lamp towards her she had not promised to try to sleep she knew better than to try she did not remember the story of gideon very well she wanted to read it she had some difficulty in finding the story and in picking it out from various chapters she stopped many times during its reading to listen to imaginary sounds on the street she decided that if she could have had gideon's signs she surely could have trusted meantime mr maxwell and Salim were on their way to the schuyler farm End of chapter 1chapter two of making fate by pansy this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two a victim it was a very merry company which gathered in the schuyler farmhouse detained as they fondly believed by the unusually severe and long-continued thunderstorm it had been a genuine detention at first while the lightning flashed continually and the earth seemed fairly to tremble under the roar of thunder they had been grave enough more than one of the group silently wishing herself safely at home the bountiful supper which had been spread in the hospitable dining-room was neglected while the storm raged oh dear one of the guests had said we cannot eat while it is thundering so and though bob schuyler remarked philosophically that thunder didn't hurt anybody and was ready for his supper it was by common consent remanded to the kitchen to be kept hot and cold while the nutting party regrouped themselves in the centre of the large parlour as far away from windows as possible and talked in somewhat subdued tones and waited as for marjorie edmonds she did not talk at all she could not help remembering that her mother was inclined to be nervous during a thunderstorm one of her earliest recollections was of hearing her father say we must go downstairs little girl and help mamma be cheerful while this storm lasts of late years she had taken up that father's work or tried to and was generally at hand to help mamma be cheerful during a storm now she was perhaps quite alone and when an unusually brilliant flash of lightning flooded the room followed instantly by the deafening peal of thunder marjorie wished earnestly that she had not left her but when the thunder ceased and the rain which had been falling in torrents came only in gentle drops the spirits of the company began to rise they were ready now for pleasantries and merry little thrusts at the expense of the more nervous by the time the belated supper was again ready the rain had ceased altogether and the guests were hilarious that is most of them were it was impossible for marjorie edmonds being the girl she was to forget that they were still seven miles from home and the hour was nearing in which she had told her mother they would be sure to return but then of course mother would take the storm into consideration and not expect them so early it was surprising how long they lingered at that supper-table 
the clock struck ten while they were still eating nuts and guessing conundrums and they lingered still in spite of the fact that it would now be nearly midnight before they could hope to reach home marjorie who had a vivid imagination and was well acquainted with her mother could hardly restrain her impatience she had finished her meal long before and sat back waiting had she been seated near enough to ralph bramlett to have given him a word in undertone she felt that matters might be hastened for ralph bramlett was a power among the young people but fate had placed her the length of the table from him and on the same side as himself so that she could not even send him a meaning glance there was nothing for it but to wait until those thoughtless creatures had finished their nuts and their stories there were the douglas sisters hindering as much as any although their father was an invalid and would be sure to get no sleep until they were safe at home it was while they still surrounded the table that mrs schuyler hospitably inclined said i think it would be a good plan for you to remain all night it is getting late and we may have another shower i don't suppose the weather is settled we have plenty of room and shall be delighted to have you stay a chorus of voices greeted this sentence the schuyler girls in eager seconding of their mother's invitation some of the guests in earnest protest others of them declaring that it would be great fun and one or two explaining that they must be at home very early in the morning well said mrs schuyler that might be managed if you really cannot stay to breakfast you might plan for a very early morning ride it is light enough for driving soon after four o'clock and a much pleasanter hour for it than late at night in a storm there was much eager talking and marjorie who had not at first given much heed not deeming it possible that so absurd a plan should carry weight began to be seriously alarmed oh for a word with ralph what if he should commit himself to some of those silly girls who actually wanted to stay and keep their families in anxiety ralph was very tenacious of his word if he promised them he would not go it might require more persuasion than she was willing to make to carry her point yet her point must be carried at all hazards just that which she feared was happening at that moment oh you won't stay estelle douglas was saying to ralph i think it would be a real lark to do so but i have not the slightest expectation of it marjorie edmonds will look at you with those great brown eyes of hers and murmur something about being in haste to start and you will go out and harness the horses though one of them should be struck with lightning while you are doing it and though a cyclone should carry away the wagon somehow you will manage to get her home and make the rest of us go in your train of course now ralph bramlett being a weak young man easily swayed by impulse was of course painfully susceptible to such talk as this really he said his face flushing under her merry gaze i do not know why you should suppose me to be a person so utterly devoid of common sense of course i will stay if the majority of my party wish to do so though i had not supposed that you would on account of making the people at home anxious his tormentor laughed merrily that is too funny she said gaily don't you know we are all aware that you respond to marjorie's slightest nod you have even caught her phraseology the rest of us give our parents credit for some common sense but marjorie knows that her mother proceeds to worrying about her as soon as she is out of sight and has to be humored accordingly i don't blame you ralph marjorie is a prize worth winning and she isn't to be won by people who do not know enough to bow when she does and shake their heads in accordance with her negatives but she is a dear girl and worthy of all manner of concessions after that it was unfortunate that marjorie's first words when she met him at last in the parlor were oh ralph won't you see about the horses at once it is growing so late and i cannot think what mother will do if we are not there soon your mother will be reasonable of course he answered coldly 
more coldly than he was in the habit of speaking to Marjorie. I do not know that we shall go at all. I must consider the wishes of the entire party, Marjorie, and if the majority wish to stay— She interrupted him, her eyes wide with anxiety. Oh, but Ralph, you promised. Don't you know when I appealed to you this morning, you said— why, of course, Mrs. Edmonds, we shall be back before ten. We cannot see to pick nuts as late as that. I beg your pardon, he said. That was in no sense a promise. It was a mere statement of the probable. That we were to have a thunderstorm of unprecedented severity to hinder us, I certainly did not take into those calculations. I know you could not help our being so late. But, Ralph, it does not rain now see how bright the moonlight is if we start at once we may be at home by midnight oh ralph won't you hurry if estelle's merry eyes had not been on him he would not have answered as coldly as he did i do not see marjorie why you cannot be reasonable like the rest of the party they all have mothers as well as you i think the majority of them wish to stay all night it is so late now that we cannot any of us get home without disturbing the entire household, while the most of us, at least, are to be trusted to take care not only of ourselves, but of those entrusted to us. At any rate, I am bound to think of the entire party, and not single out one to control it. If the most of them wish to stay, that must settle it. Marjorie dropped the hand which she had rested lightly on his arm. She was hurt to the heart. No, she did not want to be selfish. She had not supposed that she was so. She believed that he, of all persons, would be the last one to think so. What had happened to make him so cruelly indifferent to her wishes? Yet she must get home. Despite her pride and her hurt feelings, she must make one more effort. Ralph, even at the risk of your good opinion, I must make another effort. It is so important that I get home. You do not understand how a mother feels who is all alone in the world, a mother who was left to my care. We have never been away from each other overnight since my father died. If the others want to stay all night, could not you take me home? I know it is very hard to ask you to take such extra trouble for me, but I feel as though I must go. Her lip quivered as she spoke, and the young man's heart seemed to leap up into his throat. The thought of a ride with Marjorie at any time was enough to set all his pulses to quivering. She was more to him, ten thousand times, than all the others combined. But those hateful dancing eyes of that girl, Estelle! He could not resist looking over at her at the moment. She was watching them. She comprehended the whole scene. She nodded her mischievous head in the direction of the stables, and made a slight dexterous motion to indicate himself driving out his horses. There would be no end to her ridicule if he should yield, and Marjorie would have to suffer it with him. No, he must shield her as well as himself. He steeled himself to look coldly at the quivering lip. I can't do it, Marjorie. Think how ridiculously conspicuous it would make us both. From all the talk about me, I am sure they have made up their minds to remain. The night would be half over before we could reach home, and we will go as early in the morning as you please, before daylight if you say so. They are afraid of another storm, I suppose. The weather is unsettled, probably. I wonder, Marjorie, since you are so unwilling to trust to my judgment, that you trusted yourself to my care to come." This last sentence was added almost in impatience, because he saw that his logic had not moved her a hair's breadth from her desire. She turned from him, drawing a long breath as she did so, and he remembered afterwards just how her half-suppressed voice sounded as she said slowly, "'I am sorry I did.' He could have choked himself the next moment for half the words he had spoken." he began to make the most vigorous efforts to induce his party to vote for home but the spirit of the frolic had by this time gotten hold of them they were intimate friends at the schuylers they had been often entertained there they knew they were more than welcome 
nothing was more common than for large parties to come out by invitation to spend not only the night but several days and nights oh their people would understand well enough what had become of them they had done it before everybody knew that they were going to take supper at the schuylers besides there was going to be another storm they were sure of it the moonlight looked too bright to last two of the girls said that they were awfully afraid of driving during a thunderstorm didn't he know it was considered dangerous to be out under the trees besides horses were almost always afraid of lightning in short ralph bramlett failed and went about gloomily conscious of it he had given that mischievous spirit estelle douglas his word that he would abide by the majority and abide he must she congratulated him now on his success i did not think you could accomplish it she said when i saw her mournful eyes looking up at you i thought our fun was all over and began to plan how i should protect myself from the possible rain you are braver than i thought he hated her for saying it he assured her that it was in his opinion a very foolish thing to stay all night that there was no more sign of storm outside than there was in the parlor that the drive by moonlight would have been charming and that he was simply a victim of circumstances in the course of the next hour he contrived to be near enough to marjorie to speak low i'm awfully sorry marjorie i tried my best to get them to vote to go home i never saw such idiots she answered him never a word and moved away from his side of the room as promptly as she could merriment ran high in that large old-fashioned parlor but ralph bramlett who was generally the centre of the merriest group certainly did not have a happy time he was moody and absent-minded his eyes followed marjorie whenever they could do so without being too closely observed he had all the horror of a weak nature of being observed where observation would have done no harm as for marjorie it was easy enough for some time to keep her in sight she was very quiet speaking only when directly appealed to and she kept her station near one of the wide low windows which commanded a view of the road just why she wished to watch it she would have found it difficult to explain a wild idea that somebody might pass who in the brilliant moonlight she should recognize and to whom she could fly down and beg a passage home floated through her excited brain but of course found no judgment to rest upon it was too late for ordinary passers-by and she was too far from the road either to recognize or appeal but she sat and thought it and a dozen other schemes over not as things which she would attempt but as plans which might be carried out suppose the situation were desperate enough if for instance she were a prisoner here held by desperadoes and in danger of her life how would she plan she tried to keep her thoughts on some such absurdity so as not to think too steadily of her mother that frail nervous loving mother what kind of a night of suffering was this to her among the groups around her merriment grew apace nobody was tired or sleepy somebody suggested going to bed and somebody else laughed at the idea why should they go tamely to bed at a reasonable hour as though this were like any other night instead of a time for them to be together and have a frolic by and by ralph's watchful eyes noticed that marjorie edmonds summoned little effie schuyler to her and carried on a whispered conversation with her effie was the youngest of the company and had been twice advised by her elder sisters to retire but had begged for another hour of the fun now she carried messages back and forth from marjorie to her eldest sister and presently marjorie slipped away from the room she was gone so long that ralph's anxieties became torture and he ventured to make inquiries of miss schuyler by which he learned that marjorie had pleaded headache and weariness and asked to be allowed to slip quietly away to her room without making any break she had also begged for the little hall room where there was a single bed so she would disturb no one by her restlessness 
Miss Schuyler had intended to send Effie there and give her a more comfortable bed, but she had begged for that. She, Miss Schuyler, had been up once, but everything was so quiet that she had not liked to disturb her. Poor Marjorie, she was really sorry for her, she was unlike those other dear thoughtless girls, she could not help feeling anxious about her mother. If Brother Rich had been here, said Miss Schuyler, I should have asked him to take Marjorie home. End of chapter 2「Chapter Three of Making Fate by Pansy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Three: An Opportunity. Other households than that of Mrs. Edmonds were more or less affected by the non-appearance of the nutting party. One of these belonged to Mr. Douglas, who was just enough of an invalid to have sleepless nights on very slight provocation. This night was no exception though truth to tell the douglas girls were careless enough to have taught their father long before this the folly of waiting for them he was not exactly anxious over their delay but he was wakeful and listened to every sound which might be wheels and awoke mrs douglas to say that it had grown colder since the rain and to ask if estelle and fanny had wraps with them she good woman as she answered in the affirmative forbore to ask the question which she could not keep from her thoughts namely what earthly good would it do the girls to inquire about that now however being fairly awake she kept him company and they talked over matters and things in general and listened for wheels until the clock struck twelve then mrs douglas said decidedly now father you may as well give the children up and go to sleep it's midnight and they have had more than time to get here since the rain if they were coming the whole crowd have decided to stay at schuyler's till morning i know them they would like nothing better than an excuse to stay all night they can frolic all the evening half the night for that matter and have an early morning ride together in the bargain they aren't going to lose so good an excuse as this for lengthening out their good time i can tell you the nervous father sighed and said when i was young we had to be in the house by ten o'clock you wouldn't have caught my father and mother going to bed if i had been out roving around somewhere until after midnight and to think of girls doing it doesn't seem just the thing mrs douglas opened her lips to say that times were changed since he was young and that the girls were in good company and it wasn't likely any harm could come to them but she was interrupted by a vigorous knocking at the front door. There, said the father, something has happened, I knew there would. And he sprang out of bed quickly enough to set his enfeebled heart to throbbing for the remainder of the night. Nothing very serious had happened. The mother, who was tremblingly struggling into her clothes, being in no wise so free from anxiety as she had tried to represent, felt a great surge of relief and thanksgiving as she heard the cheery voice of her youngest brother. "'Routed you up, have I, out of a sound sleep? That's too bad, but it couldn't be helped this time. I've only a couple of hours to stop. Must go on by the express at two-twenty. "'Only two hours to stop, and they had not seen him in more than a year.' The clothes went on rapidly after that and by the time the youngest daughter, Glyde, having been roused by the sound of voices, had slipped into her pretty red wrapper, and with her hair in rich yellow-brown waves down her back, appeared on the scene, they were all in full tide of talk. Uncle Anthony was a favorite guest at this house, and the mother thought with a sigh how much her two older daughters were missing. Evidently the uncle missed someone whom he was anxious to see, he kept an eye on the door as he talked, and seemed to be listening for approaching footsteps. Presently he asked, "'Where is Estelle and Fanny?' This latter name added apparently as an afterthought. He listened to the explanations of their absence with evident disappointment. "'I am very sorry,' he said, 
more sorry than I can put into words. The fact is, I had a plan. It won't do any good to tell it now, but I wanted to smuggle Estelle off with me. I am on my way to New York, a hurried business trip. That is, I'm in a desperate hurry to get there, but we'll have some time for sightseeing after one business item of importance is disposed of. And I thought it would be a good opportunity to show Estelle a little of the city. I'm obliged to take the 220 train because it is important that I reach New York before business hours are over tomorrow. You don't think there is any hope that they will get home before that time, I suppose? The mother shook her head anxiously and expressed her deep regret. It would have been an outing that Estelle would have remembered all her life, and the child just longed to see New York. She went to the window and rolled up the shade and peered down the road as though her anxious glance might bring the nutting party into view, while the father explained that the girls were not often out like this and it was not at all according to his ideas, but their mother thought he was over-anxious. Uncle Anthony interrupted him to ask a question of Glyde. "'Why are you not away with the others?' Oh, I never am. The girls say that two from a family is enough, that they can't make things into a Douglas party. They say I must wait and take my turn, and my turn never comes. Her uncle regarded her with an amused smile, and continued to study her as though she were a revelation. Her red wrapper became her well, and the braids of yellow-brown hair which hung down her back seemed to match the dress. She had unusual eyes, too, large and remarkably expressive. They seemed to glow with wonder and suppress delight over the thought of Estelle's opportunity, and to shade with sadness at the same moment over the thought that it was lost. There was a sense in which she was a revelation to her uncle. He was a busy man whose visits to his sister's home were rare and brief, and he had heretofore lavished all his attentions and most of his gifts on Estelle, the second daughter. None of the family had been surprised over this. They knew instinctively that it grew out of the fact that she bore the same name as Uncle Anthony's wife of a month. The young and beautiful Aunt Estelle, whom they had never seen, but of whom they had heard so much, to whom Uncle Anthony had been engaged ever since he was a boy, and for whom he waited during the years when there was a frail little mother who would not be happy if her daughter was out of her sight, and to whom the daughter would not give a divided attention. And then the mother had gone to heaven, leaving her daughter to Uncle Anthony's care, for the delayed marriage had been solemnized at last beside the mother's dying bed. And then Aunt Estelle had followed her mother in one short month, no wonder that the niece, Estelle, was the only one who had seemed to interest Uncle Anthony. He even fancied that she looked like the wife he had buried seven years before. But tonight he looked at Glyde. "'So your turn never comes,' he said, and laughed. And then he told himself that she was growing into a very pretty girl, that he believed, after all, she looked more like his Estelle than the namesake did never realizing, poor man, that he had grown into the habit of seeing resemblances to his lost treasure in every person or thing which struck his fancy. "'I am so sorry,' said the mother, returning from her fruitless search down the road. "'It will just about break Estelle's heart. She would go as well as not, too. Her new suit is finished, and it would be just the thing to wear. I don't see for my part why they need have stayed.' and then Uncle Anthony interrupted again. Suppose I take you, Glyde, in Estelle's place. He laughed over the flash of light which the expressive brown eyes gave, and said to himself that there were possibilities about that girl that he had never seen before. This, while she was saying in tones that trembled with excitement, I, oh, Uncle Anthony, you can't possibly mean it? Yes, he said decidedly, I mean it. You see, it isn't possible for me to wait for Estelle, and I have set my heart on having some young company along with me this time. What do you say, Esther? 
can't you and she put some ribbons and things into a bag for her and let me have her in an hour's time never were the resources of the douglas family more fully taxed to get any one ready for a journey of some length on an hour's notice is not easy work and to get ready a young girl who had never been away from home and had had no expectation of going at least not for years to come and to do it with the limited resources of the house was an experience to remember glyde brushed her yellow-brown hair in nervous haste and drove the hairpins into her head as she talked mother do you suppose estelle would let me take her sack i shan't be away but a few days and what can i have to wear around me if she won't why she will of course child i'll put it in your satchel and you take that waist of fanny's it just fits you and she will be willing for you to have it i know you needn't wear it much unless you have to but it will make you feel kind of comfortable to have it along oh mother i can't take fanny's waist you don't know how much she thinks of it oh dear i don't believe i ought to go i shall have to borrow so many things from the girls that they have got ready for winter and to borrow them when they are not here too it feels awfully selfish i don't believe uncle anthony would want me if he knew i know he hates selfish people because he is so nice and generous mother isn't it dreadful that estelle isn't here i declare i could cry for her if i had time it will almost break her heart won't it she will think she has been dreadfully used said the mother pushing her own new black stockings which fitted glyde into the bag she was packing but it isn't our fault and i don't know but i am glad you are going it doesn't seem right for estelle and fanny to get all the good times and you always left out sometimes i have thought it was making the girls especially estelle selfish glyde where is your best white skirt i wonder if you let estelle wear it to go nutting why child it will be ruined she will get it all draggled in this rain it is too long for her anyway i don't see what you will do without it how came you to let her take it i didn't let her laughed glyde it hung there and she took it oh i can get along without anything mother i believe i would be willing to wear this old red wrapper all the time for the sake of going when i think of it all i feel as though i should fly oh do you suppose i can get ready in time what if estelle should be driving up this minute then i should have to stay at home is it awfully wicked to almost hope that she won't come now until after i am gone no you wouldn't i'll be bound if you shall stay at home this time for estelle or any of the rest of them it was uncle anthony who said this but he muttered it to himself and only the walls of the room where he was washing his hands heard the words he had overheard every word to which glyde and her mother had been saying esther he had said to his sister give me a chance to wash my hands will you i've got some of that miserable colored ink on them from a leaky pen i shall have to throw that pen away i believe so his sister had shown him in haste into the room which estelle and fanny occupied together and glyde unmindful of the transom between that room and the tiny one which belonged to her had talked on in loud eager tones and her uncle had listened and laughed and learned some things selfish is she he had murmured in response to his sister's confession about estelle i shouldn't wonder i have suspected as much myself and i've helped her along in it no doubt and forgotten all about this little cinderella left at home i wish she would wear her red wrapper then she would do for red riding hood but i don't want her to meet the bear then he raised his voice come cinderella it is about time you were ready for the ball we have to get started before the clock strikes you know or the charm will be broken and glyde's voice sank suddenly to a frightened whisper as she said oh mother i forgot he was there what have i been saying about him do you remember nothing bad i guess 
said Mrs. Douglas, regarding her youngest daughter with kindly eyes. You never say mean things about people behind their backs. I'm sure I don't know what we'll do without you, Glyde. We are so used to having you at home. They worked swiftly while they talked, and in a very brief space of time the bustle was over, and Glyde was on her way to the station, going to take her first journey of any moment. A very quiet, sheltered life had she lived during her nineteen years. The fact that she was the third daughter had held her back from the most of the gatherings in which her sisters were centers. Her sisters had been so sure that two out of a family was sufficient, and had been so emphatic in their statements to that effect, that there had been nothing for Glyde but submission. Therefore, it was almost beyond her belief that she was actually on her way to New York. Her uncle Anthony would have been even more pleased than he was with what he had done had he realized the pretty flutter that the little girl who tripped at his side was in. A little undertone of almost regret added sweetness to her voice as she talked. Her father's kiss on both cheeks, as she bade him good-bye, had been lingering and tender, and there had been almost a wistful look in his eyes. Truth to tell, he was a man who of late years had not been able to bid his children good night without a feeling that perhaps it was good-bye, that he might not be there in the morning. Nothing of this feeling did Glyde realize, or a thousand New Yorks could not have taken her away. She only knew that his kiss was lingering, and his voice low and tender when he bade her good-bye. And her mother had said, Dear me, child, I am not used to having my youngest chicken go out from the nest. It seems very queer. I almost wish your uncle hadn't made us do it. And yet I'm real glad to have you go and have a frolic. Neither mother nor father were given to showing their feelings so plainly, and Glyde, as she tripped away, was conscious of a happy little thrill over the thought that she was of a good deal of consequence in the world after all and that her mother and father would miss her. Then she went immediately to planning about a certain two-dollar bill which had been in her pocketbook ever since Aunt Caroline, who was ill and could not go out to purchase gifts, had sent it to her with directions to purchase a birthday present for herself. It had come too late for the birthday, and had been spent, in imagination, on a thousand different things, and was in her pocket yet. Glyde thought of it with little quivers of delight. Of course, father and mother and the girls must have some token in remembrance of her trip. She would bring them each a present from New York. She would divide the money equally among them. Fifty cents must be able to buy quite a present in that great city where people shopped so much, and where there were such immense stores as she had heard of. No, she would divide it equally between father and mother, the girls must do without. No, that would not do. She was sure she would like a present from New York. She would spend seventy-five cents on each for father and mother, and have a quarter left for each of the girls. Oh, she did not know how she would manage it, but in some way that two-dollar bill should conduce to the family joy. End of chapter 3《Chapter Four of Making Fate by Pansy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. • Chapter Four Perplexities and Decisions. • One other home represented in the nutting party had an experience that evening which should be recorded. This was at the Bramlett Farm, which was out about two miles from town. Mother and daughter were in the sitting room plying their needles vigorously and wishing occasionally that Ralph would come. They lived on an unfrequented road, and the father, who had been expected home from a neighboring city by the evening train, had not come. The doorbell interrupted their quiet and made them look nervously at each other and wonder who that could be. To hear the sound of their doorbell at that hour of the evening was unusual. "'Perhaps it is a tramp,' said Hannah Bramlett, 
who lived on her nerves and had been on the lookout for thieves and robbers for the past twenty years however there seemed no alternative but to go to the door hannah led the way her mother following with the lamp on her passage through the hall she seized an umbrella with a vague idea of defending themselves as for hannah she contented herself with saying in nervous tones as she unlocked the door ralph ought to be at home before this it is just like him to stay away half the night and leave us alone then the mother after the fashion of mothers began to make excuses well but hannah you know he expected father to get home on the evening train and then hannah opened the door and received a yellow covered envelope a dispatch gasped the women at once turning pale with apprehension mrs bramlett set the lamp on a chair and herself on the lowest stair while hannah glancing around to say don't be frightened mother it's likely from father to tell that he missed the train tore open the envelope and read call upon us if possible before twelve o'clock to-morrow morning then she interrupted it's for ralph from those folks in new york where he is trying to get a chance in their office you know he can't get to them before twelve o'clock to-morrow unless he comes in time for to-night's train and i don't believe he will it will be just like him to stay out at schuyler's all night that silly crowd he has with him would rather stay than not it will serve him right if he does here he has been waiting for a year nearly for a chance to get in at this office there wasn't any sense in his getting up a nutting frolic when father was away and there were so many things to see to i don't understand why a man twenty-two years old has to act like a boy of nineteen ralph hasn't any more sense than he had four years ago the two women went back to the sitting-room where they alternately sewed and read the telegram studying each word carefully as though it could offer some suggestions concerning the possibility or rather the impossibility of getting word to ralph before it should be too late for the train if he doesn't come inside of the next hour said hannah at last as the clock struck eleven why he'll just lose his chance that's all and he'll blame us for not getting him word somehow i suppose he always does lay the blame on other folks but i don't see what we could do there is nothing we can do said the mother sorrowfully if you were only a boy hannah you could get on old ben's back and gallop out there but as it is if i were a boy interrupted hannah as she flung scissors and thimble into her workbox with a zeal which made them ring i would do a thousand things which i can't do now and if i wasn't different in a good many respects from some boys i know it would be queer but i'm nothing but a girl and there's no use in talking i don't expect ralph to-night and we might as well go to bed first as last great use in father being so careful of the horses as to tell ralph that he needn't come to meet him he could ride out with the carters and then ralph goes off with the horses all day nobody knows how many miles i never did see such works hannah said her mother with a gentle sigh you are twenty-six years old and you think ralph is almost as old as you are but a boy of twenty-two is a good deal younger remember than a girl of even the same age and four years make a great difference i hope they will make a difference in ralph said hannah significantly then mother and daughter went to bed both of them to lie awake and inwardly groan because being women there was nothing they could do to preserve to the son and brother the chance which this telegram might contain even the guests at the schuyler farmhouse wearied at last and permitted themselves to be shown to their various rooms but sleep did not come to all of them even at that late hour notably was this the case with ralph bramlett when he found himself in darkness and comparative solitude with time to think he discovered that his thoughts were anything but agreeable companions why had he been such a bear to marjorie 
why had he allowed the teasing words of estelle douglas to have such an influence over him what in the world did he care what she thought about him there were his own father and mother who would to say the least think it very strange in him to stay out all night with no better excuse for so doing than he had to offer he tossed from side to side to the infinite discomfiture of his bedfellow and went over all the details of the evening with exasperating minuteness he tried to decide whether marjorie would be really vexed with him or at least whether it was a vexation which would last longer than the night he resolved that with the very first streak of dawn he would arouse his party and make all haste to get started homeward no breakfast for him at the schuyler farm that morning and no one knew better than he that he could control the movements of the entire party when he set about it as soon as ever he had marjorie beside him out of hearing of others he would explain to her certain reasons which he had evolved out of his night thoughts why he could not do as she wished he would tell her how very much he would have preferred carrying out her wishes had it been prudent to have done so also he would apologize for the rude way in which he had spoken and assure her that it all grew out of his anxiety to please her and the chagrin he felt that he must disappoint her having gone over every word that he would utter and planned answers to her probable replies and then rearranged the entire conversation for perhaps the dozenth time he turned over his pillow once more resolved to get one nap if possible when he was roused into immediate action by a low tap on his door a moment more and he stood beside it listening to miss schuyler's anxious voice oh ralph we don't know what to think and mother said i would better tell you at once marjorie isn't in her room mother said perhaps you would know what ought to be done not in her room repeated ralph in utter bewilderment and consternation why where on earth is she then that is what we don't know she hasn't been there to-night i mean she hasn't been to bed the bed is just as i left it not a thing disturbed and there were no traces in the room of marjorie having been there you see the way we found it out continued miss schuyler as ralph having thrown on his outer garments with all speed opened wide the door sister effie is ill and mother needed a bottle of medicine which was in the corner closet in the hall room she called to me and told me to go in very quietly and get it i went on tiptoe so as not to disturb marjorie and you can imagine the start it gave me to discover that she was not there at all ralph what do you think can have become of her i've been in every girl's room since thinking that she might have felt lonely and have gone to stay with some of them but none of them have seen her since she left the parlor last evening do you suppose it possible that she may have started for home on foot and all alone she was so anxious to go you know she told me that she had never left her mother alone before and that she had as good as promised her dead father that she never would i felt very sorry for her but i did not imagine that she would do any desperate thing ralph bramlett had no answering word to speak he strode back into his room added the finishing touches to his toilet with a speed that would have amazed his sister hannah and in a very few minutes more was following jim the half-asleep and much aggrieved schuyler coachman to the stables never were horses harnessed in more frantic haste never was ralph bramwell less considerate of the ladies who gathered about him like bees the entire nutting party was out eager to give advice or ask questions you should have thought of that before he said grimly to estelle douglas when she suggested that she and her sister ride with him adding that she was afraid father would be kept awake all night worrying about them the time to have thought of him was at ten o'clock last night he said severely it was a very foolish proceeding to stay here all night there hasn't been a pleasanter night for riding this fall i am not going to take anyone with me you can all wait here until i come back 
I can get on faster alone. Saying which, he sprang into the large, empty wagon, rattled over the paved driveway, down the street, and was lost in the darkness. The girls looked after him in shivering silence. The moon had set, and it was that gloomy, shivery, indescribably dreary hour before the dawn of a new day. "'Ralph is cross,' ventured Estelle Douglas at last. "'He spoke to us as though we were a company of naughty children in need of a whipping. There is no use in his being so excited. Nothing can have happened to Marjorie except an extra streak of obstinacy. The road is safe enough between here and town, and the walking is good. Oh, how cold it is! One could imagine it was January instead of November.' I think we would all better go back to bed and pray that Ralph may come for us in a better humor than he was when he left. I must say I pity Marjorie. Ralph Bramlett is a perfect bear when he chooses to be. Meantime, the cause of all this excitement was unconscious enough concerning it. It had been no part of her intention to create a sensation. In fact, she had planned little or nothing concerning the people she left behind. She had petitioned for, and secured, the use of the little hall bedroom, because she had felt that it would be utterly impossible, for that evening, to laugh and talk with those silly girls who had suddenly become distasteful to her. When she slipped away to it, she was conscious that she was in a perfect tumult of pain and indignation. Anxiety for her mother was undoubtedly uppermost, but there was a wholesome undertone of astonishment and indignation at Ralph Bramlett. Was she then of so little consequence to him that the chattering of half a dozen other girls could turn his mind completely away from her wishes? Two hours before, had any one told her that she would petition Ralph Bramlett for a favor within his power to grant and be denied, she would have smiled incredulously, and wondered what there could be that she, having common sense, would ask, that he would refuse. As far back as her childish recollection reached, she had been able to sway Ralph Bramlett to her moods. It was not that he was not positive enough by nature. Obstinate many people called him. She had known others to coax for hours, and failed to secure what she could obtain by a word and a smile. It had therefore been a revelation to her, and by no means a pleasant one, to find that on this night, when she was not only in serious earnest, but very anxious, she had suddenly failed. She leaned her forehead against the window-pane, and looked out on the moon-lighted world, and grew more angry every moment. How easily Ralph could have driven home with her if those chattering idiots really persisted in staying, and have had plenty of time to rest his horses and take some rest himself, before returning for them in the early morning. How sure she had felt that he would hail such a proposition with delight. Was it possible that he actually thought she had gone too far in making it? He had reminded her how conspicuous such a proceeding would make them she remembered this with a blush of shame. She had occasionally objected to plans of his on that very ground, but never before had Ralph Bramlett been other than delighted at the thought of being made most conspicuously her friend and attendant. The more she went over in detail his words and looks, the more angry she grew until at last the idea of submitting to his dictation and remaining at the farmhouse all night and riding meekly home by his side in the morning, like a naughty child who had tried to have her own way and had failed, became utterly hateful to her. Also, the more she thought of her mother spending the long weary hours of that night, perhaps quite alone in the house, for, now that she thought of it, possibly not even Mr. Maxwell would be there. There had been some talk in the morning about his being absent that night the more impossible it seemed that she could permit such a state of things. "'Father would never have done it,' she said aloud and pitifully. "'He was so tender of mother, and he trusted me. Oh, if I could only fly!' It was at that moment that she remembered that although she could not fly, she could walk. 
she was well and strong and thought nothing of a walk of several miles for pleasure what was to hinder her starting at once and making the seven miles which lay between her and home before those selfish people downstairs discovered her absence it was as light as day out of doors and she knew every foot of the way perfectly there was really nothing to be afraid of as she considered it the idea grew fascinating what a relief it would be to escape that hateful ride home in the morning beside ralph bramlett and above all things else how many hours of anxiety could she thus save that precious mother she had no faith whatever in the plans for an early start she had heard of plans of this character before she knew how fond at least some of the party were of breakfasts at the schuyler farmhouse it would be ten o'clock perhaps even later before they could reach home she would go at once having settled this momentous question she gave herself no time for reconsideration but slipping quietly into the upper hall selected with nervous fingers her wraps from the heterogeneous mass which had been landed on the sofa in the alcove then having arrayed herself without regard to the mirror she went softly down the heavily carpeted stairs and gliding like an unseen ghost past the parlor doors while the merriment there was still at its height took the precaution to make her way through the deserted dining-room to a side entrance she then crossed the lawn and the meadow next to it and so gained the road by the corner farthest from the parlor windows and began her walk end of chapter four chapter five of making fate by pansy this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five shadows and charms it is doubtful if marjorie edmonds though she lived to be an old woman will ever forget the experiences of that night though by no means a timid person her life had been a carefully guarded one in some respects and she was now having her first experience of being on a deserted street alone at night she had no conception of how the loneliness would affect her or assuredly she would have reconsidered even then she ran a few steps in her foolish fear that she might be seen and captured by her friends but soon discovered that she must not waste strength in that way in her excited state of mind she lost her breath so quickly as to alarm her she tried to reason her fears away why should she be afraid the night was so still so very still that even the common ordinary sounds of nature seemed to be lacking and the very silence alarmed her then the trees had long naked arms which they waved at her a ghastly stump in the near distance took human shape and silently beckoned to her in the moonlight a great dog barked fiercely in the far distance but seemed to her overwrought nerves to be bounding toward her she could almost feel his hot breath on her burning face those awful silent shadows among the trees waved their arms and mocked at her were they silent she thought she heard them laughing in short common sense seemed for the time being to utterly desert this young woman and leave her a prey to all sorts of imaginations which had heretofore been unknown to her before she had accomplished a third of the distance if she had not by that time become equally afraid of all directions she would have turned back once she made a full stop and considered the advisability of doing so then a curious feeling came over her that it would be impossible to meet again the horrors through which she had already passed better unknown terrors than these so she sped on yet that is hardly the word to use there was not much speed she found herself compelled to walk comparatively slowly her heart beat so hard that it seemed to take her strength at times there came to her a terrible fear that she would faint dead away by the roadside then what might not happen to her before the morning dawned once she looked up appealingly at the moon and was beset with a new fear it was travelling fast and might be near its setting 
what if it should leave her in the darkness better all those mocking shadows than this at last she neared the houston farm not quite half the distance accomplished could she possibly endure another hour like the last one should she stop at the houston farm tell her pitiful story and ask shelter until morning how humiliating such a course would be how the douglas girls would laugh at her and possibly even ralph bramlett would sneer still it may be that her fears would have gotten the better of her pride had they not been at that moment turned into a new channel distinctly on the silent air came the baying of dogs she remembered to have heard that the houstons kept watch-dogs fierce ones they might tear her in pieces before she could make herself heard she could not venture to seek help there there was nothing for it but to go on since she had lived through half of the way it was possible that she might reach home alive after all she tried to think that she was becoming less terror-stricken growing accustomed to those horrid skeletons who continually waved and grinned at her in the distance and developed into commonplace leafless branches as she neared them she went on faster for some minutes or hours it seemed to her then a new terror defined itself the unmistakable approach of horses feet in the distance no sound of wheels a horseman riding fast what should she do she a woman alone in the dead of night on the public street suppose the rider should speak to her should stop oh for some friendly tree behind which to hide the skeletons now had lost their terror for her with the first approach of real terrible danger they became friends but it so happened that she had reached a stretch of road where no trees were and the horseman was coming very swiftly curiously enough for the first time that night the girl realized how unfair she had been to her mother by putting herself in such a position of possible danger as this she knew instinctively that her mother would rather spend a hundred nights alone than have her daughter voluntarily place herself where insult was possible in the few minutes which intervened while those rapid feet were nearing her it seemed to marjorie that every horrible story she had ever heard or read connected with night and darkness and sin came rushing to memory oh what should she do if the rider should speak to her she would scream so loud that they must hear her in town or at some farmhouse surely a sense of faintness was coming over her but she battled with it and put it sternly away this was no time for fainting she must have all her senses in order and use them well it was possible of course that the belated traveller was a respectable person who would pass her in swift silence but he did not he reined in his horse as he drew near miss edmonds is it not said a voice which she recognized on the instant and at the sound of which all inclination to scream departed from her before she could gather breath to make reply he added you recognize me do you not i'm mr maxwell as he spoke he dismounted and throwing selim's bridle over his arm came toward her oh i am afraid i have frightened you he said for marjorie had dropped a limp heap on the ground do not be alarmed because i am here nothing is wrong with your mother but she was anxious over your detention and i volunteered to bring her word from you are you faint miss edmonds i am afraid i have frightened you very much i thought you would perhaps recognize my voice and so not be alarmed i did said marjorie i am not frightened not now and she struggled to her feet trembling in every limb i was awfully frightened mr maxwell she said speaking between nervous shudders not at you but at everything when i heard the sound of horses feet and knew a man must be coming it was terrible but now that he is here i am not at all afraid the remarkable seeming contradiction in this sentence struck her ludicrously as she said it and she was nervous enough to laugh outright mr maxwell joined in the laugh it was the quickest and easiest way to quiet nerves 
Marjorie sobered on the instant, and was ready with anxious questionings and explanations. "'Is my mother very much frightened, Mr. Maxwell? Oh, I am afraid it will make her ill. I tried so hard to get home earlier. Indeed, it was not my fault. You can know how anxious I was by my being willing to start away alone.' "'I can understand that better than I can your being permitted to do it,' said Mr. Maxwell, speaking some thoughts which he meant to have kept to himself. He made haste to add, "'Naturally, your mother is anxious, but we shall be at home so soon now that I cannot think any harm will result. Are you a good walker on occasion, Miss Edmonds? Selim would be delighted to carry you, but I believe you do not ride?' they made quick time after that. Marjorie's feet had regained their courage, and she found no difficulty in keeping step with her companion. Also, her fears had departed. The skeletons had retired affrighted. In their places were only prosaic-looking trees, whose bare branches might wave as they would, she cared not. There passed a horseman who looked curiously at the two, making quick steps over the road with a horse pacing haughtily along by their side. There came a wagon loaded with revellers, who sang and shouted as they passed, but Marjorie only noticed them to think how frightened she would have been under other circumstances. She tried to give Mr. Maxwell a history of her experiences. She tried to make light of her fears, but the memory of them was too vivid and it became apparent to her escort that she was still very much excited. "'I wonder if you are not acquainted with my talisman,' he said cheerily. "'When I was a little fellow, it was my fortune to be much alone. One of my duties involved a long walk daily, or rather nightly, for it was after the sun had set, through a piece of woods where the shadows were dense. I appreciate your statement about the trees waving their arms at you.' Mine went farther than that. They shrieked and howled on occasion, and sometimes called after me. At least, so I had seasons of almost believing. I do not suppose there was any very real danger, though occasionally a bear did prowl about those woods, but my fears were as real as though the danger had been imminent, and I suffered from them in a way that unimaginative people cannot understand. One night I found a talisman, it worked grandly, and has served me a good turn many a time since, when I was in real peril. It is associated in my mind with my dear old grandmother. Have you a grandmother, Miss Edmonds? I consider a life defrauded of a large portion of its joys that cannot look back to grandmother's room as a place for comfort, and grandmother's prayers as a stronghold." curiously enough mine was the only one to whom i was willing to confide my fears i think i desired to pose as a hero before my dear mother father was absent from home much of the time and i was her caretaker not for the world would i have hinted to her that that half-mile walk was one of terror at times but my grandmother was little and old and could not walk at all and seemed to be young enough to understand all my feelings. One night, as I said, she gave me a charm. "'I have heard of charms,' said Marjorie, trying to be merry. "'Do you wear it about with you, Mr. Maxwell? And could you lend it, do you think? Because if I were ever to be caught in this way again, I am sure I should need it. Indeed, I feel as though I could never go through such an experience as this again.' The voice which had begun with a merry note turned to gravity, and Marjorie shivered sensibly. Evidently she had not yet gained the healthy poise of her usual condition. Her companion made haste to speak cheerily. "'I would not think of it, Miss Edmonds. It is highly improbable that you will be called upon to take night walks through the country alone. But about the charm, I wear it constantly, engraved where it can never be erased.' yet it is a very simple little thing, and you can at will be furnished with it. These are the words which compose it. What time I am afraid I will trust in thee. I do not know that I can make you understand what a revelation it was to me when my grandmother first succeeded in getting it into my heart 
that God actually cared for me every minute, watched over my goings and comings, and was near at hand for me to speak to whenever I would, so that in reality it was impossible for me to take walks alone. If you ought to be going that way, said the dear old lady, and I seem at this moment to hear her impressive voice and see her small withered forefinger upheld for emphasis, if you ought to be going that way, then be sure he is going along with you, and you need not even whisper to get his attention. He hears your heart beat, and knows all about it. But it is a great comfort to speak to him, my boy. I found so, Miss Edmonds, and, as I said, the blessed fact has gone with me through the years. Marjorie Edmonds was absolutely silent she had no words with which to meet such an experience as this. Truth to tell, she knew nothing about God as a living, present reality. Many of her friends, young people like herself, were professors of religion, and it will have to be confessed that Marjorie, perhaps without realizing it, had prided herself on the fact that she was not. "'Why should I join the church?' she had asked lightly of a girlfriend, who, during the time of special interest following the week of prayer, had urged her to this step. I do not see the slightest difference in you since you joined, save that you go to the communion service when you feel like it. As for me, I have obligations enough now which I do not meet to undertake any new ones, at least until I see occasion for doing so. It was not altogether sincere. No one knew better than Marjorie Edmonds that there was such a thing as vital religion. Mother and father had lived it before her through all the years of her recollection. It is true, her mother's training, and possibly her temperament, made her more reserved upon this subject than any other. Still, the controlling motive power of her life was Jesus Christ, and Marjorie knew it. But aside from her mother, Marjorie's experience among professed Christians was perhaps unfortunate. She had a high ideal, and often said to herself, and occasionally aloud, that if she ever did become a Christian, she would be a different one from any with whom she was acquainted. She always made a mental reservation of her parents, her pastor, and possibly two or three others, but all of these were old, or at least they were much older than she, and she had allowed herself to more than half believe that religion, or at least consistent living, was for the old. Therefore she would wait until there would be some hope of her being consistent before she would make the attempt. But Mr. Maxwell was young. He could not be very much older than Ralph Bramlett himself, and his manner of speaking of these things was new to her. He had a sort of quiet assurance, a matter-of-course way of talking of religion as he would of any other subject. Moreover, he spoke of God as though he were a real, ever-present friend, instead of a far-away solemnity to be spoken of and thought about as little as possible. This, she confessed to herself, was the way in which she habitually thought of him. "'I do not think I know how to use your talisman,' she said timidly, and wished that he would talk of something else. By way of helping him to do so, she began an eager account of the day's pleasuring, entering into a detailed description of the beauty of the glen where their lunch was spread, and the lovely fire they had built to roast their corn, and the picturesqueness of the whole scene, with their coffee pail hung on an improvised crane made of pointed sticks interlaced. A regular gypsy camp, Mr. Maxwell, she said. The great pail in which we had our coffee swayed back and forth over the coals, just as I have seemed to see it do in pictures of gypsy encampments. All we lacked was the old fortune teller. I thought at one time of impersonating her. You should have been with us if you like strange and almost uncanny views in nature. You have heard of the place, have you not? it has a good deal of local fame. There is a hill ever so high just back of the glen, almost a mountain it might be called, and rocks with great jagged fissures in them. There are some fine specimens to be found in that region, the wise ones say. 
aren't you a geologist mr maxwell oh no i know nothing about geology except at second hand i ask questions occasionally and pick up disconnected bits of information in that way but i love to look at those great solid rocks that have stood there for ages and imagine things about them our day was all lovely until that storm came on what a terrific storm it was i was so worried not to be at home on mother's account she is inclined to be nervous during a thunderstorm were you at home during the rain and did you see my mother with these and kindred subjects she kept up a steady flow of words and as she had by this time regained her wonted strength they walked rapidly and very soon turning a corner the lights from the home windows streamed out upon them end of chapter five Chapter Six of Making Fate by Pansy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Six Homecomings. When her foot touched the lower step, Marjorie heard the click of the lock, and in another moment her mother's arms were around her, and Oh, mother! and Oh, my daughter! came simultaneously from their lips. You see, said Mr. Maxwell. I have kept my word and brought her back to you in safety. His voice recalled them to the knowledge of his presence, and Mrs. Edmonds broke off in the midst of the questions she was eagerly asking, to give attention to her benefactor. Was Mr. Maxwell still planning to take that long ride across the country? No, he had decided to wait until another day. There were reasons why it would be pleasanter to make a very early start, he was anxious to get a view of the sunrise at a certain famous point and the sun would be in too much haste for him this morning then there was no reason why he should not take a very early breakfast with them as soon as he had cared for his horse mrs edmonds having finished with gideon had further employed herself in resurrecting the kitchen fire and rearranging her culinary arrangements making a breakfast instead of a supper and laying the table for three instead of the usual two surely mr maxwell would be persuaded to join them it would be several hours yet before his regular breakfast time and he must be quite faint with his long walk he was not in the least faint he assured her and was used to long walks at almost any hour of the day or night but the table set in the back parlor made a very inviting picture and the odor of something savory was already in the air there was no reason why he should not enjoy an unusual breakfast at this unusual hour and he promptly accepted the invitation then went to explain matters to selim leaving mother and daughter to themselves oh mother said marjorie with her arms about her mother's neck again as soon as the door closed after mr maxwell I have had such a time. You cannot think how hard I tried to get here at a reasonable hour and in a reasonable way. I was so troubled about you and so indignant. I never imagined that people, with a perceptible pause before she decided upon the noun to use, could be so silly and disagreeable. I can't think what was the matter with them, said Mrs. Edmonds they will be frightened dear will they not when they find that you are gone i hope so was the savage answer they deserve to be frightened after doing such an utterly absurd thing as to stay there all night then apparently summoning her resolution she added mother ralph was hateful beyond anything i could have believed possible at which information mrs edmonds preserved a discreet silence Within a very short time thereafter, three people were seated at the coziest breakfast table which could have been found, at least at that hour of the morning. It was when Mr. Maxwell was taking his second cup of coffee, and remarking that there were possibilities evidently in coffee, of which people who boarded did not dream, that there came a sharp peal of the doorbell which caused mother and daughter to give little nervous starts and look at each other. It is an early hour for a call, 
said Mr. Maxwell, noticing the glances and rising as he spoke, I think you would better let me answer that bell. A moment afterwards, from the wide open door, Ralph Bramlett had a view which photographed itself upon his memory. A cosy dining room, whose breakfast table he had often pictured to himself, and wondered how it would seem to be enough at home there to be a breakfast table guest. Mother and daughter seated thereat, and, opposite the daughter, a place which had evidently just been vacated, and Mr. Maxwell, napkin in hand, standing at his ease before him, saying in quiet, matter-of-course tones, "'Oh, yes, Miss Edmonds is at home, and quite safe. Nothing serious happened to her, I believe, though naturally the necessity for taking a walk alone at that time of night was not agreeable to a lady. Will you walk in, Mr. Bramlett, and see the ladies?' "'No,' said Ralph curtly, there seems to be no occasion for my presence. The poor fellow noted as he spoke that Marjorie did not even turn her head at the sound of his voice. It made his next sentence more savage. She has given us a precious scare, but since she is all right, of course that is of no consequence. And then Ralph Bramlett turned and strode out into the grey dawn, and climbed into his lonesome wagon, more thoroughly out of sorts with himself and with Marjorie, and above all with Mr. Maxwell, than can be described. In excuse for him, let it be remembered that he had had a trying night, and a very nerve-disturbing ride. As he rattled at reckless speed over the road, visions of all the uncanny things he had ever heard about the night and the darkness seemed to come hurrying before him, what if Marjorie had fallen in with a company of drunken revellers on their way home from the races? What if she had fallen and hurt herself and lay unconscious under some of these gloomy trees? Still, this latter fancy did not disturb him long. He was entirely familiar with the road, and rapidly as he was driving, no clump of trees or hiding place of any sort escaped him. Marjorie was not in visible shape anywhere along his way, of this he was certain. But what then had become of her? It did not seem to him possible that she could have managed all the distance alone, and in the darkness, and have actually reached home. So, as he neared the town, and still saw no trace of the missing one, his nerves became almost as much out of order as Marjorie's own. Therefore, to find her seated comfortably at a cosy breakfast table, was both a relief and a shock to him. Never was gloomier ride taken than he took that morning back to the Schuyler farm. In the first place, he had an absolute horror of going back to meet those chattering girls and silly boys. He considered the feasibility of driving home and sending Ben, their man of all work, in his place. But the explanations which would necessarily result not only to his father and mother, but to Hannah, and also the merciless fire of ridicule which he would have to receive eventually from the tongue of Estelle Douglas, held him from this course. He might as well go back at once and meet the idiots and have it over with, he muttered to himself, and as he drove wearily over the road, he added that it would be many a day before he would lend himself to an escapade of theirs again. Have some pity for Ralph Bramlett, for he was in sore need of it. Only too vividly did he realize his mistake of the night before. Who would have imagined that Marjorie was so anxious to get home? He had supposed that she would fret about it for a few minutes like other girls, but that when she found that her way was hedged, and she in no wise to blame, would cast it aside and have a merry evening with the rest and how he had looked forward to that morning ride with Marjorie sitting beside him, watching the sunrise. Now the first streaks of red were gilding the eastern sky, but he did not so much as turn his head to give the monarch of the day a glance. What did he care for sunrises? He had seen too many of them alone. This sunrise was to have been gilded with Marjorie's presence, and he had deliberately put her from him. This was his mood for a few minutes at a time. At others he blamed her severely. 
One moment he sternly assured himself that she would have to apologize for this night's work if she wished to retain his friendship. The next he felt a cold shiver creeping over him at the thought that possibly she was really and permanently offended. What if she should break with him? But that was folly. It could not be that she cared so little for him. If she should, he told himself bitterly, I should know the reason. It will be because that meddling stranger to whom they rented rooms has been paying her attention and turned her head. What do they know about him? What right has he at their table at this hour of the morning? And to come mincing out to me to tell me that she was entirely safe and comfortable. What business was it of his? What right have they to let an entire stranger into their family circle in this way? I have known Marjorie Edmonds ever since she was a baby, and I have never been at their breakfast table. On the whole, the ride back was fully as uncomfortable, though in a different way, as the hurried rush to town had been. Very little satisfaction did the eager group, which was seated at the Schuyler breakfast table when he returned, get from him. Beyond the bare fact that Marjorie was at home and quite safe, they could get no information, cross-question as they would. In point of fact, Ralph Bramlett had no information to give. His own indignation had prevented him from hearing particulars. He is a perfect savage, said Estelle Douglas, gathering her wraps in great indignation, as the girls informed her that Ralph said whoever was not ready to go in five minutes would be left behind. He is a perfect savage this morning. I never knew before that he could be so ungentlemanly. I believe he and Marjorie have had a quarrel. Nothing else will account for such a bearish state of mind. I don't see why he should want to visit her sins on us. We are not to blame." In point of fact, none of the excursionists enjoyed the homeward ride, as they had planned the night before that they would do. The glamour of night and moonlight were gone. It was prosaic daylight, and for some of them the day's cares were waiting, and would be heavier because of this late beginning. The Douglas girls, now that the excitement was over, had an uncomfortable feeling that they had deprived their father of a good night's rest and each confessed secretly that it was a shame to take their pleasure at the expense of an invalid's sleep. Of course it was ridiculous for father to be so nervous over them. They had said so dozens of times, and had done what they could to educate him to a knowledge of the uncertainty of their comings. Still the fact of his nervousness remained, and they knew it. To add to Estelle Douglas's discomfort, there was an unpleasant consciousness on her part that she was to blame for the night's detention and the embarrassments which had resulted. It was of no use to her to assure herself that Ralph need not have stayed if he had not chosen, no matter what she said. No one was more conscious than she of the power that ridicule had over Ralph, or was more eager to show her influence over him. There was a source of disappointment also, known only to herself. In the depths of her heart had been an intention to soothe and comfort Ralph this morning, to speak just the words which she felt he needed in order to reinstate him in his good opinion of himself, and in short, to show herself so marked a contrast to Marjorie that he could not fail to note the difference between them. During her period of waiting, she had even planned some of the words she would say to him, and, presuming upon his probable replies, had carried on quite an extended conversation, with such satisfactory results, that by the time they, in imagination, reached home, she and Ralph had become better friends than ever before, even confidential friends. Of course, this plan involved her occupying the seat which Marjorie's flight had left vacant but the facts in the case were that she had a seat as far away from Ralph as could well be managed. She was the last one to come downstairs, as indeed she always was, and Ralph had without ceremony and with much speed seated his company before she appeared, dumping that 
dull little bell finley into the vacant seat beside himself as bell finley was entirely satisfied to ride for miles if necessary without speaking and looked upon ralph much as she did upon her brother that young man was able to continue his gloomy thoughts during much of the homeward journey not one of the party felt merry the reaction from late hours and undue excitement was upon them to add to their discomfort the sun which although unnoticed had risen in glory soon retired behind dull gray clouds and before they were halfway to town a dreary rain began to fall not a majestic shower with splendid spectacular accompaniments compelling their attention as on the night before but a slow fine november drizzle chilling them to the bone i never was so glad to get home in my life was estelle douglas's exclamation as she shook the raindrops from her and shivered wasn't it a horrid drive i believe ralph came as slow as he could so as to add to our discomfort as much as possible hasn't he behaved like a south sea islander or some other uncivilized being ever since marjorie disappeared disappeared said mrs douglas catching the last word as she came to the assistance of her daughters what has happened to marjorie why child you are wet to the skin you must have held the umbrella so that it dripped right down your back instead of protecting you and i am afraid your dress is spoiled the lining from your sack has discolored it what a pity that you wore that dress fanny your sack is streaked too dear me what a condition to get home in why didn't you come last night we couldn't said estelle briefly after a moment during which she was engaged in discovering how severely the skirt she had borrowed without leave was mud-stained she added didn't you see and hear it rain last night of course you didn't expect us after that i never saw it rain harder why we did not so early of course but by ten o'clock the rain was over your father lay awake watching for every sound his head is very bad this morning and he had a poor turn with his heart just about daylight that's no wonder though after such a night it was after midnight when your then fanny interrupted her mother do help me get off this horrid sack it is so wet it sticks to my dress as though it were glued is father worse did you say i don't see why he has to lie awake and fret about us we shall get so by and by we will have to play marjorie edmonds role when we are out in the evening what did you say happened to marjorie no accident i hope nothing happened to her except to act like an idiot and create a sensation which will last i don't know how long in its effects she was determined to get home it seems although ralph was afraid of another thunderstorm and did not like to take the horses out so she came home on foot in the middle of the night on foot said mrs douglas in amazement and dismay why the poor child not alone dear me what a state she must have been in i don't think much of the gentleman you had with you to let her do it why they didn't know about it explained fanny we none of us knew anything about it we didn't think of such a thing she attempted to make the facts plain to the mother but estelle who was hunting through drawers and boxes for certain articles of clothing interrupted do fanny let us have a rest from that subject for a little while i am tired of it aren't you mother can you imagine where my brown skirt is where is glide i wonder if she has had it glide said mrs douglas brought suddenly face to face with her tremendous news why she has gone to new york and now the feelings of estelle douglas must be imagined they cannot be described End of chapter six chapter seven of making fate by pansy this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven what next well 
said Uncle Anthony, as he tried to tilt back in what he called a biscuit chair, which was in Glyde's room on the third floor of a large hotel, and surveyed her expectant face with a mixture of amusement and satisfaction. What next? I suppose you have had a dull day. It is beyond me to understand what you could have found to amuse you. But, to judge from your story and your face, you have had excellent success. And my qualms of conscience over your loneliness have been wasted. Glyde laughed gleefully. I never thought of being lonely, she said. There were so many things to look at out of the windows, and such crowds of people passing all the time. It did not seem possible that they could all know just exactly where they wanted to go and what they wanted to do. Her uncle laughed, but said, with a shade of gravity in his voice, It is safe to state that about one third of them are going exactly where they ought not, and another third were doing exactly what they didn't want to. That is about the proportion in New York, I think. It was the evening of their first day in the city. Uncle Anthony, having established his traveling companion in excellent quarters, and surrounded her with what was, to her, the very extravagance of luxury, had been obliged to leave her quite to herself during business hours. He had rushed from one point to another in extreme haste, all the time distressed by the thought that the little girl, as he called her in his thoughts, whom he had brought away from home and mother for the first time in her life, must have such a wretched beginning to her holiday. It was, therefore, a happy surprise on returning to the hotel just in time for dinner, to find her face as bright as the day had been. While they were at dinner, she gave him eager descriptions of the wonders she had seen from the windows. In this, as in all other respects, she was a contrast to her sister Estelle. When, on a memorable occasion, he took that young lady to Syracuse with him, he remembered she had found the hours that she had been compelled to solitude, with no other employment than window-gazing, such intolerable bores as to lead him at times to seriously doubt whether the delightful evenings and the few hours of daylight which he could spare her, were sufficient compensation for such martyrdom. Yet her windows had been much more hopeful of possible entertainment than were Glyde's. That young lady regarded him with a serious, half-wistful look in response to the alarming statement he made about the people she had watched, and said timidly, They all looked comfortable, Uncle Anthony. I was thinking about that this afternoon. I have heard and read a good many things about the poor of New York, but I haven't seen a single really ill-dressed or very doleful-looking person this entire day. They all hurried by as though they knew just where to go and how to plan for themselves. Uncle Anthony laughed again. You are not in the right quarter of the city to see the sights in the way of dress, for instance, of either extreme, he said. I could take you to portions of this interesting town where you would get a glimpse of the poor, but I think we will try to do something pleasanter, at least this evening. I suppose you would like to go to the theater? Have you selected the point you want to aim for? You received this evening paper I sent up, didn't you? Where is it? I haven't had time to see what is going on. Here is the paper, Uncle Anthony, but... He noticed at once the change of tone, and turned quickly and looked at her. Well, he said, what is it? Have you some other plan? Let's have it in that case. I have no object in view except to give you as pleasant an evening as I can. I mentioned the theater because it was always Estelle's first thought. Where do you want to go? Oh, I haven't any plans, Uncle Anthony, and I want to go wherever you wish to take me. Only I thought... She stopped again. It seemed difficult for her to frame sentences to her satisfaction. Her uncle waited, however, apparently not intending to assist her, and she began again. Uncle Anthony, I had almost decided that I would not go to theaters. The mischief you had! I did not know that you had had an opportunity. Do they have theaters in your town? Oh, traveling ones occasionally, 
every winter indeed but i did not mean those i meant that i would not go even though i had an opportunity to come to new york for instance though i never expected to come here and am i to be informed why this tremendous decision was reached don't your tastes lie in that direction yes i think they do i should not be surprised if they lay very much in that direction though i have never had opportunity to decide for myself but i like everything in the line of acting when the girls used to have at school and in our societies what we called private theatricals i became so fond of them that while we were preparing for an entertainment i could hardly think of anything else but the reason i had almost decided that i would not go was because well i am a member of the church you know no i was not aware of it but what has that to do with the matter so is your sister estelle i believe yes but she and fanny have been members of the church for a number of years and i only united last winter ah am i to understand that one has to remain away from theatres and places of that sort for a term of years after uniting with the church and then are at liberty to begin again glyde laughed pleasantly oh uncle anthony of course not i'm sure i don't know how to tell you what i mean i am not like estelle and fanny i mean i don't think as they do about some things i know they are older but then she stopped in evident embarrassment she recognized the apparent egotism in that last sentence and did not seem to know how to make her position clear but uncle anthony only looked at her with his keen gray eyes and waited so she began again uncle anthony when people unite with the church they promise you know to walk in love with that particular church and be guided by its advice at least the covenant of our church has such sentences not guided contrary to their own consciences of course but i mean they promise to consider carefully what that church thinks and agree with it if they can now i know that dr ford our pastor doesn't attend theatres and doesn't approve of them neither do certain other members of our church some who are reckoned among the wisest and best people we have i thought there must be good reasons for their position they all have young people in their families who join heartily in other pleasures once last winter i was invited to attend a theatre it was a very good play they said and a great many of our young people went i declined the invitation because i thought i had promised to be guided by the views of the church in such matters and that the pastor represented the church estelle and fanny did not agree with me they laughed at me indeed estelle said it showed that i had a very weak nature or that i was making a mere puppet of myself not claiming to have any views of my own and when i came to think about it carefully i found it true enough that i had no particular views on the subject because i knew very little about it i didn't feel quite as estelle did about taking advice because what is the use of giving advice if people are never to take it still i knew it was the right thing to have settled opinions for oneself so i borrowed a book about theatres that i had seen in dr ford's study and read it carefully and really uncle anthony if the half that that book said was true i shouldn't think any self-respecting people would frequent the theatre why i don't mean that of course pausing suddenly while her face flushed crimson over the thought that uncle anthony took estelle to the theatre every evening while they were in syracuse but i mean i don't understand how people can make a business of going probably the book was written by some fanatic who had never been inside a theatre in his life volunteered uncle anthony more it must be confessed for the purpose of seeing what this new niece would say next than because of any deep personal interest in the matter oh no it wasn't he had been to a good many of them and had studied the plays most carefully as they are presented and knew a great deal about them i asked dr ford about it afterwards 
and he said that every one who had given attention to the matter knew that the statements made in that book could not be contradicted. He said attempts had been made to contradict them, which had proved utter failures. After that, I read several newspaper and magazine articles in the same line. I remember it seemed to me as though items about the theatre kept falling into my hands without my looking for them, but of course it just happened so. "'And so you almost decided never to go?' her uncle said, looking at her with a twinkle in his handsome grey eyes. "'How much ground is that almost supposed to cover?' "'Why, I didn't positively say that I would never go. Nobody has talked with me about it, except Estelle and Fanny, and of course they didn't care how I decided it. I have never been invited to go but just twice.' so I haven't had much temptation. Estelle said she would risk me if I ever got a chance to go to a real city theatre. But what I decided was that unless something happened, that is, unless I read some books or had a talk with people whom I trusted, who could assure me that much which had been said in that book and other books against theatres was false, why, I should just not go to them, that is all." don't depend upon me to try to change your views. Her uncle said dryly, I shall not undertake the task. Glyde laughed a slightly embarrassed laugh, and began again in a deprecating tone, Uncle Anthony, I hope I have not made you think that I would like to keep you away from anything which you wish to do. Won't you please go out tonight just as usual? I promise you I shall not be in the least homesick or lonely." I must finish my letter to mother, and then I saw a book downstairs which I am sure I can borrow. The lady who was there this afternoon asked me if I had ever read it, and said she knew I would like it. Won't you please, Uncle Anthony, act just as though I wasn't here? Her uncle laughed good-naturedly. Won't I please go off to the theatre by myself, and leave the little girl I brought along to amuse me, to play alone, eh? not if I am acquainted with myself. My child, you need have no compunctions of conscience over me. The theatres which I have attended during the last seven years have been perfect bores to me. I have gone chiefly to please some niece or cousin or young friend whom I had in charge. I shall be entirely willing to take up some new role. What shall it be, a prayer meeting? He was teasing her, she saw the fun in his eyes, but she laughed merrily. It was winsome teasing, with nothing bitter about it. She rather enjoyed it. Following the laugh, she said, You are making fun of me, Uncle Anthony, I know that. But, to be real honest, I have thought that some time I should like to go to a very large city prayer meeting, such as I suppose they must have in these great churches in New York. I have read of prayer meetings which it seemed to me it must be a perfect delight to attend. I don't mean tonight, of course, and indeed I don't mean to insist on you taking me at any time. I am ready to go wherever you would like me to go, or to stay at home with you and let you rest. I truly haven't any pet schemes which must be carried out. I believe you think I am a little bit of a girl who must have the particular toy that I want to play with, or I shall go off in a corner and pout. No, he said emphatically. On my word, I don't. I haven't seen a pouting streak in your makeup. A prayer meeting, eh? That's entirely out of my line. Never in all of my experience with nieces have I been called upon to produce one before but we ought to be able to find one within reaching distance, I should think. If I mistake not, this is the regulation night in this city for entertainments of that character. I have run across one once or twice in a business way, I remember. We'll sally out and see what we can do. As Glyde settled her pretty hat before the mirror and slipped her arms dexterously into her sister's sack, and hunted eagerly for the pair of gloves which suited her best for evening wear, her uncle watched her with a curious mixture on his face of amusement and tenderness. A close observer would have been sure to have noted the touch of sadness also. 
some sweet past memory had been awakened and was tugging at his heart had he spoken the words which floated through his mind they would have been something after this fashion so this is a new type of niece altogether takes me back eight nine how many years she is like her aunt estelle queer that the other one should look like her and this one be like her i thought the type had gone out of style my little girl had very much the same notions about theatres i remember with neither pastor nor books to help her to her conclusions she did not like some of the things she saw there and so would have none of them she was a positive little woman yet with gentle ways about her positiveness such as this one has i have not seen anything of the kind since the soliloquy closed with a sigh but it was not so heavy as the lonely man's sighs were apt to be when his thoughts strayed into his precious past he was conscious of a new interest in life up to this time he had petted estelle because she bore the charmed name and finding her totally different from his original had told himself that he must expect nothing else there were no girls in these days like his estelle he thought of her as though she had been gone from earth for generations as indeed it sometimes seemed to him that she had but here was a revelation behold his niece glide whom he had hitherto noticed at all simply because she was his favorite sister's daughter and with whom he had not exchanged a dozen words connectedly since she emerged from childhood now she was blossoming before him into something like his ideal young womanhood at least she strongly suggested it and it would be worth studying to see how much they really were alike he had discovered her by a happy accident whatever it was which had detained the nutting party he hoped of course that nothing unpleasant had happened but he owed them all a vote of thanks for having discovered to him this particular niece whom he would take care not to lose again. End of chapter 7Chapter 8 of Making Fate by Pansy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 8 The Young Man Has Come. So you have on your sister's sack? he said, as Glyde turned presently from the mirror and daintily gloved announced herself quite ready her face flushed crimson under his question and his critical survey oh uncle anthony she said pitifully how did you know why the transom was open you remember and i heard things unlawful for a guest to hear never mind you did not say anything that i shall not forgive how does the sack fit perfectly estelle and i have the same figure though i am a trifle taller than she doesn't it look well on me i don't see anything to find fault with what does estelle wear in the meantime that is what troubles me a little or would if i were not so selfish that i cannot remember to be troubled about anything just now she wears mine i suppose and she doesn't like it mine is really rather shabby and i am truly ashamed of having taken hers without asking for it what do you propose to wear when you get home oh i can wear the old sack there well enough but it was too shabby for new york i don't go out a great deal you know i am the third one and that does make a difference i am afraid you do not like the sack after all don't i look all right in it with a little anxious survey of herself as she noticed the shade of gravity on her uncle's face you look remarkably well i should say how does it happen that there is such a striking difference between her winter rig and yours why it was her turn this winter we have to take turn about there are so many of us you know and father is sick i don't mind being the youngest of course it doesn't make so much difference i see but estelle is not the oldest of you girls no slowly and with a little perplexity of tone and manner fanny is the oldest but then estelle is she stopped to laugh and went on merrily 
she is the unfortunate one perhaps her clothes are always growing shabby before fanny's and mine she dashes about a good deal and is harder on her clothes perhaps you don't know what a difference there is in girls in that respect but mother realizes it i am sure poor mother is kept busy day and night trying to plan for us all i think estelle cares more about things than fanny does perhaps she seemed trying to explain satisfactorily to herself the evident difference which had to be made between the two elder sisters her uncle followed her downstairs with the shade of gravity still on his face he was thinking of the burdened life of his favorite sister somehow he had learned more about the circumstances of the family in his few short conversations with glyde than all his trips over the country with estelle had evolved estelle had seemed to be absorbed with herself she belongs to another world he said once more thinking of glyde to the world of prayer meetings and all the things which match they went out among the moving throngs on the street they took the l road which was a never-failing source of pleasure to glide she liked to whirl along over the tops of tall buildings and watch for the new and curious sights which such elevations afforded her they left the car at forty-second street and walked briskly down several blocks reaching at last a massive stone pile whose spire pointed heavenward several people were passing into the building by a side entrance and they followed reaching presently an audience room larger and finer than glyde had ever seen before the great doors seemed to be hung in air so silently without visible help did they appear to open and close the carpet gave back no answering sound to any footfalls the lights which flooded the room came from hundreds of lily bells which drooped their graceful heads for that purpose an upright piano occupied a central position near the desk and at the left was a handsome pipe organ which was giving forth sounds of exquisite harmony as they moved down the aisle the seats were perhaps half filled with men and women chiefly women no ushers were in attendance and glyde and her uncle helped themselves to seats as seemed to be the fashion of the place a hymn-book lay unused near them and glyde essayed to find the hymn which was being sung but failed it apparently occurred to no one to assist her following the hymn the pastor called upon some one to pray and a prayer followed remarkable to glyde for two things long and involved sentences and large words it also grew to be remarkable for its continuance she thought the petitioner must be deeply interested in every nation and question under the sun for he seemed to her to omit nothing in all the wide range of human interest save the people who were present with him in the place of prayer poor glyde assured herself that it was undoubtedly a beautiful prayer and she was deeply mortified because she could not keep her thoughts in line with it despite every effort to the contrary they would go back to the groups of people she had watched that day and to her uncle anthony's remark concerning them was new york different from other places or could the world be almost divided into two classes of people those who did what they ought not and those who could not do as they would with only a very few sprinkled in between who made life a success this girl of nineteen wanted all lives to be successful she not only mourned but felt a restless sense of injury in the thought that it was not so why had fate arranged that such a multitude of people should be disappointed she said fate from motives of respect and felt that she was reverent in doing so she would not have called god in question but that mysterious creature named fate she was willing to arraign she wondered if uncle anthony liked to talk about such matters and what shrewd remarks he would make concerning them and then she brought herself back sharply to the thought of prayer to find that it was at last concluded there followed what uncle anthony called an address from the man who was presumably the pastor he read a few verses from the bible but the address did not immediately follow the reading and the two seemed to have no connection 
he had much to say about medieval Europe, which topic it must be confessed had no interest whatever for Glyde. She was bitterly disappointed, and during the progress of the address could not keep her eyes from turning in the direction of the great clock which ticked solemnly from a conspicuous pedestal. Once she caught her uncle's eye, but it was so full of fun that she was afraid to look in his direction again lest she might laugh. On the whole, Glyde's first prayer meeting in New York could not in any sense of the word be called a success. She tried to join in her uncle's bits of merriment at her expense, but at her heart was a sore troubled feeling. She was a young Christian, and her experiences thus far had not been rose-colored. Was it strange that the watchful enemy, especially of all young creatures, contrived to smuggle in the questionings as to whether the high hopes she had indulged about this new life when she began it were a delusion did it mean a mere commonplace plodding along the road prayer meetings from a sense of duty with no joy in them and nothing outward anywhere which was calculated to win others men like her uncle for instance Glyde admitted to herself that the girls seemed to be satisfied with such a state of things, or rather they seemed to her to think nothing about religious matters save at stated times, but she had confessed to Uncle Anthony that she was not like her sisters, and she felt that in this, as in other matters, it was true. After the prayer meeting they went sightseeing, Uncle Anthony knew just where to lead his novice to make her eyes open wide with wonder and her whole face sparkle with delight. But he brought the shadows to it again by saying, as he kissed her good night, Well, if the first part of our evening was a dismal failure, the last half was a brilliant success. In the great law office of Messrs. Peel and McMasters, business was pushing as usual. Shorthand reporters were clicking their typewriters at their utmost speed, transcribing their notes of the previous night, and the quieter but no less busy clerks who wrote with pens were at their desks giving undivided attention to business. The only unoccupied person in the room was a young man with alert face and keen eyes, who was evidently taking in the possibilities of the place with a view to, or hope of, the possible future. In the private office, the senior partner of the firm and one of his confidential assistants were in close conversation when a knock at the door interrupted them. "'The young man has come, sir,' said the intruder hurriedly, speaking as one who knew he must save all the time possible. "'You gave orders, you remember, that you were to be told when he arrived,' Here is his card, and a letter of introduction from— What young man? interrupted the chief. Oh, I remember, we telegraphed him. It was unfortunate, too, now that this unexpected matter has come up in the trial. We have no time for minor business affairs of any sort. But it cannot well be helped now, I suppose, and we are certainly in need of more help in the office. How does he appear, Mr. Albertson? Does he want to stay now, or has he only come to survey the land? Let him work, if you can, on approval. Tell him I will see him later, tomorrow if possible, or the next day. If he is good for anything, he can work a few days on suspense. Close the door now, and don't let us be interrupted again. Thus summarily were the young man's interests disposed of and he had waited for months and planned for weeks with regard to this hour. As he waited now, outside, in that busy office, his heart throbbed unnaturally in alternate throes of hope and fear. It meant so much to him, this opportunity. Mr. Albertson tiptoed back. The habit of his life was not to disturb the workers in that office he carried on an undertone conversation with the stranger a short one he had learned not to waste words mr peel cannot see you to-day he is very sorry mr mcmasters is out of town called out unexpectedly however that will make no difference if you want to go to work we are in need of help and my orders are to set you at work if you are willing on approval you understand 
of course we cannot say that it will last for twenty-four hours oh i am quite ready to go to work on those terms the stranger said quickly i am ready now he looked about apparently for a place to set down his hat and seemed eager to commence at once mr albertson allowed himself to smile it is true he had seen eagerness for work before and was often sceptical as to the length of time it would last but something about this young man attracted him and the eagerness lasted all that day and the next the stranger wrote steadily on whatever was given him to do mr peel still continuing too busy to talk with him a novice he was of course needing much direction and continual oversight but before the first day was over mr albertson knew that he approved of the young man you will have more chances for study of course if you remain with us he remarked kindly at the close of the first day things are more than usually rushed with us just now on account of unexpected developments in the great lawsuit for which they are getting ready but in ordinary times mr peel will often give you a few minutes and mr mcmasters is very kind and helpful to students while you are waiting for them if there is anything i can show you about books or in any line just call upon me this was a great deal for mr albertson to say if the stranger had but known it it evidenced an unusual liking for him on the part of this silent man who was yet a power in the workroom during a moment of leisure on the following day it occurred to mr albertson to question where the new man was stopping and if he cared to look up a boarding place or would prefer to wait until his affairs were more settled upon being informed that the young man was stopping with his uncle and could continue to do so in the event of a permanent engagement mr albertson liked him better than ever lawyers clerks who were living in boarding houses among strangers were so liable to get into scrapes it happened that before that second day had quite closed mr albertson had occasion to spend nearly five minutes in the same room with his chief he watched for an opportunity when that busy man seemed to be stopping for a moment of rest and rushed in his sentence the new young man takes hold well sir we haven't had a student in five years who has seemed so thoroughly in earnest he gives his attention so fully to the business in hand that he makes few mistakes fewer than some who have been with us for months ah is that so came from mr peel in an absent-minded tone yes sir and between times he studies with all his might knows how to study too i should say glad to hear it said mr peel i hope he will make a success of it i knew his father years ago and shall be willing to give the son a lift but of course we must go slowly in such a matter don't give him any encouragement as to permanency albertson remember we can afford to have only a certain class of students about us to-morrow or the next day i may be able to have a talk with him to-morrow passed without the opportunity being found it was toward the closing hours on the fourth day of the new student's appearance that another young man entered the office that young man was ralph bramlett to account for this extremely tardy arrival it will be necessary to go back to the morning on which he first heard of the opportunity and its probable loss he expressed himself freely on the subject and his sister hannah who was not given to sparing words was equally outspoken what do you suppose we could do about it two women here alone if you hadn't stayed away from home all night like a silly boy you would have been here in time to have attended to your own business this was too true to be palatable but it was also too true to contradict ralph was moody and miserable during what was left of the morning and by afternoon his father not having yet returned he announced his intention of driving to a town some twelve miles distant to see to some business which would have to be attended to before long in vain his mother protested the storm was increasing in violence it was not the day for a long drive into the country 
Ralph had a slight cold now, and this was exactly the weather calculated to increase it. She did not believe that father would like to have the horses exposed unnecessarily to the storm. There was no haste about that matter, it could wait another week as well as not, and there were dozens of things to be done which the rain need not hinder. She might as well have spared her breath. Ralph was inexorable. He would take that twelve miles drive and attend to that particular business on that very day. We have had enough of delays already, he said savagely, and he looked at his mother and sister as though he considered them to blame for all the annoyances which had resulted from the last one. End of chapter 8「Chapter Nine of Making Fate by Pansy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Nine Poor Ralph. He had his way and took his twelve miles drive, only to discover that the man he had gone to see was miles away from home in another direction. Thoroughly soaked and thoroughly miserable, he reached home somewhere near midnight and went supperless to bed declining almost roughly the choice dishes which mother and sister pressed upon him. He could not eat a morsel, he declared. He had a headache and wanted to be let alone. By the next morning it was apparent that he had not only headache but fever. A wretched cold kept him an unwilling and irritable prisoner for two days. On the third, common sense began to assert itself, and take him to task for not going to New York as soon as he heard of the call. How could he be sure that the opportunity was lost, even though he was a few hours behind time? The more he thought about it, the more he accused himself of folly, and finally he resolved to go that very day and learn his fate in person. "'You can explain how it was that you were detained,' said his father. "'That is, if you have anything to explain.' at least you can state that you have been ill and that is always a reasonable excuse i do not suppose that it will be absolutely necessary in the cause of truth to add that you brought the illness upon yourself it is very unfortunate the whole of it if mr peel is in the least like he was as a young man he will demand promptness and frankness above all things i don't understand the situation very well myself I thought you had grown up, my boy. All this was very irritating to Ralph. He was in a condition to be irritated easily. He had driven to town that afternoon and spent an hour walking about aimlessly, trying to decide whether he should call upon Marjorie after the old fashion, as if he had run in for a moment's chat as a matter of course. Before he had determined whether this was the proper thing to be done, it was settled, while he was still half a block away from her door, by seeing Marjorie emerge from it and walk briskly downtown. He crossed the street and followed at such good speed that he overtook her just as she was entering Melbourne's store. "'Good afternoon,' he said hurriedly, the importance of being in haste if he would not lose her in the vortex inside, finally settling the vexed question for him." She turned her head, much as she might have done if a child had arrested her steps, said in her quietest, most indifferent tone, "'Good afternoon,' and immediately disappeared among the crowds of people inside the store. When before had Marjorie Edmonds responded thus coldly to greeting of his? His indignation returned with violence. "'Very well,' he told himself angrily. If Marjorie Edmonds had decided to break with him merely because he did not obey her orders like a child, she was at liberty to do so. He would go away at once to New York, and stay there if he possibly could. Forever, perhaps. At least, long enough for her to bitterly repent her treatment of him. So it was, after all, this experience which finally sent him to wait in the office of Messrs. Peel and McMaster's. "'What name did you say, sir?' Mr. Albertson had asked him, moving a step nearer with a look of surprise and bewilderment on his face. 
now ralph was still in the mood which had been evolved by all the exasperating occurrences of the past few days and could not be expected to be courteous to one whom he regarded as a mere clerk bramlet he said irritably and in a louder tone than was generally used in the office it is a sufficiently uncommon name to be remembered i should think and you are expected do you say certainly i am i have had letters from mr peel and finally a telegram he omitted to state how many days had elapsed since the telegram reached him mr albertson's step was slower than usual and there was a look of undoubted mystification on his face as he made his way toward the private office and waited for admittance there is a young man sir he said hesitatingly when he finally had permission to speak and then he told ralph's story what is all this asked mr peel who had been writing during his clerk's opening sentences he held his pen in the air now and whirled about on his chair for a full view of the speaker's face i have written him does he say and telegraphed him when pray what does it all mean what do you say the name is that is the strange part of it he says his name is bramlett bramlett why i thought that young man had been at work in our office for four or five days and was giving satisfaction isn't that his name i certainly understood so from you he sent in his card if you remember i did not so much as glance at it nor did you but you told me he was the young man you expected and i knew that that young man's name was bramlett you ordered me to set him to work and did he say he had a telegram from me no sir he said nothing to me about telegrams it was you who told me you had telegraphed him and on the strength of that you set him to work without identifying him even by name i'm afraid you would not succeed as a lawyer mr albertson i supposed of course it was bramlett i was not expecting anybody else but it seems we both jumped at conclusions well unravel the mystery in any way you think best are they twins do you suppose no sir i shouldn't say that they were they look and act very unlike and you like the first one and don't the second that is plain i'm afraid you would make a prejudiced juryman mr albertson report whatever results you reach to me i haven't time for details the great man turned again in his chair as the sentence was completed and before the door closed he was writing again mr albertson went back toward the public office more annoyed than he often allowed himself to become he had certainly taken to the new clerk in a way that was unusual for him if he should now discover that it was all a mistake and that this intruder was to have the choice position which had been long watched for by more than one the gray-haired clerk's heart would be sad he preferred the mr bramlett who was now in possession even his chiefs rarely spoke to him in the tone that the intruding bramlett had used that morning instead of returning at once to the main room he turned aside to a small semi-private office and summoning a call-boy directed that the young man who sat at desk number two be sent to him am i mistaken he said in supposing your name to be bramlett yes he was the new clerk's name was burwell paul burwell and did you receive a telegram from mr peel the evening before you were called here oh no indeed he had never heard from mr peel by letter or telegram an old friend of his mother's george marshall of kennicott had learned incidentally that there was a possible opening in this office and knowing his extreme anxiety to secure such an opportunity had offered him a letter of introduction to mr peel which mr burwell had delivered to the clerk on the morning of his arrival and had been promptly set at work temporarily in the office he did not state how great had been his surprise and delight at this immediate result matters began to look very serious so far as this faithful worker's prospects were concerned evidently the intruder was the expected mr bramlett who had received letters and telegrams mr albertson was intensely mortified 
it was the first time, in all the fourteen years of his service with the firm, that he could be called to account for carelessness. There was nothing for it but to repair to his chief with the information which he had gained. The unexpected result was that Mr. Peel threw down his pen and summoned Ralph Bramlett to an immediate interview, during which that young man was subjected to a running fire of cross-questions. Where was he when the telegram arrived? What hindered him from making an immediate reply, either in person or by wire? Was he too ill to telegraph? Poor Ralph, unused to such close questioning, and with a foolish feeling at his heart that he had something to conceal, blundered and stammered and contradicted himself about headache and fever and thunderstorms and an all-night absence, until Mr. Peel regarded him with suspicious eyes, and wondered how much of the story was fact and how much he was composing for the occasion. He was left in the private office to consider the matter, while Mr. Peel himself strode into the large room to confer with the incumbent of desk number two, an experience so unusual as to startle all the clerks in the office. The final result was as poor Ralph might have known. A young man three or four days behind time, with such a confused and contradictory account of himself to give, could hardly expect consideration at the hands of such businessmen as Messrs. Peel and McMasters. Mr. Peel recounted as much of the interview as was necessary to his partner afterwards, and laughed in an annoyed way as he said, So it has come to pass that we, who are supposed to be exasperatingly particular in regard to those who come to our office as students, and who have at least a dozen estimable young men always watching for our vacancies, have established a perfect stranger, who was not even heard of until the morning when he presented himself, and was set to work. Fate must have had a hand in that affair. Perhaps the young man had a hand in making his own fate, observed the partner. More fate is made by promptness and faithful attention to business than young people dream of. Where has this other young fellow been during the days which intervened between the telegram and the appearance? He doesn't know, said Mr. Peel, laughing. He is the most confused person you ever heard of, unless I am more confused than he by his story. There was a storm and a ride at night and a headache and a bad cold, and he was sick in bed at the same time that he was taking the drive, I think. Anyhow, matters are hopelessly confused in both our minds. Albertson takes to the other one, and there is no known reason for displacing him when we offered him the place on approval. He has given entire satisfaction so far. Besides, I have looked up his letter of introduction, and it expresses a great deal in a short space, and comes from a high source. Oh, he is probably the one. We'll try him anyway." I should like to have gratified my old acquaintance, Bramlett, but he couldn't expect businessmen to wait four days. Now, Mr. McMasters, I am ready for business, if you are. When Ralph Bramlett walked slowly away from the office that morning, he had a bitter sense of his own folly. How long he had waited for this golden opportunity! An assured position in the office of Peel and McMaster was almost as good as being a lawyer oneself. It opened the way, as no other office did, for steady advancement and final success. And he had felt so sure of the position so soon as it opened. Mr. Peel's letters had been most kind. He had remembered his father pleasantly. He had promised his personal attention to the matter, and had given it and he, Ralph, had thrown it away for the sake of avoiding the passing sarcasms of Estelle Douglas. He hated her when he thought of it. Even after that he need not have been a fool. Why had he not taken the first train for New York that next morning, and explained in a manly way that he had been absent from home, and came by the first train after receiving his call? Then he would have been in time." He knew that he had not done so, simply because he had given way to a feeling of being ill-used, to a notion that fate was against him, 
and that there was no use in his trying to be anybody but a plodding farmer, which was his way of referring to that manly employment when he was in the depths. Nay, even after all the delays, why had he told such a confused schoolboy story to the great lawyer? What did he care about storms and picnics and colds? Had he simply said that he had been absent from home when the telegram arrived, and later had been too ill to give attention to business, he would at least have preserved his self-respect. On the whole, the young man had a wholesome feeling of self-dissatisfaction. He was even willing for the moment to admit that he had been to blame for all his trials, that Marjorie Edmonds was justified in feeling hurt and offended. He walked the length of an entire block considering the matter in this light. He felt an almost irresistible desire to have Marjorie's sympathy at that moment. He felt quite certain that she would have sympathy to give if he could call upon her now within the next hour and say first marjorie i want to tell you that i acted like an idiot and a bear the other night i don't know what possessed me or that is not true i do i wanted to save you and myself from the merciless ridicule of estelle douglas and so allowed her to persuade me against my better judgment i want you to forgive me if I had known how much your heart was set upon being at home that night, I would not have disappointed you for a thousand Douglas girls. And then, oh, Marjorie, I have failed in the desire of my heart. For three years I have been hoping to get in at the great law firm of Peel and McMaster's, and only that night, that fateful night, they telegraphed me, and I was not there to receive it, and I have lost my opportunity." How certain he was that she would speak gentle, encouraging words such as no other could. Never mind, Ralph, he could seem to hear her voice. You know, of course, that I am sorry, ever so sorry, but there will be another opportunity soon. Messrs. Peel and McMasters are not the only lawyers in the world, and even they may have an unexpected vacancy very soon don't give up heart, make up your mind that you will have the place you believe you are fitted for, and then watch for it. Some such words as those he would be certain to hear from her lips. He longed for them, he believed he would go home and carry out his part of the program so as to ensure hers. He took out his timetable and studied it. In two hours there would be a return train. Should he take it? He had met Estelle Douglas in the street the evening before, and told her he was going to New York to spend the winter. If he returned the very next day, how strange it would look to her! How many absurd things she could say because of it! His face flushed over the thought of her ridicule. Why had he told her he was going to spend the winter? Still, he need not rush home like a homesick child why not stay and see a little of the city now that he was here no he must get home he could ill afford the money that it would cost to stay he would wait simply for the midnight train that would bring him home in the morning in time for the day's duties the next question was how should he spend the intervening time there was sight-seeing enough for the hours of daylight but there was the evening when evening had fully come, he was still considering the question while he walked the street. He passed a large, plain building, which did not look like a church, but they were singing, inside, a hymn which Marjorie sang once in the choir at home. He paused, and was on the eve of entering the door. He wanted to hear more of that hymn. But he turned on his heel with a half-contemptuous smile. What an idea to spend his only evening he had for New York in a prayer meeting. How would that sound repeated? He went instead to a theatre. The play was neither of the best nor the worst. Perhaps the utmost that could have been briefly said of it was that it was weak. The hero was an ill-used man, a victim of fate, which pursued him relentlessly even to the bitter end. Ralph Bramlett followed him breathlessly to that end, then came away moody and miserable. 
he listened in vain for the sound of marjorie's voice in encouragement something had hushed it he told himself once more that there was no use in his trying in that wretched young man who tried and failed he saw himself fate was against him even marjorie his friend from childhood had turned coldly away offended over a trifle she might stay offended then he should not apologize what was there for him to apologize about it was she who had given them a wretched fright and put everything awry for the next day poor ralph the being he called fate had gotten possession of him again End of chapter 9chapter ten of making fate by pansy this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter ten a marked day years afterwards whenever glyde douglas wanted to refer to an especially happy period in her life she was sure to go back to new york and spend over again those days with uncle anthony especially to that lovely friday which followed the attempt to find a prayer meeting uncle anthony gave up almost the entire day to his niece in the morning they went shopping the conversation which was held just before they started is perhaps worthy of record glyde had confided to her uncle the existence of the two-dollar bill and the important part which it was to play in her affairs he was the most sympathetic of confidants all right he said his gray eyes twinkling with pleasure we'll attend to that the first thing what have you thought of oh nothing glyde explained or rather a hundred things still i think i have very nearly settled upon some of them i must have something silk for mother i suppose it will have to be a handkerchief does she particularly dote on silk handkerchiefs i don't think she has any i mean a soft white one that she can knot up and wear at her throat when she is dressed you don't know how it would be done uncle anthony but i do she would look pretty in it and for father i think i shall get some new neckties i know the kind he likes and i heard mother tell him that his were getting shabby i think i can get two but perhaps not i don't suppose you know what those neat little black ones cost do you they are not in the least like the ones you wear that means i suppose that mine are not neat never mind i can stand it no i don't know what they cost but there is probably somebody in town who does go on what next why the girls are the hardest not because there are so few things to get them but so many yesterday when we were going down town we passed a jewelry store it looked large and handsome and the windows were brilliantly lighted and there were some tiny pins displayed wee bits of pins clover leaves you know and violets and mignonette they were marked only thirty-five cents could they possibly have been good for anything at that price good for bits of glass and bright-colored paper said uncle anthony glyde laughed cheerfully i was afraid so she said then i am undecided in regard to the girls i thought if thirty-five cents could buy anything of that sort which estelle and fanny could wear i should like to get them for it happens that both of them have broken their pins oh well said uncle anthony we might look them up and see perhaps they would do for everyday wear seems to me you are very modest in your wishes silk handkerchiefs and even neat neckties are small affairs to represent your first visit to new york are they not well but i have to be modest laughed glyde didn't i tell you what my resources were i see but give free rein to your imagination can't you for the fun of the thing suppose you had well for purposes of illustration we will say a hundred dollars to spend this morning i'll venture a neat necktie that you would waste the entire morning tossing over things and wouldn't have the least idea how to spend them wouldn't i with a little emphatic nod of her head which was very becoming to glyde i know just exactly how to spend them 
I've spent hundreds and hundreds of dollars in that way, Uncle Anthony, and I'm thoroughly posted. All right, go ahead. Let me hear you think aloud. I never saw a girl who could spend a hundred dollars quickly and sensibly. What would you get for that mother of yours, for instance, besides the silk handkerchief? I should get her a silk dress, a beautiful black silk dress, just such an one as she ought to wear to church and everywhere. I don't suppose you half understand mothers, Uncle Anthony. Yours died when you were such a little boy. But you see, they have a way of giving everything up to their daughters, and sons too, I suppose, and going without themselves. When I was a little girl, mother used to have a black silk dress, which she wore to church almost every Sunday. I can remember drawing my hand over it to feel how soft it was, and I know just how mother looked in it. But she hasn't worn a silk dress for, it must be five years. She cut that one over for Estelle that time when she went to Syracuse with you, you remember, and she has never had another. You see, there are so many grown-up daughters that she cannot do things for herself. At least, she thinks she cannot. As for father, I should buy a great big splendid overcoat for him, just as warm and comfortable as could be. He wears a rather shabby one now, and it is not warm enough for the coldest weather either. But when we talk to him about it, he shakes his head and says it will do nicely for him. Then, for the girls, since it is something which will last forever, I should get real truly pins, costing as much as five or six dollars. There, haven't I spent almost my hundred dollars? But at this tremendous estimate for a truly pin, Uncle Anthony had thrown back his head and laughed so long and loud that it was some moments before he could answer her. You have done very well, he said at last remarkably well for a girl especially about the expensive pins <laughs> well but she said with a pretty pretense of indignation that was if possible more fascinating than her merriment what would you have me do i could not spend it all on pins could i and have nothing left for the dress and overcoat that is the way they do it three-fourths of the time my dear i verily believe said uncle anthony sobering at once and regarding his niece with an air of peculiar tenderness in truth his laughter had been very near to tears this innocent little girl who had fallen so unsuspectingly into his trap had revealed much more than she realized the fact presented itself to him for the first time that his favorite and indeed only surviving sister was straightened even in her wardrobe and his pale-faced brother-in-law, who had for years been carrying on a hand-to-hand -hand struggle with feebleness, wore a shabby overcoat which was not heavy enough for him, while he, Anthony Ward, without wife or child or anyone dependent upon him, was receiving a fine salary and tossing it about carelessly without regard to the comfort of even his very own. And here was this unselfish girl, with only two dollars of her own in the world, planning to spend every cent of it in little useful things for her loved ones, conscious all the while of greater needs which she could not supply. They went out very soon after this, making their way with all speed downtown, and plunging presently into the wonders and delight of Denning's store. Here, for the moment, Glyde lost her head entirely over the glories displayed, and Uncle Anthony smiled to himself as he thought he saw the soft white silk handkerchief lose its important place in her memory. He need not have feared. In a very few minutes she pulled herself up sharply, and said, with the gravity of one who had responsible matters on her shoulders, "'Uncle Anthony, take me to the handkerchief department, please. I must not spend time over these lovely things until my work is done.' He obeyed in subdued silence, and, with the utmost care, the handkerchief was chosen from a great multitude. The particular maiden must have it just so fine, and of just such a delicate tint of creamy white, with just such a hemstitch, and no other. Before the purchase was completed, the patient saleswoman and the patient waiter realized that the shopper knew just what she wanted. 
then uncle anthony electrified them both by gravely asking to be shown some black silk which would match the handkerchief you mean black silk handkerchiefs said the bewildered clerk handkerchiefs no indeed i mean black silk dresses or the stuff to make them of such as ladies wear i have a fancy for seeing how a white handkerchief looks on a black silk dress with a strange mixture of bewilderment dismay and delight setting all her pulses to throbbing glyde followed her uncle through the intricacies of one department after another until the silk room was reached here he suddenly developed into the keen critical man of business examining textures and shades with the air of an expert and asking questions which betrayed such a surprising knowledge of grades and styles as to fill the mind of his niece with awe and the clerk with respect he ignored glyde's timid hints that that silk was very expensive and the other was very heavy and tossed the precious fabrics about with careless hand at last came the important question how much does it take to make a dress for a woman of medium size the clerk suggested sixteen yards then give me twenty of this kind he said promptly selecting the finest piece on the counter glyde fairly held her breath while the rich breaths were being counted off once she began a timid protest uncle anthony can you possibly be buying that for mother i never even dreamed of such a thing and mother would be so mortified if she thought that i he interrupted her see here i gave careful and silent attention to your shopping now you just hold on until i get through with mine she was my sister long before she was your mother remember and if i have a fancy to see how a black silk dress looks under a white silk handkerchief what is that to you give me all the belongings that go with such a dress buttons and braid and lining and everything you can think of this last to the amused saleswoman who hastened to do his bidding never was silk dress better supplied with belongings than was that from the silk department uncle anthony asked in a low tone to be shown to the room where they kept sacks for young ladies like this one with a nod of his head toward glyde the appreciative attendant returned the nod and led the way swiftly glyde following her uncle in a state of mind more easily imagined than described in vain she exclaimed and protested when she found to what he had brought her uncle anthony had taken matters entirely into his own hands and would have his way that sack is all very well for estelle he assured her and i don't deny that it is rather becoming to you but you might as well have one of your own and i have a fancy for a kind they used to wear which i see has come back again try this one on little girl and see how it strikes me it was one of the newest styles fine and heavy and beautifully trimmed yet simple enough for a girl of the most refined tastes the quick eye of the saleswoman had caught the right size and the garment fitted as though made to order it suits me exactly uncle anthony announced in his most complacent tone your aunt estelle used to wear one very much like it go over to the mirror little girl and see what you think if it pleases you as much as it does me we'll call it a bargain no girl could have looked at herself in a full-length mirror and caught such a reflection as glyde did without being pleased her face spoke for her you like it said uncle anthony glad of it you may as well keep it on and have the other sent home it is warmer than that and this is a pretty cold morning but uncle anthony she said moving toward him and speaking low her appalled eyes had caught sight of the figure marked on the sleeve card and she did not know how to make her protest strong enough i truly do not need it my sack which i have at home is warm warmer than estelle's and i do not mind its being a little old-fashioned and indeed i cannot think that you know how very expensive this one is yes i do i know exactly what it costs you don't suppose i am foolish enough to buy an article without finding that out first thing do you 
I call it very reasonable for a garment gotten up in that style. It is well lined, you see, and will outlast three or four like that one you had on. The question is, does it suit you as well as anything you see around here? Oh, it could not be lovelier, but— Then we won't waste time over conjunctions, disjunctive ones at that. Just let the young lady wear it home, will you, and send the other to my hotel with the handkerchief, you know, and other things? The sympathetic saleswoman laughed. She had not had such an enjoyable customer in many a day. Her heart was in the entire enterprise. She led the way for Uncle Anthony with such promptness and success that several more bewildering purchases were made by him before he announced himself ready for luncheon. Uncle Anthony's lunches, which he managed entirely, were little studies in art for his companion. On this particular day, the oysters he ordered were served on a little silver-covered dish, and the coffee in a tiny silver coffee pot. As he served his companion to oysters, and beamed on her while she poured him a cup of coffee, and carefully sugared and creamed it to his liking, he said, This is something like, a little table to ourselves, and somebody to look after me. I'll tell you what, Glyde, I think I'll steal you and carry you home to keep house for me. How should you like that? The only trouble is, I don't stay at home three weeks at a time. And what would become of my bird in her cage while I was scurrying around the country? What will you have, Glyde, for a finish? Cream or what? We must be somewhat expeditious. It is later than I supposed, and there is a good deal of business to be done yet. Glyde assured him that she had thought everything, and more too, was already done but before the day had fairly closed, she saw how mistaken she had been. The neckties were duly attended to, and then Uncle Anthony seated her in a chair in a large clothing store and went off on his own account. He knew about overcoats, and needed none of her assistance or protests, but he laughed softly while he tumbled them over and examined and criticized and finally selected at the thought of the mixture of delight and dismay with which the little girl would examine his trophy when he displayed it in her room that evening. He took care that it should be heavy enough and of a material which would last for several winters at least. But no word concerning the purchase was hinted when he returned to Glyde to know if she was rested and ready for more shopping." Then he dazzled her completely by the display of glories in a certain jewelry store on Broadway. It was by no means the one in which she had seen the thirty-five-cent pins, and she exclaimed in almost terror over the marks attached to those in the show window, and to her uncle's suggestion that she might as well have a look at some real things while she had the opportunity, replied that it seemed almost wicked even to look at such extravagance. It does, really, she said in great earnestness, as he bent over the case with her and followed her eyes. Look at that blazing circle of diamonds marked two thousand dollars. Think of wearing as much money as that to fasten one's collar. I am honest in saying I think it is wicked. If I were, oh, ever so rich, I am sure I shouldn't do it. At least I mean I hope I shouldn't, for mustn't it be wicked when the world is so full of people who actually haven't bread enough? Don't torture me with any ethics of that kind today, little girl, her uncle said good-humouredly. I am not in the mood for them. I'm not going to buy any two thousand dollar diamonds, though. You need not be troubled. But it will do no harm to admire them. Come to this side and see if you find anything which pleases your taste and your morals better. The case on the other side gleamed with beauty, and Glyde studied it and exclaimed and enjoyed to her uncle's entire satisfaction. They did not seem so wicked, she assured him. There, for instance, was a perfectly lovely pin marked fifteen dollars. To be sure, she would not think of buying it, not if she had the money in her hand, any more than she should the two thousand dollar one but then, being the real thing, she supposed they could not make it any cheaper than that, 
and she could imagine herself, if she had a great deal of money, spending so much for a pin and thinking it right, because it was something which would always last. Then she asked, somewhat timidly, if her uncle supposed it possible in such an elegant place that there could be any real cheap pins which were worth buying, like those she had told him about in the window. "'Wait a little,' he said. "'No, I don't think that there are any of that kind here, but we can go elsewhere after we have had our enjoyment out of these. I like that twelve-dollar one at the left, that one with the pearl in the center, don't you?' They discussed and argued over the different styles, and agreed and disagreed a dozen times as to shapes and degrees of beauty, and enjoyed themselves as only a girl can who is in love with the beautiful, and has had little chance to enjoy it, and a man who is lonely and is getting his pleasure entirely out of her enjoyment. When at last Glyde obliged herself to draw back from the case and say, uncle anthony i am keeping you dreadfully am i not i forgot that we ought to hurry he closed the scene suddenly and struck her dumb with amazement and confusion by ordering two of the twelve dollar pins which she had insisted were the prettier and also the identical fifteen dollar one which she had first noticed and to which her affections had steadily clung oh dear she said almost with a sob as they emerged at last from the place of enchantment uncle anthony i don't know what to say to you say it is cold said her uncle briskly and that we must hurry home to dinner we have got to hunt up another prayer meeting tonight. end of chapter ten Chapter Eleven of Making Fate by Pansy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eleven Reaping Thorns. Marjorie Edmonds was in her room alone. It was late, and the house was still. The door which communicated with her mother's room, and which generally stood wide open, was closed. I will open it, mother, Marjorie had said, when I am ready for bed. I want to write in my diary first and do a few little things, and I'm afraid of disturbing you. And then she had kissed her good night with a smile. But the mother had sighed after the door was closed. She knew that Marjorie had other things to think about besides her diary. She knew that her heart was ill at ease, and the mother felt so little in sympathy with the struggle which was going on that she must keep away from it. It was three weeks since that eventful nutting party had gone merrily on its way, without a thought of the day being seriously connected with the future of any of its members. Yet Marjorie had known few happy moments since that day. Indifferent as she had appeared to Ralph Bramlett, if that young man had been ever so slight a student of human nature, he would have seen that her very indifference was an indication of strong feeling indignation might be natural and pardonable under the circumstances but marjorie edmonds was not the girl to put away thus suddenly the playmate of her childhood and the companion and confidant of her girlhood without keen pain there had been no deliberate intention of putting him away there had been at first only strong indignation he deserved the fright she gave him he deserved the coldness with which she had greeted him that afternoon. What young woman who respected herself could do less than that? She had asked herself, as she closed the store door and made her way through the crowds of Christmas shoppers, thinking not of the purchases she had come to make, but of the young man outside. Yet even then she felt, rather than planned, that this sort of thing should not last ralph would call to see her of course probably that afternoon on his way home or certainly in the evening then they would talk matters over he would explain to her why he had been so hateful the other day and now she more than half surmised the reason he did not want me to be annoyed by estelle's absurdities said this forgiving heart he would make it all plain to her and ask her to forgive him 
and then after he had humiliated himself quite as much as he should she would softly admit that her part of the performance had been rash and cruel that she was sorry for the fright she gave him then she would tell him how frightened she was and how she had thought at the time that if he were only walking beside her she would not be afraid of anything why it would all be made up between them of course how absurd in friends of their standing to quarrel over a trifle for even at that early day marjorie began to try to call ralph's treatment of her a trifle if he had called that evening she would have been almost ready for him but he did not he went to new york when marjorie heard that she was startled ralph must be very much hurt indeed to go out of town without seeing her if she had known that he was going away perhaps she would not have responded so coldly to his good afternoon she heard also that he had been ill which accounted she believed for his not coming at once to see her she thought much about him during the next two days had ralph taken that midnight train from new york as he at first planned and called upon her the next evening she would have been quite ready for him and all the soothing words he had imagined as flowing from her lips would doubtless have been heard but he did not come and she heard through estelle douglas that he had gone to new york for the winter and he did not write two weeks went by and then suddenly one morning ralph passed the house on the opposite side of the street he was talking with estelle douglas and as they walked slowly by neither of them raised their eyes to her window then marjorie began to grow indignant over again if ralph meant to cast her off in this way because she chose not to leave her mother all night after he had failed her then he might she was willing she drew herself up proudly and looked after the slow walkers with dry eyes and glowing cheeks but this mood did not last she was sure ralph must misunderstand he could not know how she had longed to get home and how she had suffered in coming perhaps he knew nothing about it perhaps he imagined that mr maxwell had called for her by appointment and taken her home people will imagine anything said poor marjorie when they are excited by degrees it almost began to seem to her that ralph was the injured one and that she ought to speak some word which would reach his ears meantime the mother looked on and was sometimes sympathetic and sometimes indignant and all the time miserable it has doubtless been discovered before this that ralph bramlett was not mrs edmund's choice for her daughter in truth the daughter by no means made it manifest that he was her own choice but the mother looking on feared exceedingly yet was afraid to speak lest that which she feared would be precipitated thereby they are only boy and girl friends she told herself encouragingly at times but at other times she realized that boys and girls grew to be men and women at least two years before this time she had felt sure that her daughter had outgrown ralph bramlett but the daughter had not discovered it what if she should never discover it then the mother wondered if ralph bramlett could not be made to grow even to overtake her daughter to this end she had set herself to work to try to bring all wise influences to bear upon him but ralph although it may be hoped that he did not know it was skilful in putting aside wise influences when the nutting party came and the break which grew out of it this mother secretly rejoiced when ralph went to new york without word or sign she was of course indignant with him for her daughter's sake but secretly glad too for her sake if only he would stay away and write no letters in the course of time her daughter's self-respect would assert itself and she would realize that she had been tossed aside in a pet but now he had returned and had been at home for a week and some astounding things had occurred for the first day or two following the young man's return marjorie had been nervous to a degree that no one had ever observed in her before 
she had started and grown pale at every sound of the doorbell, and had been at all times on the alert for something to happen. Something happened, but it was not what she had expected. Does what we are expecting ever happen? Ralph Bramlett did not call, but Estelle Douglas did. Of course you know the latest item of news, she said. Indeed, I suppose you knew it long before we did, and of course you approve, or it never would have been done. But I confess I was astonished when I heard it. That is very interesting, laughed Marjorie, or it would be if I had an idea what you were talking about. I cannot recall any item of news. Oh, my dear little Marjorie, you mustn't tell fibs, and you a descendant of the Puritans. Such an unnecessary fib, too. Do you expect me to imagine for a moment that Ralph Bramlett transacts important business without your knowledge? Now the form in which Marjorie Edmonds's pride was besetting her at this time was that she could not endure the thought of having Estelle Douglas know that she did not understand Ralph's affairs as thoroughly as usual so to this sentence no other reply could be made than a half-laughing non-committal one estelle pressed the point tell me honestly marjorie were you not surprised and a good deal disappointed when he told you about it i said you would never consent to it and that i did not believe ralph would go contrary to your wishes of course it is a wholesale business and all that and ralph is only the bookkeeper he will have no more to do with selling the stuff than we shall, but still. This was growing alarming. Mrs. Edmonds in the next room caught, through the open doorway, a glimpse of Marjorie's paling face and came to the rescue. Are you talking of Ralph's latest business venture? she asked, appearing at the door and speaking as calmly as though she had known for weeks all that there was to know concerning it. Yes! said Estelle, turning eagerly to a new medium for her coveted information. What did you say to it, Mrs. Edmonds? Mother and I said that Mrs. Edmonds would be shocked, that young people might comfort themselves with the thought that a bookkeeper in a distillery had nothing to do with the liquor business, but that women of Mrs. Edmonds's stamp would not take it so calmly. You are right, said Mrs. Edmonds, in her quietest tone. I do not approve of it at all. Mother, began Marjorie, turning glowing cheeks toward her, do you think... And then she stopped. What she began to say was, do you think that we need to discuss Ralph Bramlett's affairs with outsiders? But the manifest rudeness of such a sentence, both to her mother and their guest, arrested her lips in time. Instead, she said, do you think I ought to try to get that letter off by this mail? Yes, said Mrs. Edmonds. It will save twenty-four hours if you do. Estelle will excuse you for a few minutes. And Marjorie ran away. The letter was one which could have waited, but the mother felt that her daughter could not endure more just then, and it was undoubtedly true that twenty-four hours could be saved by mailing it now so she spoke only truth. When the door closed after Marjorie, she turned quietly to Estelle. This is a very sudden movement upon Ralph's part? The tone was ambiguous. It might have a slight rising inflection, but it was not intended to inform the guest that Mrs. Edmonds knew nothing about the matter and was seeking information. I suppose so, said Estelle. I did not know how long he had been planning it. I heard of it only yesterday. I must say I was surprised, and yet in a sense I wasn't. He was so dreadfully disappointed about that New York affair, you know, and he hates farming. Then, too, I suppose it is quite necessary that he get to work in some way. The Bramlett farm is all run down, people say. This will be only temporary, of course, but it is a great temptation to a young man. He will have a very good salary. It was a settled thing, then. At least Estelle Douglas thought so. Mrs. Edmonds had continued in her very quiet way to get, without appearing to, 
what information she could without giving any when marjorie returned the letter having been posted she was as quiet and uninteresting as her mother they take it very differently from what i supposed they would estelle reported at home even mrs edmonds it seems is willing to have him get fifteen hundred a year in these hard times but they have been such a fanatical temperance people always that i must say it astonished me oh mrs edmonds said she did not approve of it but marjorie coloured up and looked annoyed at her for even that though she said it quietly enough and this was all that estelle had learned in the edmonds home utmost quiet reigned after the caller's departure marjorie had her sewing and she sewed steadily and silently for some minutes then she said timidly mother why don't you say something mrs edmonds turned from her cutting table and smiled tenderly on her daughter what should i say little girl you do not believe that absurd report about ralph i suppose i am afraid it is too true dear estelle was not only thoroughly posted but seemed to think that we were also she says he is regularly engaged as bookkeeper on a salary of fifteen hundred dollars but mother it is too absurd ralph a bookkeeper in a distillery he is a temperance man mrs edmund's lip curled a very little she could not help it she turned quickly back to her table to hide the curl she wanted to say he is not a man at all he is only a grown-up boy with feelings instead of convictions and he can therefore be swayed by the passing moment in any way that the current happens to be the strongest but she forbore and took refuge again in silence mother burst forth marjorie again i think it is dreadful in you to listen to that girl's gossip about ralph if he has made her believe that he is about to do some desperate thing like that he has been driven to it by disappointments and annoyances but i do not believe she has any foundation for her story you do not know estelle so well as i do to put it mildly she is very careless with her statements jumps at conclusions and reports as facts statements which are made sometimes in mere sport ralph has perhaps gotten off some nonsense to her which with her usual haste she has made into a story and rushed to tell i think i shall write a note to him mother and tell him what an absurd report is being circulated then was mrs edmonds dismayed a note to ralph written in the style in which marjorie could write it would be likely she felt to put matters on the old footing between them and from this her heart shrank with ever-increasing pain i thought daughter she said trying to keep her voice from expressing either pain or annoyance that ralph's treatment of you had been such as to make note-writing to him out of the question at least until he apologized but the daughter had made a movement of impatience as she replied oh mother i don't feel about that quite as i did i begin to understand it better ralph probably wanted to shield both himself and me from estelle's witty and disagreeable tongue i am sure after my experience this morning with her i ought to be able to sympathize with him in any case it does not seem to be just the right thing to let such a matter make trouble between friends of a lifetime it wouldn't be a very christian-like way to manage would it when marjorie said that she felt that it ought to close her mother's mouth she made no pretensions to being a christian herself but surely her mother ought to be glad when she tried to govern her life by such principles and mrs edmonds not in the least convinced felt nevertheless that once more the time had come for silence marjorie wrote the note and brought it to her mother to read dear ralph it commenced but that of course was nothing notes with more or less frequency had passed between these two ever since they had learned to write and they had always been dear ralph and dear marjorie the mother believed that if they were children again she would order her daughter's course differently was she beginning to reap what she had sown 
but the note was simple enough. Marjorie ignored any trouble between them. I am writing a line in haste, she said, to tell you of a ridiculous rumor which I heard but this morning, to the effect that you are going into the liquor business, or into a clerkship with liquor dealers, which is much the same thing. Of course, I do not credit it, but thought I would give you a friendly hint of what tongues are busy about. I suppose you have been very busy since your return, but is it not nearly time for you to remember that you have friends living on Maple Avenue? A very simple note, but the mother was bitterly disappointed in it. What more could a young man desire? Surely she must protest, even though she precipitated what she most feared. Her duty ought to be done. Daughter, she began, hesitating and trying to choose her words with utmost care, are you not afraid that a young man like Ralph Bramlett will take advantage of such a note as that, under the circumstances? Marjorie opened her eyes wide in astonishment. I do not understand, she said. What advantage could he take? It is like dozens of notes that I have written him before. I know, and for that very reason is encouraging. You and Ralph cannot remain children. You have grown up, and he is of the age when one looks for at least a dawning of manhood. In a heedless boy many things can be overlooked, which in a young man are almost unpardonably rude. Ralph was certainly very rude to you, and you felt it keenly. Yet you have written to him as though nothing had happened, and he was at liberty to be on the old footing without a word of apology. Again that movement of impatience, and the daughter spoke in a tone which her mother did not often hear. Mother, how can you be so hard upon Ralph, when you have known and cared for him ever since he was a little boy? He does not think of me as a young lady with whom he must be ceremonious. I was foolish to make so much of what was so small an affair. When one comes to consider it, how could he do as I wished without regard to the others? I suppose if the truth were known, I am the one who ought to apologize, for he must have been dreadfully frightened about me. Every uttered word seemed to make matters more hopeless from the mother's standpoint. She resolutely closed her lips, resolving that no provocation should induce her to say more at this time. Nay, to Marjorie's somewhat timid question, put a few minutes later, Mama, do you really disapprove of my sending the note? She forced herself to reply, Oh, I presume not, daughter. As you say, it is a matter connected with a boy and girl friendship, instead of between a lady and a gentleman. I presume Ralph thinks of you in the light of a sister, and some boys think they can be rude to their sisters whenever they feel like it. Poor Marjorie had said nothing of this kind, but her poor mother liked to think that she had. End of chapter 11「Chapter XII A Young Man of Moods » The note was sent, and three days passed before any reply to it was received. There were reasons for this state of things. In the first place, perhaps Ralph Bramlett had deteriorated more rapidly in the weeks which had intervened since he had seen Marjorie, then people can understand who do not know how rapid at times can be the descent of a soul. Just what forces were brought to bear upon him to help him downward would be difficult to explain. In truth there was no perceptible force, he simply slipped and allowed himself to keep on sliding without an effort to recover himself. Without even realizing that he was sliding, or at least that he had anything to do with such a state of things, it was always fate. He did not take the midnight train for home, as he had nearly planned. It was the hapless young victim whom he had studied at the theatre who prevented him from doing that. Since the world was going against him, let it go. He would have as good a time as he could by the way. 
That was the mood in which he had retired for the night at a late hour. It possessed him to an even greater degree when he arose the next morning with a headache and the dregs of his cold still shivering at him. He fell in that day with some companions who helped him in his slipping. Companions of that character can nearly always be found, even without search. At the end of three days the money he had brought with him from home was very nearly exhausted, but he stayed on in the belief that he was looking for work, though as he would do only certain kinds of work, and the market seemed to be already overstocked with people of like mind with himself, he had very little hope of success. Still, he wrote home explaining what he fancied at times was his motive for staying, and his father raised not without difficulty the amount of money which his son believed he needed for a month's stay, and sent it to him. For this expenditure, Hannah Bramlett quietly made some sacrifices of cherished hopes, not large ones, but they meant a good deal to her. At the end of ten days the money was exhausted and Ralph came home. Nothing very alarming from an outsider's point of view had occurred during his stay in New York. He had held himself from grave troubles of every sort. Nothing more important appeared on the surface than a debt of five dollars which had been borrowed in an emergency from one of his new friends. He had been assured that it was of no consequence at all, in response to his repeated statements that he would send the amount as soon as he reached home. He knew that he would do so that his honourable father would somehow secure the sum, though it were many times that amount, rather than have a debt stain the Bramlett name. Ralph assured himself that by so much he was like his father, and as the train sped along, he took pleasure in the thought that he was an honourable man, and that he was coming home from a first visit in the great city without any of the smirches on his name which some young men had brought from there. And yet, as has been said, Ralph had changed in many ways during that short period. One way in which it was evidenced was his manner of receiving a certain bit of information which came to him but the evening before he left the city. He fell in with a commercial traveller who had often visited his own town, and with whom he had a slight acquaintance. At that distance from home the man seemed like a friend, and Ralph confided to him his disgust for the farm and his futile efforts to secure a position to his mind. "'I'll tell you what,' said the genial man. "'I believe I know just the place for you. Do you understand bookkeeping? Well, then, the place is waiting for you. I suppose you know the Snyders, by reputation at least? They are looking for a bookkeeper of the right sort. He isn't easy to find. Their business is very large, you know,' and they must have a man of undoubted integrity. They give a fairly good salary on the start, with a chance for increase if there is satisfaction. Fifteen hundred a year is more than you can clear from the farm, I fancy, and a few years of clerkship of this sort would enable you to save money enough to study law on your own account if you wanted to. There is a good deal of opportunity for study, by the way, in that sort of clerkship, it isn't steady work all the while that they pay for, you know, it's responsibility. Why not try for the place? I think I could put you in the way of getting it. Our firm and the Snyders have business relations which make them very friendly. I believe our Mr. Perkins would recommend a name that I gave him, and the Snyders will be very likely to listen to Mr. Perkins. Shall I set the ball to rolling? Now the Snyders were well known to Ralph Bramlett. In fact, one of them had his handsome home in the same town where Ralph lived, and went to and from it every day by train to the city two hours distant where his business lay. It flashed through Ralph's mind that he could very possibly do the same, thus saving his board and enjoying what he had always fancied he should especially like, a daily ride on the cars. Yet he hesitated. Why? Even so short a time as three weeks before, he would not have hesitated for a moment. He could almost hear the echo of his answer. No, thank you. It is a very good berth for people of like views with the Snyders, but the Bramlets for generations back have been staunch temperance men, you see, dead set against the whole business. 
for his grandson to become for ever so short a time bookkeeper in a distillery would disturb even the rest of heaven for grandfather bramlett i am afraid in point of fact there could have been no such echo for he made no such answer the commercial traveller seeing his hesitation continued it isn't a subordinate position you know as bookkeeper you would be looked upon as a gentleman and have more leisure and more courtesy shown you than in a lawyer's office by a great sight and then there is the chance to rise i know said ralph slowly it would be a very good temporary opportunity if it were not for the business my people are prejudiced in that direction oh because it is a distillery i see but then man alive it isn't a partnership in the concern as a clerk who keeps the books of course you have nothing whatever to do with the sale of liquors why an angel might straighten out the books of a firm seems to me there is no responsibility involved except with money now the commercial traveller was honest enough he was not a deep thinker in any direction he had never been educated along these lines and the matter looked to him as he had stated it but ralph bramlett as far back in his family history as he could remember anything had known of his grandfather as a temperance thinker speaker and writer a radical of the radicals his son ralph's father had so far followed in the family line as to bring up his children to believe that liquor selling was a sin and that all connection with it however remote was therefore sinful on occasion ralph could argue for this side of the question and had done so in the debating society in a way to win commendation from certain who shook hands with him and assured him that they remembered his grandfather and that he was a worthy chip off the old block yet this young man with feelings not convictions hesitated and argued weakly and allowed himself to be convinced and the good-natured commercial traveller set the ball to rolling with such success that before ralph bramlett had been at home two days he received an invitation to become bookkeeper in the firm of snyder snyder and co on the third day he accepted it not until after he had sent his letter of acceptance did he tell his father and mother and hannah it so happened that before he told even them he had met estelle douglas and made haste he could not have told why to explain the situation to her she had irritated him at the time as she nearly always did despite the strange fascination which she had for him what does marjorie say about it she had exclaimed i don't see for my part why it is not a sensible enough thing to do as you say you have no more to do with liquor selling than the rest of us have and keeping books is an honourable enough employment but i shouldn't have supposed that marjorie edmonds would have thought so for a moment nor your father and mother either for that matter but then you are of age of course and will do as you please but i am amazed at marjorie's giving her consent said the young man who was being swayed continually by impulse why do you always speak as though marjorie edmonds had a mortgage on my common sense and judgment and everything of that sort i have said nothing about how she regarded it nor can i imagine why it should concern her it is a purely business transaction with which my friends have nothing to do then estelle had laughed that trying little laugh of hers and had answered oh ralph how absurd such old friends as you and i ought to be more honest with each other than that don't i know that everything connected with you in any way concerns marjorie edmonds did she know how much he wished that this were true or did she know of the serious break between them and was she trying to comfort or torture him he studied over these questions after he got away from her and could make nothing of them also he studied himself and tried to understand why he had been so precipitate what effect would this last step of his have on marjorie be sure he had thought of her when he took it while he was writing his note of acceptance the reckless mood was upon him 
Marjorie had chosen to get angry at nothing and throw him over, therefore he was not bound to consult her wishes. Let her be shocked if she would. It was all her own fault. But for her ill treatment, he would not have thought of such a thing. He imagined her trying to indignantly remonstrate with him, and he gloomily telling her that she had herself to thank for the entire matter. All this was very babyish, it must be admitted, but Ralph on occasion could be babyish. There were actually times when he exulted in her dismay and indignation. She had brought dismay upon him, why should she not feel it in return? There were other moods during which he entered into an elaborate argument to convince her that this step was the right and wise one. Times were hard, nothing could be done on the farm during the winter. His father was growing old and needed help. He had resolved to sacrifice himself and his prospects. There was no opening in the direction of his tastes which promised immediate returns, therefore his tastes should be crucified for the good of all concerned. In that mood he felt like a martyr who had risen above the prejudices by which he was surrounded, and therefore deserved a crown. From Estelle's interview with Marjorie, as ill fortune would have it, she came straight to Ralph. That is, she saw him at the corner and called, and of course he waited for her. She was still uncertain how Marjorie had received the news at Ralph's hands, and still anxious to learn. "'I have been in to see Marjorie,' she began gaily. "'I thought you might like to hear from her. I really pity you, my friend, if you have an engagement with her soon, for I do not think she is in an amiable frame of mind. Oh, she did not commit herself to me. Marjorie never is particularly communicative with us girls, you know. But her mother was more frank. She said in so many words that she did not approve of your new business at all.' I presume she knew that that would harm no one, said Ralph in his very stiffest tone. And then Estelle launched forth with her history of the things that Marjorie did not say, and with the description of her face and manner, which last was calculated to do the most harm under the circumstances. Estelle did not mean to speak other than the truth. She did not even mean to do mischief. She liked Marjorie Edmonds, but she liked Ralph Bramlett more. There were times when it seemed to her an angel's work to save him from Marjorie's coldness and hardness if she could. She had taken certain impressions from Marjorie's silence, and these impressions she gave Ralph for facts. By the time he had left her at her own door, his soul was in a tumult of indignation. Somehow he had gotten the impression, from what had been told him, that Marjorie posed before the girls, before this girl at least, as one who owned him body and soul, and meant to manage all his affairs for him with a steady hand, or else have none of him. Was there ever a weak man who was not afraid of being managed by a woman? The very suggestion put this one into a fury, and he walked away, resolved upon showing the whole Edmund set that he was his own master and meant to be. Nothing occurred to change this mood, and in the evening came Marjorie's letter. He received it and his sister Hannah's words with indignant eyes. "'Here's a note from Marjorie. I hope she tells you what she thinks of you. Perhaps you will care for her opinion, since you don't for any of your own family.' He answered her angrily that he knew his own business." and that, to get no thanks from any of his family, after sacrificing his own interests for their sakes, was exactly the return he expected. Then he shut his door with a bang, and sat down to read his letter. "'Dear Ralph,' were the first words. He felt all his pulses thrill and throb under their touch. The old-time familiar words. He had piles of notes from her tied with pink ribbon, the color which she wore so much, and every one of them began, Dear Ralph. There was no word of reproach, no hint of any difference between them. Apparently she had not thought of such a thing. It was just Marjorie's sweet, bright self, brushing aside as a thing of little moment an absurd rumor concerning him, only stopping to let him know of it, 
so that he might say the proper things to people in return for their folly. What an unutterable fool he had been! If now he could answer this cheery little note in the spirit in which it was sent, could reassure her that he had not, of course, given a serious thought to the opportunity which had come to him, because his principles would not admit of it, and then could tell her in a superior and manly way of his numerous business disappointments while in the city, and enlarge upon the strangeness of providence in thus closing all other avenues, and putting in his way only that which his conscience would not allow him even to consider, what a letter he could write! He was fond of expressing himself on paper, and could not help lingering over some of the sentences which he might pen under other circumstances, even while realizing the folly of them as he had shaped things. What an opportunity was this for saying in reply to Marjorie's hint that he had friends on Maple Avenue, that, judging from the way in which he had been treated, he had feared that he had no friends there. Then he could enlarge upon the horrors of that night when she was missed and searched for frantically, and incidentally he could hint, not in apology but simply by way of explanation, how deeply he regretted his inability to do as she wished that night. There were certain reasons which he could not in honour explain to her why this was really impossible, but he had supposed that she could trust him. Was there ever a more delicate thrust than that? And to think that he had cut himself from all such possibilities. For, despite the commercial traveller's logic, and his own many arguments, something assured him that Marjorie Edmonds and Marjorie Edmonds's mother would not receive a bookkeeper in a distillery on the same footing as they had received Ralph Bramlett, farmer no not even if his salary were fifteen thousand dollars instead of fifteen hundred in time he might overcome the prejudices of the daughter his influence was potent there the very note which he held in his hand indicated it but the mother would discourage that influence and would do what she could to prevent their intimacy and it would be a long hard tiresome ordeal if he had but known that Marjorie would write him such a letter as this, he would not have accepted the proposition, at least so he assured himself. What if he should throw it up even now? His father was bitterly disappointed in him, had told him he would rather starve than eat bread earned by a son of his through such a channel. His mother had cried, and Hannah had tossed her head and said, The Bramlet name was honoured now. Suppose he should write to the Snyders and ask for his release on the ground of his father's opposition. It would certainly appear well in a son to show such deference to the wishes of his father. Ah, but there was Estelle Douglas again. Had he not talked over the family opposition with her, and assured her that he must do the best for all parties concerned, even though they reproached instead of thanked him? Would not Estelle, with her quick wits, know that it was Marjorie who had overturned the whole, and would not her quick tongue blazon it abroad. He should be a laughing stock for the town, a man in leading strings. It would never do. He must abide by his promise. If Marjorie had not ill-treated him, he would never have made that promise. Under the sting of this thought, he wrote, Miss Edmonds seems to have forgotten that she chose to act as though the writer had no friends on Maple Avenue. He is prompt to try to understand efforts of that kind. So far as the rumor referred to is concerned, he expects to go into business for the firm of Snyder and Snyder in two days more. When a man cannot secure what he would, he must needs take what he can get, and endure alike the reproaches of friends and the sneers of enemies. It was this letter over which Marjorie Edmonds bowed her head that night and cried. She had not shown it to her mother. She could not endure the thought of doing so. Yet her mother must be told how utterly Ralph had failed her. She did not know that, although it was barely three hours since the letter had gone out of his possession, that Ralph Bramlett would have given his entire prospective salary for the sake of having it back in his hands unread. 
End of chapter 12chapter 13 of making fate by pansy this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 13 living below one's privileges uncle anthony had transacted one other piece of business during his day's shopping about which he said nothing to glide while she was absorbed over some lovely christmas cards he slipped back to the cashier's desk and carried on a low-toned conversation after this manner what has become of that meeting which occupied your thoughts so fully a year ago? The cashier turned from his roll of bills with a winning smile. It absorbs me as much as ever, and is holding its own as usual. We meet tonight in the old place. Won't you come? How many times have you asked me? said Uncle Anthony, returning the smile. A dozen years or so in succession, isn't it? But I never came in search of an invitation before, did I? no don't rejoice too soon i'm the same old sixpence but i've a bright new penny in my train a little girl who is in search of a model prayer meeting we went to one of the uptown churches the other night and didn't find it the model you understand and she was so disappointed that i thought of you i've set out to entertain the child if i can so we may come around to your barracks tonight it was because of this that at eight o'clock of that wonderful day glyde and her uncle entered the door of a large plain building which did not look like a church just as the hymn was being sung that had attracted the attention of ralph bramlett had he known that the people who were just passing in were glyde douglas and her uncle perhaps for the very surprise at the coincidence he might have followed them in that case would some of the story of his life been forever different who can tell this was a prayer meeting very unlike any which glyde had associated with new york very unlike anything which she had ever seen before the size of it her uncle thought must satisfy her the room was large and was closely packed with human beings it was a very plain room indeed not a bit of upholstery anywhere nor frescoing the walls which were as clean as whitewash could make them were hung with mottoes that flashed back in glowing colours familiar words come unto me all ye that labour and are heavy laden and i will give you rest ho every one that thirsteth come ye to the waters seek ye first the kingdom of god and his righteousness though your sins be as scarlet they shall be as wool and others less familiar at least to glide but very striking the room was brightly lighted and the seats though so plain were comfortable every one seemed to have singing books indeed almost the first thing glide noticed was a row of young men near the door one of whom darted towards them as they entered with two singing books open to the hymn which was being sung glyde knew the hymn and joined in the singing almost before she was seated there was such a volume of song filling the room that she could not help singing the hour which followed will stand out in her memory forever her experience with prayer meetings was confined to the church of which she was a member a large well-appointed church with a small prayer meeting and a pastor who was struggling with the problem of how to make it sufficiently interesting to win to a regular attendance those who had covenanted to sustain it as yet this was an unsolved problem it will describe to those interested in prayer meetings the condition of things as fully as if a page had been written concerning it glyde was used to decorous proper sounding prayers in response to invitations from her pastor most of the people who prayed were more or less cultured at least sufficiently familiar with the use of language to choose smooth flowing words and to ask for the usual proper things glyde listening had wondered how they ever had the courage to offer the first prayer did they write it out she queried and commit it to memory and did they by degrees add a word here and a sentence there until they had it to their mind the prayers did not vary greatly she observed through the months certain phrases were nearly always present proper ones beautiful ones indeed meaning a great deal 
but Glyde had grown so used to them that sometimes they did not mean much to her. She had wondered if they did to the petitioners. She had rejoiced in the thought that she was a woman, and would therefore not be called upon for such duty, for the various religious organizations springing up over the country, in which women took equal part with men, had not yet found favor in the town where she lived but in this meeting were men and women who prayed apparently as naturally as they breathed the petitions seemed to come from those who were just thinking aloud very brief for the most part heart cries for help for strength for encouragement to one who was expected to understand without explanation all the details lord help me to be true where thou hast placed me lord i thank thee for sustaining grace to-day father i want to be faithful strengthen me lord jesus remember my temptations these and a dozen other petitions followed in quick succession and the voices of the women apparently excited not the slightest surprise in any mind but hers looking about her during the next song service she discovered some of the faces which she had imagined she might see in new york men and women and even young girls who looked as though their experiences of life must have been far from satisfactory. Still, they were all decently dressed, and behaved with the utmost decorum, so that they could not be of the lowest. It was an extraordinary mixture, to this novice, who yet had studied faces somewhat, and found a charm in doing so. Some of the people were unmistakably from the cultured world. Their dress did not indicate it, for even Glyde herself, in her elegant new sack, felt almost too fine for the place, but there was an unmistakable air of ease and refinement about them which had to do with a daily life quite above that which Glyde lived, for instance, yet they mingled as naturally with these people, and seemed to be as entirely of their mind, as though they were brothers and sisters. It soon became apparent that not only reformed men were present, but reformed women and girls. One, a girl not older than Glyde herself, arose and said, Since I gave myself to God, I have had peace for the first time in my sinful life. And the marks of sin were so apparent on her old young face that even Glyde could read. Yet a lady sitting near, sweet-faced, pure as a lily, whose voice, when she sang, gave forth the exquisite melody of a highly cultivated one, turned as the girl sat down and smiling as an angel might clasped the hard bare hand in a warm human grasp which brought the tears to glyde's eyes what must it have done for the girl all over the room they arose as witnesses to the power of god to save them from the drink habit the gambling habit and the curse of other sins too low in the scale to be mentioned earnestness was written all over their strong sin-marked faces earnestness throbbed in their every word not only earnestness but something better than joy something the girl had expressed by that word peace then perhaps the next voice would be from that other sheltered cultured world and the face would indicate purity and strength yet the witness would be the same the power of God to keep in peace and safety from small temptations so called, as well as from great ones. As Glyde listened and sang and joined in the prayers, her heart grew warm as never before with the sense of fellowship in Christ. Surely this was a prayer meeting which her uncle Anthony could approve. She glanced at him occasionally, but could make nothing from his face. He sat very still, not even joining in the singing, of which he was exceptionally fond. Much of the time his face was shaded by his hand. She could not be sure whether he was interested or bored. She did not know how entirely he had been taken into his sweet and sorrowful past. He used occasionally to go with her Aunt Estelle to such meetings. He had avoided them most fiercely for years. Only his love for the little girl he had found and the desire to please her in every way, had broken through his grim resolve, and brought him again into the atmosphere which he had dreaded. Not far from them was a young man to whom Glyde gave some interested thought. 
there was something about him which made her think that he was a stranger like herself he watched with a certain suppressed eagerness to see what would be done next he listened with marked intensity to every word which was spoken he joined in the singing as though his soul were in it yet he was from another class than most of the young men a gentleman in every respect glyde decided and one who had always lived a life that honored his mother was he a christian she wondered she was not used to young gentlemen who were christians now that she thought of it she lived in a town where it did not seem to be the custom for young men to attend prayer meetings even the estimable young men those who waited sometimes at the church doors to attend their friends home nearly always waited at the doors it did not seem to be expected that they would come farther she had not given the matter much thought but how many she could recall whom this state of things described there was ralph bramlett for instance who was an intimate friend of their family who passed their house on his way to and from town and often stopped to chat with them who had walked with them more than once as far as the church door on prayer meeting evenings when they had chanced to meet yet she had never heard the girls ask him to go into the meeting nor express surprise that he never came but then to be sure ralph was not a christian and neither was marjorie edmonds perhaps if she were it would be different with ralph perhaps if they were both in the habit of attending such prayer meetings as this they might be helped to enter that way surely they could not remain in such an atmosphere long without wanting to be one with it and then poor glyde fell into wondering where in her part of the world such an atmosphere as this could be found would ralph and marjorie be likely to be helped by the prayer meeting which she was in the habit of attending pity the girl and pity the church to which she belonged because she was in all honesty obliged to confess to her secret soul that she was afraid they would not be that it was too often only a duty and a weariness to her then the young man suddenly broke in upon her train of thought by springing to his feet brethren he began i cannot resist adding my word as a witness i am a stranger in the city this is the first time i have been in a prayer meeting since i left home but i find myself among brothers and sisters those who serve under the leader to whom i belong those who have discovered for themselves the power of god to save and to keep brothers if some of you have not tried that power i add my voice to-night to help to convince you of its reality then followed such words as glyde felt must help the rows and rows of young men who listened earnestly they helped her no she certainly did not know any young man like this one she wished that she did when the meeting was concluded glyde was surprised to see a middle-aged gentleman rush toward her uncle and hold out his hand we are so glad to see you here once more he said we have missed your visits very much isn't the question settled yet brother when i saw you to-night my heart gave a great leap of joy i thought we should hear from you never mind me said uncle anthony cheerily give your attention to the young people to that end let me introduce my niece she is one of your kind i suspect at least she was hungering and thirsting after a prayer meeting i am glad to see you the gentleman said giving glyde a hearty grasp of the hand now i must return the kindness and introduce my nephew paul this way please mr burwell miss douglas my nephew from the west and glyde found herself exchanging greetings with the young man whose words had helped her he was a stranger then like herself and yet his heart had been so full of the theme that he could not keep silence what if she had tried to tell what jesus christ was to her the mere thought of it set all her pulses to bounding i don't think i could have done it she told herself sorrowfully and yet i do love him and i want to be his witness just behind her stood a young girl who had prayed and spoken a few words glyde remembered the words to-day under strong temptation to anger my heart trusted in him and i was helped 
she was a plain common-looking girl in coarse dress and without any gloves at all yet glyde gazed upon her with a feeling of respect almost amounting to awe how wonderful that she could stand and say quietly such words in a prayer meeting nay how wonderful to be able to say them at all to be sure of having been helped in her commonplace daily life by the lord jesus christ they passed out into the street together her uncle and the elder mr burwell who were evidently old acquaintances were talking earnestly naturally mr paul burwell stepped back beside her it was good to be there was it not he said i have been half tempted to be homesick in this great city but this evening i found myself at home said glyde how many men there were who seemed to have sorely needed help and found it yes indeed reformed men a large number of them and reformed women did you notice the woman on your left three or four seats down my uncle says she has been a terrible character one of the most to be feared in the city perhaps because of her influence over younger ones five months ago christ won her and now she is a power in that meeting and in her neighborhood isn't it a blessed thought miss douglas that we have never yet heard testimony like this i cried unto the lord and he did not answer i pled for help and received none do you suppose there is never such testimony asked glyde slowly wonderingly she did not know how to converse about religion she felt embarrassed at the thought of trying to do so but she must be honest not even for the sake of appearances could she pretend by silence or evasive answer that prayer was to her what it seemed to be to those people i mean she explained do not people often or at least sometimes pray and receive no answer people who are in need and who feel their need and cry to him for help no how could they he cannot deny himself hasn't he promised oh we often pray i presume for what he will not for our own sakes give us and we often pray for that which we do not with all our hearts desire but i mean cases of felt need such as were represented there to-night to all such i think he has said before they call i will answer and while they are yet speaking i will hear pardon me miss douglas but do you not know the truth of this from your own experience i think so she said thoughtfully at the least i mean i hope i know him in that sense in fact i know i do i belong to him mr burwell and there are some ways in which i could have witnessed for him if i only had the courage but i do not think i can speak so positively as i could last winter for instance and as i thought then i always should to be entirely frank i have a half dissatisfied feeling over my religion a great deal of the time and yet i would not be without it but some way i want it to be more to me than it is i do not suppose i am making myself understood and i do not know why i am speaking in this way to a stranger i understand you perfectly we are not strangers we both claim the elder brother as our own will you forgive me for suggesting that perhaps you are trying to be satisfied with less than he can give when i first united with the church i tried to content myself with living as others did around me and as it was a cold church one in which the young people met often socially without saying a word about their leader or hinting in any way that they had a leader to whom they were glad to give supreme control you can imagine the result I was dissatisfied, discontented, half-hearted, and a good deal of the time miserable. When I found, some time afterward, that Christ was willing to be a center around which my business and my pleasure, as well as my hours of direct service, could gather, and that to accept him as the literal center of all my time was the only way to be a happy Christian, I really think I was glad of it for i had been having a most unhappy time because in some way my convictions had gotten ahead of my practice this was strange new talk to glyde yet her heart went out to meet it she felt that it was true 
she had been trying to be satisfied to do as estelle and fanny and the other girls who were church members did so far as outward life was concerned she had done as they did when had she spoken with any person about jesus christ how did she make it known to anybody that he was the one who had supreme control she had wished quite earnestly that ralph bramlett and marjorie were christians and had prayed for them both but had she ever in any way hinted to either of them that she cared whether they knew christ or not why had she not was it not because others did not talk about these things and she did not like to seem so different from others i think you are right she said impulsively speaking hastily as she saw that her uncle and his friend had halted at the corner just ahead and were evidently planning to take different routes i have been willing to stay below my privileges in fact i think i never realized what my privileges were until to-night i believe it will be different with me hereafter because of your words thank you end of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen of making fate by pansy this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fourteen a look backward and forward marjorie edmonds sat long that night confronting her problem she kept faith with her mother and opened the door between the rooms when she was ready for bed but the watchful mother knew that this time did not come until the night was far spent the girl made no record in her diary it is noticeable that with young people diaries are for happy hours when grave and desolating questions press down upon them they want better confidants than those for the first time in her life this young girl faced the situation as it was and tried to understand it ralph bramlett had failed her that was too evident the playmate of her childhood whom she had alternately commanded and petted the schoolmate of her girlhood whom she had held to a high standard in his classes by the spirit of emulation the young man whose development she had watched with delight and a secret sense of ownership such as she felt sure no other human being could feel had in the space of a few weeks so changed that he could write her the letter which was spread open before her and which she had read until it seemed as though every word was engraved upon her heart it was an utter bewilderment to her in all her curious questionings concerning her future there had never for one moment come to her a thought of it as separated from ralph bramlett had she then expected to become the wife of a man who had never so much as mentioned the subject of marriage to her she blushed painfully as she asked herself this question her thoughts of the future had all been girlish even childish she had not considered the questions of love and marriage there had simply been a rose-coloured stretch of years in which she and ralph and mother walked gaily down the paths always together and always happy but now that she had suddenly become a woman she reminded herself that although ralph had never mentioned the subject of marriage to her yet she had a woman's right to think of him as her future husband had he not shown her in every possible way ever since she was a child that she was always first in his thoughts since childhood had been left in the distance and they had been looked upon by others as grown people had not his attentions become if possible more marked than ever until everybody who knew them had said ralph and marjorie as naturally as though they were indeed of one name she took herself sternly to task for her blushing she had the right to claim him not that she was by any means in haste to be married she told herself or had ever given a serious thought in her life to that phase of the question it was only that of course they were to be together in some way and to be always more to each other than to any other persons that being the case she must have known she assured herself that there was but one way of accomplishing it but there was no occasion for feeling humiliated over such a thought for if anybody had been sought she could truly say that she had the question for consideration was 
what did ralph's present conduct indicate had he simply been playing with her all these years that was nonsense had he been disappointed in her or mistaken in his feelings was it only as a boy that he cared for her and when he began to call himself a man had he found that she did not satisfy his nature that must be the explanation of his strange conduct it was folly for her to try longer to deceive herself and say that she had ill-treated him it is one thing to speak coldly to a man who has been rude to one and quite another for that man to answer a note written with the old-time friendliness in the heartless way in which ralph had answered her miss edmonds indeed why he had never before called her that but more and infinitely worse than all these small matters was the fact placed on paper by himself and staring her in the face that he had gone directly contrary not only to her ideas of honor but to what she had supposed were his convictions of right ralph bramlett bookkeeper in a distillery the thing seemed so incredible that she found herself looking again at the letter to make sure that those were the words written thereon was there not some reading between the lines to prove that this was a horrid joke in truth it was a night which might well make a vivid impress upon marjorie edmonds's memory such a night of disappointment and pain and searching and surrender as she had never before endured it came to her at last and came overwhelmingly that she must give up this friend of her childhood and womanhood that all the pleasant days they had spent together were past and all the pleasant days which were planned for the future were not to be ralph was strangely mysteriously changed henceforth she was to be to him miss edmonds and she must learn to call him mr bramlett this girl of nineteen who understood life as little as she did her own heart felt nevertheless as real a pang over the breaking of her idol and the tearing away of all the pretty fabric of her imagined future as though they had been worth the sorrow yet she resolutely tore them away she had made all the concessions and advances that she could more than she ought perhaps it might be that ralph had been annoyed by her writing to him in the old familiar way that very act might even have helped to show him how mistaken he had been in her nay he might have planned his whole conduct with a view to making plain to her his changed feelings and she in her ignorance had not thought of such a thing but had credited him with obstinacy and an overweening fear of silly tongues then suddenly there flashed upon her another thought perhaps after all ralph did not fear estelle douglas as much as she had imagined perhaps instead he admired her they had talked freely together over her shortcomings in the past but the past was ever so long ago ages ago it seemed to this poor girl ralph had changed in other respects why not in that one the longer she considered it the more she felt this to be the solution ralph had discovered that estelle douglas was to be the friend of his maturer years then pride came to her rescue if such were really the case he need not fear any interference on her part she began to feel bitterly humiliated over the thought of her note to him why had she not listened to her mother when she hinted that ralph might misunderstand her writing it is true the mother had meant nothing of this kind but marjorie's nerves were in a state to so translate it having settled that she had discovered at last the true cause of the change in ralph a dozen questions came up at once for consideration how should she plan her immediate future with regard to this lost friend should she gather all the notes and letters literally hundreds of them which had accumulated through the years for when people are two miles apart and like to write many excuses can be found for notes and packing them all tied in pink ribbons as they were in a neat box together with the little keepsakes which had come as birthday and christmas offerings send them to him with this thought in view she brought out the box and began to look over its contents how amused her mother had been away back in their childhood 
when she had assured her that she was going to keep every note of Ralph's. Her cheeks burned over the memory of the words she had spoken in her babyhood. Mama, when I am an old woman, and Ralph is an old man, won't it be funny, Mama, for us to be old? Then we shall like to sit together and look over these letters, won't we? Here is one that tells about our first birthday party we had together. Isn't it nice that our birthdays are only a week apart, and we can always celebrate them together? And here is one about our picnic that we got up. How funny it will be, when our hairs are white, to read them over and remember all the nice times we had. In the solitude of her own room, she felt the hot blood mounting to her temples over these memories as they came surging back upon her. Then her face began to pale, and her heart to tremble over the thought that their future, hers and Ralph's, sitting together reading letters, would never come. Instead, Ralph would sit in that large armchair she had imagined, with his white head leaning against the cushions, and Estelle beside him, talking over together the plans that they two had formed, and Marjorie would be left out and forgotten. Finally she decided that the letters and the keepsakes should not be returned. That would look as though she had made serious business of them, and Ralph Bramlett was never to know that she had made serious business of anything that he had ever said to her. That should be her role for the future. Boy and girl friends she and Ralph had been, nothing more. Both had grown up now. It was time to put childish things away. Both had put them away. That was all. Never mind if her heart broke in the process. No one should know it. Even her mother must never imagine that she had suffered in putting away her childhood dream. Boy and girl friendship, the mother had called it, and that it must remain to her. Poor, foolish child! Little did she understand what a mother's eyes and heart can read. That good woman, with her head resting on her pillow, was fully as wakeful as her daughter, and her thoughts were quite as busy and anxious. Could she have known what decision that daughter had reached, she might almost have gone peacefully to sleep. What she feared was the renewal of old friendship upon a new basis, a basis which both the young people would understand as having to do with a settled future. Not that she believed it possible that Marjorie Edmonds would ever submit to becoming the wife of a man employed in a distillery, her temperance principles were too ingrained for that. The danger was that Marjorie's stronger will would assert itself, and that Ralph would speedily find some way out of the business engagement which he had made, and that all differences would be smoothed over. And then this woman also took a journey into the past, and remembered how amused she had been over Ralph and Marjorie in their childish devotedness to each other, how she had laughed with her neighbors over the friendship how she had petted the two almost equally through their period of early youth, and only lately had begun to be anxious over the natural results of such bringing up. If she had it to live over again, this life, how differently she would order all things. Then she moralized a little. What a pity it was that people could not go back over their lives just once, after their eyes had been opened to their mistakes what different experiences they could make possible. So, for these various reasons, it was quite the beginning of a new day before sleep came to the Edmonds's home. Notwithstanding Marjorie's resolve that her mother should know nothing about the changed condition of things, before evening of the next day she had shown her Ralph Bramlett's note. Whatever Mrs. Edmonds's mistakes as a mother may have been, she had succeeded in establishing and maintaining the most perfect intimacy between her daughter and herself, and for Marjorie to hide from view such a letter as that was to act in direct contradiction to the principles in which she had been reared. Her first intention had been to say to her mother that her letter had been answered, and that the answer was not satisfactory, and keep the details of that answer to herself but before evening she had decided that this would be treating her mother with injustice and discourtesy. So she gave her the letter without comment, and waited in silence while it was being read. 
it was so different from the letter which mrs edmonds had schooled her heart to expect and astonished her so that for some moments she was entirely silent feeling unable to decide how to meet such a revelation at last she asked almost timidly what do you make of this daughter the daughter had expected a burst of indignation which in attempting to overcome would almost oblige her to take ralph's part it was harder to meet this quiet question there seems to be but one explanation possible she said at last ralph is very tired of our friendship and has taken this way of bringing it to an end he takes an unnecessarily troublesome and disagreeable way then said mrs edmonds waxing indignant over the realization of what such an admission as this must mean to her daughter yet despite the indignation there was an undertone of intense joy what a merciful interposition of providence it would seem if ralph would with his own rash hand break the ties which had bound him to her child break them so utterly that there need be no fear of their ever being fastened again it meant present suffering for marjorie of course that was part of the penalty which she the mother must bear for her folly but that the suffering could be very deep or very lasting the mother did not believe she was an older student of human nature than her daughter and she was unalterably sure that ralph bramlett would never have satisfied that daughter's maturer heart still she could afford to be indignant with ralph for his way of managing i thought she added seeing that marjorie kept silent that he could as a rule be gentlemanly but he seems to have lost every semblance of a gentleman i admire your self-control marjorie in being able to be so quiet over such a letter as that in reply to the extremely kind one which you wrote to him yet i cannot but be glad that you have received it do you not see dear how different his character is from that which you have imagined it what i have for some time been aware of must be beginning to be plain to you nothing is plain to me said marjorie save that the old friendship is broken i have not understood ralph that is all i supposed that his conduct of late was simply the result of a passing vexation instead of which he is evidently tired of me yet after all i presume i have brought this upon myself it certainly was very rude and disagreeable in me to march away alone in the middle of the night and not only give them all such a fright but expose him to the ridicule that he must have had to bear ever since for my sake i did not think for a moment of his side of the question or i would not have done it it was only you mamma that i thought about and planned for but the whole thing exposed him to unnecessary and disagreeable experiences such as i did not in the least realize until i heard estelle go on about it perhaps it is not strange that he has decided that my friendship is not worth having she was blaming herself altogether the next thing would be a humble apology to ralph and a meek acceptance of perhaps even the distillery the mother could not endure it marjorie she said after a moment's silence and the change in her voice made the daughter feel that something very serious must be coming do you not think that that is a very childish way of looking at the whole matter too childish for one of your years a mere difference of opinion between two persons leading each to choose his or her own way of managing a matter while it may be unpleasant has no very lasting results with sensible people if ralph bramlett really valued your friendship at any time and was worthy of it he would not have broken with you on such slight provocation would he i told you mamma said marjorie trying not to make her voice tremble that i thought he had grown tired of me and took this way of making it known and i think nothing of the kind said mrs edmonds her indignation rising uncontrollably what i think and believe is that he is a conceited self-indulgent obstinate passionate boy 
who thinks to bring you to humiliating terms by holding aloof from you and nursing his ill temper until you realize how serious a matter a difference with him can be it was this in part which led him to accept a position which he knew would be utterly obnoxious not only to you but to your mother he expects you to write him in reply to this a heart-breaking letter assuring him of your undying friendship and your willingness to continue the friendship even though he become a rumseller do you really think marjorie that a young man capable of acting as he has and with the motives which have evidently actuated him is worthy of your friendship for your mother's sake my dear if not for your own i hope you will break with him utterly now let him understand distinctly that he cannot play revengefully with a girl of your character she was saying a great deal more than she had meant to when she began she was conscious that she was overdoing the matter doing mischief perhaps for her own cause yet she seemed unable to resist this temptation to express herself freely for once with regard to ralph bramlett's character but marjorie took it all quietly enough perhaps because she did not believe a word of it but thought that her mother was misjudging ralph with almost every sentence she did not feel revengeful herself only humble and sorrowful ralph was disappointed in her and had cast her aside that she believed was the plain fact it was bitter enough but she did not want any one to know it if it would comfort her mother to feel that he had not cast her off but was waiting and hoping to hear from her again she might get what relief she could out of the thought it brought none to marjorie mrs edmund's outburst had one unfortunate effect there was less sympathy between mother and daughter than ever before each retired to her room that night with a sense of loneliness such as never had come to them since they had been lonely together End of chapter 14Chapter 15 of Making Fate by Pansy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 15 A Surprising Decision. Glyde Douglas was at home again, with her wonderful story to tell and her wonderful gifts to display. She had not spent that two dollars after all. Uncle Anthony had counseled her to keep it forever as a souvenir, as a curiosity to prove that one girl could spend two weeks in new york and come home again with money in her pocket the gifts he had bought he assured her were her own tokens to be presented by herself to this end he had carefully boxed and marked each individual article with her full name and he got into such a hurry at last that he waited only to see her safely off the cars at her own station then sprang back again and continued his journey westward truth to tell he had overstayed the extreme limit of his time in order to give glyde as much of an outing as possible his visit he told her could afford to wait until next year never had a homecoming in the douglas family made more of a stir during the days of her absence it had been discovered that glyde was really an important person every member of the family had been so accustomed to having her to appeal to for assistance on all possible occasions that to miss her presence and help was a revelation not one of them had realized before how helpful she was they welcomed the old glide with open arms but the girl who came back to them was in a certain sense a new glide a day or two after her return estelle found herself looking at her sister curiously certainly she was changed an indefinable something was there which estelle at least had never before discovered was it self-assertion but glyde had never been sweeter or more unselfish it could not be her dress entirely though there was change enough about that uncle anthony had not contented himself with the stylish sack before the first sabbath which they spent in new york had arrived he had discovered a ready-made dress which was exactly to his mind and which he said matched the sack despite glyde's earnest protests and explanations he forced her to try it on 
and to admit that the fit was perfect. Then he ordered it sent to their hotel in triumph. After that there were gloves and handkerchiefs and a cunning little muff, things which he continually explained belonged to the sack and felt lonesome away from it. There was a hat, with a plume which was exactly the shade of the muff. In short, Uncle Anthony could not be restrained until his little girl's wardrobe had undergone entire transformation. When she was attired in her new suit, with the fifteen-dollar pin fastening the bit of lace at her throat, the reflection which the girl's mirror gave back must certainly have pleased her artistic eye. Yet, strangely enough, at that moment she thought of the girl in the coarse dress and gloveless hands who had told in the meeting about being kept from the temptation to anger. Why should Glyde Douglas have so much, and that girl so little? She said something of the sort to her uncle, but he turned it aside with one of his gay replies. I have nothing whatever to do with that girl, and much with this one for once in my life i mean to have the pleasure of seeing her dressed according to my fancy even though some girl whom i never saw goes without new shoestrings in consequence but this thought and many others which were new to her lingered with glyde after her homecoming especially did the influence of that prayer meeting and the talk she had had with paul burwell linger they had to do with the subtle difference in her which every member of her family noticed. She was alone one evening in the little room which opened from the parlor, and which was dignified by the name of Music Room. In the parlor was Ralph Bramlett, waiting for Estelle, who was to accompany him to a lecture. Glyde was busy with the music, assorting, rearranging, trying to bring order out of the confusion which was always to be found about the piano after a stormy day, during which the girls amused themselves more with music than at other times. As she worked, she hummed a familiar tune that lingered pleasantly in her thoughts. It was the one which was being sung when she and her uncle entered that large, plain room, every corner of which was photographed on her memory. She was not conscious that she was humming, until the curtains suddenly parted, and Ralph appeared. "'You are singing a favorite tune of mine,' he said. "'You couldn't guess where I last heard it.' "'I know where I did,' said Glyde, "'and I should think I might be able to trace your association with it. You have heard it often in our own church. It is one of Marjorie's favorites, you know. She uses it sometimes as a solo. I know, but I heard it last in New York, as I passed a church, I suppose it was, though it didn't look like one. It was not being sung as a solo. A great many people were singing, I should judge. It sounded very well indeed. I was almost tempted inside to get nearer to it said glyde why that is a strange coincidence the last time i heard it was in new york and i was inside of a large plain building which was a church or at least a hall where they hold church services and a great many people were singing what if it should have been the same evening when was it ralph we were in new york at the same time you know she proceeded to give him a careful statement as to date and surroundings then our associations with it must be the same in a way, said Ralph. It was on that very evening, and in just that locality, that I halted at the door, half tempted to spend what I supposed then would be the only evening I had for New York, in a religious meeting, in order for a nearer approach to an old tune. He laughed as he spoke, as though the idea must be an absurd one to glide. She regarded him wistfully. Oh, Ralph, I wish so much you had come in. I am sure you never attended such a meeting as that was, and perhaps it would have done even more for you than for... She broke off abruptly, not inclined to be confidential with Ralph Bramlett as to what the meeting had done for her. After a moment she began again, still with that wistful look on her face. Ralph, do you know that I cannot help wishing very much that you were a Christian? She could not keep her voice from trembling as she spoke. Even so simple a demonstration as this was a startling departure from her habit of life. 
it was a development from that statement which she had made to mr burwell to the effect that life would be different with her after this ralph laughed in a slightly embarrassed way this was new to him also and was almost as much of a surprise as though a kitten had suddenly appealed to him in human speech why in the world should you wish that he asked more because a reply of some sort seemed to be necessary than because he needed to have such a wish explained. "'Why shouldn't I?' she asked. "'And why shouldn't you, above everything else? Isn't it strange how we go on living, just as busy as we can be, day after day and year after year, with the less important things, the most important ones not being so much as thought of, apparently? It has always seemed strange to me.' before i was a christian at all i used to think people acted very foolishly about such matters yet after all when i became a christian myself i acted just like most others but i don't want to and i don't mean to any more i do wish very much indeed that you were a christian man i thought of you first because well i knew you better than i do most young men at that meeting to which you didn't go ralph there were ever so many young men and they all took part in the meeting spoke as witnesses for christ it did seem so grand and so reasonable too it seems to me we ought to expect young men almost more than young women because one would think they would be drawn to jesus christ in a peculiar manner and want him for their friend of course you think about such things sometimes ralph how is it that you do not choose jesus christ for your intimate friend this point-blank question coming from a child as glyde douglas had always seemed to him astonished and all but confused the young man she was looking steadily at him out of bright earnest eyes and seemed to expect a definite answer which he did not know how to make it happened that this was the first direct question of the kind which had come to him since childhood. Still, of course, there was no way but to make an evasive response. "'How do you know I ever think of such abstruse matters?' he asked, trying to speak lightly, and in the tone which he might use to a very young person. "'Because,' she said gravely, "'you have not seemed to me like an entirely frivolous person.' and i cannot think that any save the utterly thoughtless leave such questions out of their minds entirely if i am in the least acquainted with you i should think you would be the kind of man who would want jesus for a friend do you not admire his character it grows upon one so as one studies it the only character the world has ever known which did not in the least little way disappoint one I should think a young man would have, oh, almost a consuming ambition to grow like him. That is what I want for myself, to take him for my model, and try every day to have something about me which will remind others of him. That is a pretty strange ambition for a young girl, said Ralph, still bent upon treating the whole matter lightly, and still speaking in that half-condescending tone which some people use to those very much younger than themselves she took his words with utmost seriousness yes i know it is but not an impossible one that is what seems so very wonderful about it all it is one of the things he came especially to do for us you know that we might be conformed to his image that is the verse i have taken for my motto and daily reminder to be conformed to his image is not that an ambition worth having you have studied his character in a historical way haven't you ralph it struck the young man as a humiliating thing to have to answer this question in the negative he made his answer as careless as possible i cannot say that i ever have at least not what you would call study perhaps though of course i am more or less familiar with the story as it is set down for us as he spoke he was conscious of a feeling of relief in the thought that he need not undergo a cross-examination with regard to even this superficial knowledge still with the relief there was a sense of humiliation it was as glyde intimated somewhat surprising that a man who prided himself upon his common sense and thoughtfulness 
should have to confess ignorance of a character so easily studied and so universally acknowledged as this one if he could pose as an infidel or an unbeliever in the bible in any sense of the word it would perhaps be different though even then he admitted that an honest unbeliever ought to be familiar with the evidences before he rejected them but believing fully as he did in such tremendous truths as those which circled around jesus christ it was certainly humiliating to have to admit that he had lived all these years without making a careful study of them there were movements overhead which indicated that estelle might soon be with them and glyde made haste to finish what she wanted to say but ralph that doesn't seem like your usual good sense does it i wish so very much that both you and marjorie could be led to study this question with the care which its importance deserves there could be but one result for you are both so sensible and marjorie is the sweetest girl in the world there needs only one added touch to make her life perfect she would be interested in it if you were it seems perfectly natural to think of you and she studying things together won't you promise to think about it his reply was very disappointing you are a good little girl he said graciously a great deal better than most of your friends it seems to me i feel especially honored in being the one you have selected to present these new ideas to they are rather new are they not ah but that isn't promising anything she said earnestly no i am rather afraid of promises they mean altogether too much to me being a man of my word you see i have to look out for them i promise to be very glad that i have such a good little friend as you to interest yourself in me and i have no doubt we should all be improved if we thought more about such matters than we do then estelle came down and he turned back to the parlor to meet her leaving glyde with a sadly disappointed heart ralph bramlett would never know what force of will it had taken to overcome her usual reserve and speak to him out of her deeper feeling and to realize that it had been for naught was bitter however ralph bramlett was not so entirely indifferent to the whole matter as he had professed the simple yet evidently earnest words which had been spoken to him on an unusual subject lingered with him he let estelle chatter as they walked down the street together and went over the conversation sentence by sentence it was a curious thing for a child to do he told himself some new influence must have touched her perhaps she had fallen in with a different class of friends from those he had met in new york suppose he had gone into that prayer meeting would he have met a different class of persons and been influenced by them actually he speculated over the thought and was curious about it then he recalled the promise for which he had been asked and smiled indulgently over the idea of his promising that child anything yet it was certainly very pretty in her to ask it and eminently sensible she had linked his name with marjorie's as a matter of course and that had been soothing it is true he had not so much as exchanged bows with marjorie during the weeks he had now been in the employ of snyder snyder and co but he looked every day for a change in that direction each evening on reaching home he went eagerly over his mail and questioned closely with regard to any messages that might have been brought for him his belief was that if he gave marjorie time enough she would write in reply to his note asking why he had absented himself so persistently and reminded him once more that he had friends on maple avenue such a note as he had planned that she should write him he had decided would be a sufficient balm to his wounded feelings to admit of his calling and talking over with her the entire matter after that he determined that their friendship should be re-established upon an entirely different basis by this time marjorie would have learned that she must not undertake to control him in any way that he was master as a man should be and that her duty as a woman was to yield at all times to his superior judgment 
thus much mischief her last note to him had wrought it had removed from his mind any shadow of fear as to the final result of the difference between them a girl who could after his weeks of absence and silence write to him in the extremely kind way that she had must think a very great deal of him indeed quite as much as he thought of her it was only a matter of time for him to re-establish himself in the edmonds family or rather to settle himself as an assured force there for he believed that marjorie had quite as much influence over her mother as he had over her he must simply be patient and bide his time then all would be well between them much better than it ever had been for the more he thought about it the more he was convinced that marjorie had been too willing to direct and too sure that he would follow her lead meantime while he was waiting it would do no harm to cultivate the friendship of estelle douglas she evidently enjoyed his society and it would not injure his cause with marjorie for her to learn that he was not cut off from friendly companionship because she had chosen to break with him you will observe that he had given up any idea that he was to blame in all this matter on the contrary he had begun to congratulate himself on his good judgment in not exposing a company of young people to a long ride in the night air when it could as well be taken by daylight in short ralph bramlett was completely reinstated in his good opinion of himself and it cannot be denied that marjorie's note had done much toward bringing him to his habitual frame of mind once more it was because he felt complacent that glyde's appeal had interested him it appealed he told himself to his common sense and while it may be a surprise to some it is nevertheless the fact that this young man prided himself upon his common sense now that he thought of it he admitted that it really was quite strange that a young man of his stamp should not have given serious attention to such subjects glyde had spoken of him as one who she thought would like to become friends with jesus christ the thought did not fill him with awe but with a sense of eminent fitness what more reasonable than to suppose that the lord jesus christ would be pleased with his acquaintance oh he did not put it quite so baldly as that but the thought analyzed suggested almost condescension upon his part he began seriously to consider whether some such step would not be the proper one to take next certainly it would sound very well indeed to have it said that ralph bramlett who was supposed by some to have taken a step downward on account of the clerkship which he had accepted had become deeply interested in religious matters had in fact taken a decided stand this would astonish and perhaps not a little discomfit some people it would serve to show that the business relations which he had formed instead of proving his ruin had led him to a serious consideration of the most important business not only a consideration but a decision why should he not decide at once to unite with the church his character was undoubtedly beyond reproach he lived as entirely a christian life to all appearance now as did those of his acquaintance who were church members it is true that christian people read the bible he supposed with a certain degree of regularity and this he had not been in the habit of doing but it was entirely proper and he had no objections whatever to doing so moreover they prayed with more or less frequency and that too seemed to him a most suitable thing to do when he was a little fellow he used to pray quite regularly it was probably owing to his unfortunate environment that he had ever given up the habit so far as the weekly prayer meeting was concerned he reflected with satisfaction that he knew many eminently respectable church members who evidently did not find it consistent with their other duties to attend at least with any degree of regularity of course he could go occasionally he thought he should quite like to do so in short while estelle douglas was giving an elaborate description of a fancy dress entertainment of which she had heard and explaining volubly how they might adapt it to their needs so as to make a sum of money for benevolent or missionary purposes 
her companion was deliberately deciding to become forthwith interested in the subject of religion and to unite himself without much more delay with the visible church this plan besides appealing to his common sense seemed to him a delicious piece of diplomacy to show mrs edmonds and her set how utterly they were mistaken in him was ralph bramlett then a hypocrite not in the slightest degree he was simply a self-deceived young man who knew no more about the real claims of jesus christ or of his power over the heart and conscience than did the veriest child he honestly believed that for a moral upright young man like himself the one step needed in order for him to identify himself fully with all the religious movements of the day was to unite with the church and adopt the forms of service which church people used it seemed to him as glyde had said a surprising thing that he had not taken this step before he told himself that if he had thought about it seriously he undoubtedly would have done so and that he had not thought about it was owing to the fact that he was surrounded by a class of people who gave little heed to such things and had made no attempt to press their claims upon him so after all the delay was their fault not his end of chapter fifteen Chapter Sixteen of Making Fate by Pansy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Sixteen As Others See Us. Oh, what some power the gifty gee us to see ourselves as either see us. Notwithstanding the injury which his companions had done to this estimable young man by not urging him to the important step which he now contemplated he could not seriously regret the delay for he told himself that he could not have had a more opportune time than the present he by no means used in thinking it over the words which would have honestly described his desire which was to create a sensation instead he made use of a phrase which he had somewhere heard about letting his light shine it seemed an eminently appropriate idea he had light plenty of it why not let it shine he interrupted estelle's description with an apparently irrelevant remark your little sister glyde has developed in a new direction has she not of late oh yes said estelle wondering by what process of mental arithmetic he had added glyde to the theme which they were supposed to be considering the child really blossomed out when she went on her trip with uncle anthony I think I never knew a girl to change so much in so short a time. I can't define the change either. It eludes description, but it is perfectly palpable nevertheless. How does she exhibit it to you? I thought she seemed more seriously inclined than usual. Serious? Religiously, do you mean? Has she been talking to you? Estelle laughed as though this were a matter for amusement, and also one which demanded apology. Don't mind her, Ralph. It is something that will wear off. She fell in with a company of fanatics, I think, while she was away. Very queer people they must have been from the account she gives. She went to a meeting somewhere, down among the slums, I suppose, judging from the character of the people, and there she heard all sorts of queer ideas advanced she is at an impressionable age you know and the whole thing evidently made a deep impression we are very much surprised to see in what way new york life took hold of her it is the last experience we should have expected with uncle anthony for a companion he is eminently practical if glyde were not so young and so easily influenced i should feel quite worried about her for of all fanaticisms i think religious is the very worst do not you ralph shielded by the darkness curled his mustached lip very slightly he did not call glyde's words to him fanatical on the contrary he considered them not only sensible but reasonable he told himself that he had a much higher opinion of her religion than he had of estelle's then he assured himself that he must always have had a religious nature in order to have such matters impress him as they did 
perhaps he should really quite enjoy his change of base when he went to his room that evening he took down the bible which had been a gift of his sunday school teacher on his fifteenth birthday and which had been opened only at rare intervals since and looked at its pages with a certain degree of interest this was part of the new life which he had resolved to commence where should he read why not at the very beginning people who profess to use the bible daily should know it as a whole the thought of turning to the life of christ and making himself acquainted with the character which had so impressed glide occurred to him but was promptly dismissed he could not have told why he shrank from this he did not allow himself to realize that he did so he simply explained to himself that the new testament was for children and undeveloped young people like glide douglas every ordinarily educated person of his years was more or less familiar with it he remembered its stories perfectly he would take the very first chapter of the old testament in the beginning god created the heaven and the earth the majestic story spread itself before him calling upon a thoughtful man to take in its stupendous simplicity and depth but very little attention did this reader pay to the words over which his eyes were roving it is an actual fact that it had not deeply impressed itself upon him that it was important to give his entire mind to what he read his thoughts if they had been written out would have been something like this i wonder what that immaculate mrs edmonds would think could she know how i am occupied just at this time she believes that i have gone to the dogs because i have chosen to accept a salary which will help my father instead of hanging around all winter doing nothing waiting for something to come to me it is not the position which i should have chosen but it is the one evidently to which providence assigned me when he thought this he felt religious in the extreme and put away even from his memory all knowledge of the fact that his own obstinacy and carelessness had closed some doors which were apparently wide open the first chapter of genesis and the accompanying thoughts moved on together and god said let us make man in our image after our likeness and so far from this new business demoralizing me as i believe my lady edmunds hopes it will i am actually beginning a new life because of it i wonder if marjorie reads her bible every day such a saint as her mother must have brought her up to these habits i should think though to be sure marjorie has a mind of her own the views of most other people do not affect her i fancy i know one who can influence her when he really sets about it that little glide seemed to think that all marjorie needed to bring her out as a church member was for me to take the lead i shouldn't wonder if she were correct i think i shall unite with the church at once there is no use in waiting after one's mind is made up i believe the communion service in our church occurs on the first sunday in the year that is an interesting time at which to take a stand i should like to have marjorie join with me but that would be too soon for her perhaps and on the whole the effect may be better if i come out first and alone there might be some who would be foolish enough to think that i was influenced by her if we came together i think i will go alone if there are no others to join at that time so much the better as my example will be all the stronger the chapter finished and he ended it with the thought i hope some of those self-righteous persons who decided that because i tried to do the best i could for my family i was on the high road to perdition will have their eyes opened to see that there are thoughtful conscientious people in the world besides themselves he closed the bible and assumed the attitude of prayer when before had he been on his knees his mind went swiftly back to the time when his little sister dora lay dying and the minister asked them all to kneel while he prayed for her passing soul he had knelt with the rest but kept his eyes on his sister's face and had seen a strange light come into her eyes and a heavenly smile bathe her features as though the angels about whom she had talked had indeed come to get her as a matter of fact when the prayer was finished and they arose from their knees 
it was found that Dora had gone away. Ralph had thought then that he never should forget that look and the impressions which the entire scene left upon his heart, but he was barely sixteen at that time, and he had not thought of his little sister before for years. One sentence of the minister's prayer came back to him as he knelt, and wondered what it would be proper to say. Prepare us each for this solemn hour when it shall come to us. The thought of death had startled him then. It startled him now. He did not want to be prepared for that solemn hour. He wanted to live. He intended to live. To be a successful businessman. Yes, and a successful Christian. To be respected, admired. He had always been considered an estimable young man. It was quite time that he was also an example for others in this direction. He had no objection whatever, so that it did not interfere with his success in life. Oh, he did not let that idea halt before him, so he could look at it and see what it really meant. It simply floated through his mind. It will be noted that he had yet to learn that people who are prepared for the solemn hour of death are the only ones who are ready to live. But all this was not praying. The kneeling man began to feel a certain sense of awe at the thought that he was in the presence of the Lord and preparing to speak to him. What words would be appropriate? What did he want? If he had but realized that he did not want anything which it would be wise to bring before the Lord Jesus Christ, the thought might have helped him. Instead, he began to feel that he must be naturally of a very reverent disposition, since the idea of prayer filled him with such a sense of awe. At last he decided, and began in an appropriate tone, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And continued through to the majestic closing, For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Nothing, he assured himself, could be more proper than the Lord's own prayer, which he had himself taught his disciples. That ought to voice all the needs of the human soul, and it was as familiar to him as his own name. Alas for Ralph! The green parrot on its perch in the minister's study could have recited the words nearly as well as he, and would have had almost as full a sense of their deep spiritual meaning. Thy kingdom come! How little this young man cared for the Lord's kingdom! If his prayer had been answered then and there, and the kingdom had been set up on the earth, hardly anything could have interfered more entirely with his plans and hopes. How very far he was from desiring to do the Lord's will! Whenever that will was pleasant, convenient, in a line with his own ideas and inclinations, why then, of course! But the moment the wills crossed, it must be Ralph Bramlett's which was to have the ascendancy. This was not only his wish, but his intention, although he had never put it into words. More is the pity, if we would occasionally put our passing thoughts into bold words and study their spirit, they might teach us to know ourselves. Ralph Bramlett did not in the least understand that such was his trend of thought. On the whole, he arose from his knees quite satisfied with himself. He had begun the new life, he had read the Bible, he had prayed. He had declined to give any promise to Glyde concerning these matters, and had not, when he left her, intended to give them a second thought. So it was no weak girl's influence which had brought him to a decision. It was his own superior judgment and will. This recollection gave him great pleasure. Meantime, Mr. Maxwell's acquaintance with the Edmonds family had made rapid progress, not apparently because of the planning of any of them, but by natural sequence. On the first evening following their walk together, when he and Marjorie met in the hall, it was, of course, entirely the proper thing to do to ask particularly after her welfare and as to whether the unusual exposure on the evening before had worked ill in any way. Of course, for Marjorie to have assumed the air of a stranger, after his extreme friendliness and kindness, would have been ridiculous. So they presently found themselves chatting together as friends of some standing. 
Mr. Maxwell had a book in his hand, and explained to Marjorie that he had found a description of her glen, or else there was a remarkable degree of similarity between two choice portions of the world, and he challenged her to listen while he read. This roused a discussion with regard to that glen, and some others, and led to a talk concerning that particular author, and other authors, and books in general, so that, when Mr. Maxwell, who had been invited to take a seat while he was reading his extract, arose to go, it came to pass that it was quite an hour later than when he stopped in the hall for kindly inquiries. He apologized for his intrusion, and Mrs. Edmonds met him cordially. "'Don't apologize, I beg. We have enjoyed the hour. Marjorie and I are often quite alone here at this time of day. It is pleasant to have company. And to talk with a third person about the books we have been reading is a refreshment to me. I come in contact with so few people in these days who seem to read books at all, at least any that I care for. As she spoke, her daughter regarded her with a sort of tender surprise. Had her mother, then, been often lonely? They had lived such a preoccupied and entirely satisfactory life together, she and Ralph, that the mother had perhaps been sometimes almost forgotten. Oh, they had read many books together, she and her mother. Their winter afternoons were almost certain to be spent in this way but when Ralph came, the books had been laid aside as a matter of course, and conversation and music had taken their place with her. Not with her mother, she was obliged to admit. Mrs. Edmonds did not sing, and Marjorie realized that their habits of late, hers and Ralph's, had been to go, early in the evening, to the piano, to turn over the music, and sing snatches of favorite songs, conversing together between times, generally in low tones, so as not to disturb the reading which was being carried on at the further end of the room. Her mother always had beside her a book which was supposed to occupy her quiet moments. It really had not occurred to Marjorie until now, that possibly at those times she felt alone. It was perhaps because she was grieved and penitent over this new idea, that she accepted with such cordiality Mr. Maxwell's next kind offer of friendship. They had been speaking about a new book, one which was creating a sensation in the literary world. In the course of the next two or three days, Mr. Maxwell announced that he had secured a copy of the book, and that if it would be entirely agreeable, he would like to read aloud from it on leisure evenings while they worked he confessed frankly that he had grown very weary of reading alone, was, in fact, hungering and thirsting for an audience. This was while Ralph Bramlett was still in New York, so Marjorie's evenings were entirely at her disposal. She hailed the proposition with gratitude even on her own account. She had so many things to think about, with which she began to have an instinctive feeling that her mother was not in sympathy, that she could not help thinking it would be a relief to seem to be occupied in listening to someone reading aloud, while at the same time she was at liberty to carry on her own train of thought. But Mr. Maxwell proved to be a delightful reader, and the book he had chosen was one calculated to fascinate a cultivated taste. By the time he was well into the story, she had determined to leave her individual thinking to more convenient hours, and give undivided attention to the book. They did not make very rapid progress with the story. It was surprising how many questions they had to stop to discuss, and how many arguments were carried on vigorously with regard to the writer's views, or style, or intentions. By degrees, the entire plot of the book, not only as it had already appeared, but as they fancied it would develop, was eagerly discussed, an improvement suggested, and, when a difference of opinion was expressed, each combatant argued with energy for his side. At first Marjorie meant to listen, allowing her mother and Mr. Maxwell to do the arguing, but this was by no means so easy a task as she had supposed. She found that her own ideas were pronounced, and would insist on being brought to the front. 
she found also that mr maxwell's ideas often differed from hers and that an argument between them could be spirited with a keen play of wit on either side and yet could be thoroughly enjoyable very often during this war of ideas mrs edmonds of choice dropped a little into the background and indulged in her own thoughts which ran a little in this wise how is it possible that marjorie can enjoy such conversations with a thoroughly cultivated man and not feel how sharp is the contrast between him and ralph bramlett but there is no accounting for the obtuseness of some young women under certain circumstances during those days marjorie's loyal heart drew no pictures illustrating the difference between the two gentlemen she enjoyed mr maxwell she was ready to heartily agree with her mother that he was refined and scholarly and that the hours of reading he had given them were very pleasant not only but educational in the best sense and perhaps at the very moment her heart would be wondering how much longer ralph meant to wait before writing sometimes she would ask herself if it would be possible that she had so hurt him by her manner that afternoon that he was really afraid to write at all if she could have been sure of that she would have written to him during those early days when ralph finally returned and the notes were exchanged and the real break came mr maxwell became marjorie's greatest stronghold he knew nothing of course of the fiery trial through which she was passing she could therefore sit quietly in his presence and seem to listen as before to his reading and live all the time her separate life of self-concentrated pain without tearing her mother's heartstrings by solitude so she hailed the advent of another book when the first was finished with such evident satisfaction as to deceive even her mother thus it came to pass that the readings became an almost nightly occurrence if the reader noticed that marjorie took little part in the discussions he made no sign but talked as well and with as keen a zest as before and in truth mrs edmonds was a woman whose ideas were well worthy of attention and respect what a curious revelation there would have been to these three if the secrets of hearts could have suddenly been laid bare before them something like this would have been the result for each with surprised eyes to read marjorie it is just a year ago to-night that we went to hartwell together and ralph gave me his photograph taken in that new way and he said marjorie let us have our photographs taken every year for each other until i am eighty after that i suppose we will not care for fresh ones i wonder if it is possible that he does not think of any of those old times oh i must not think of them any more i must not let poor mamma know that i am living in my past mrs edmonds my poor darling if her mother only dared to tell her how much she sympathizes with her every one of these evenings is an anniversary of something which now gives her pain if i could be sure that the pain would last and that i ought to give her up to him i would humiliate myself yes crucify myself for her sake and try to bring them together i am persuaded that it would take but a word from me he is simply sulking and cannot get the consent of his pride to make the first advance but oh surely it cannot be that i ought mr maxwell she is paler than usual to-night women with hearts must needs feel even though the object which calls out those feelings is made of the merest putty i must try to hold the mother's attention away from her to-night i see no other way to help her yet End of chapter 16chapter 17 of making fate by pansy this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 17 the best thing matters were in about this shape when glyde douglas came one afternoon to have a little visit with marjorie glyde was a favorite not only with marjorie but her mother mrs edmonds who was always watching without seeming to 
saw the brightening of her daughter's pale, quiet face as Glyde appeared, and pressed with earnestness her invitation to remain to tea, promising, if she would, to make a certain kind of muffins, of which the young people were especially fond. She was in the kitchen intent upon her hospitable task, and the two girls were alone in the pleasant back parlour. On the table lay the book which was being read aloud. Glyde picked it up and examined it with interest, from the fly-leaf where Mr. Maxwell's name was written in his own hand, to the few line illustrations scattered through it, stopping here and there to read a sentence as a word caught her eye. "'Is this nice?' she asked, using her pet word, which had to do duty for many unlike things. "'How interesting it looks, doesn't it? Are you reading it, Marjorie? You and your mother have good times together, reading books, don't you?' There was a wistful note in Glyde's voice. The home life in this bit of a home was like a glimpse of paradise to her. Some way the Douglas family had never been in the habit of having much home life. "'It is a very good thing, I believe,' Marjorie said indifferently. "'At least my mother likes it, and Mr. Maxwell considers it quite a masterpiece. It is unlike anything that I ever read. I have not decided what I think about it. It is a religious novel, Glyde. I never used to think that I could be made to care for religious novels.' "'Why not?' asked Glyde quickly, wondering if possibly her opportunity might be coming. There were words that she wanted to speak to Marjorie, if only she could discover just the right time. "'Do you mean that you thought you would not be interested in them because they had to do with religion?' "'No, not exactly that. But it has always seemed to me as though religion ought to have to do with true things, and as though fiction were not its realm.' true religion i mean there is a certain sham kind which i despise in life and in books ah but a story a good story is just a picture of real life i think said glyde eagerly and if that is so religion couldn't be left out marjorie for religion has to do with real life must have more or less whether we want it to or not why must it asked marjorie amused like Ralph Bramlett, she had always thought of Glyde as a little girl. She found herself wondering how much the child could talk about such matters. "'Why, because,' said Glyde, with great earnestness, "'life is intertwined with it. Not with religion, perhaps, either. I do not know that I can make myself clear. What I mean is that life has to do with the facts which underlie religion, and must have.' why all people sin and suffer and die you know marjorie i was going to say that all people loved but sometimes that does not seem so certain but the other three cannot be denied and religion the religion which i am talking about means a saviour from sin and right living and eternal life now how can these be ignored in any history of human life when one stops to think of it, one would suppose that such tremendous issues as these must have to do with all stories that are worth considering. "'What do you know about suffering?' asked Marjorie, with sudden gravity. She felt, poor girl, that she had drank the cup of trouble almost to its dregs. But what could this young creature understand as to the first syllable of its meaning? "'Not much, of course.' said Glyde, with sweet seriousness. In the light of other people's experiences, I have never had any trouble worthy of the name. Yet young girls have their troubles, Marjorie, and petty as they may seem to others, and to themselves afterwards, they are hard while they last. One of the wonders about Jesus Christ is that he seems able to sympathize with little, petty troubles as well as great ones." She was not accustomed to speaking of him thus familiarly. The effort to do so made her face flush and her voice tremble a little. Marjorie regarded her curiously, and recognized the subtle change which had been so noticeable to the Douglas family. "'You are growing into a woman, Glyde,' she said. "'I used to think you were only a little girl. Oh, yes, girls have their troubles.' I remember that mine used to seem very large. 
she spoke as though her own girlhood were a state which had been put far into the past. "'So you have gotten where you like religious books?' she added, still regarding Glyde with the air of one who was trying to understand some new development. "'You would enjoy this one, then. It is a pity you could not hear it read. Mr. Maxwell is an excellent reader, and is so entirely in sympathy with the chief character in the story that he reads as though he were telling his own experience. "'Is Mr. Maxwell a Christian?' There was no mistaking the eagerness in the girl's tone, nor the interested light which suddenly flashed in her eyes. Marjorie could not repress a slight laugh. "'Is there anything so very wonderful about that, Glyde?' she asked. "'Your eyes shine like the stars. Yes, I suppose he is a Christian. In fact, I know he is. One of the very marked kind. He puts his religion first, I fancy.' Does that awaken your curiosity to how he sees it? It rests me, said Glyde with energy. Did you ever think, Marjorie, how very few Christian young men we have? Almost none, indeed. There are only three or four in our large church, and they are absent from home most of the time. And when they are here, well, they are not the kind of Christians I am talking about. But there are so very few. Isn't it strange? So many girls are church members, and most of the boys seem not to have so much as thought of such things. "'How many of the girls have really thought of such things?' asked Marjorie, cynically. "'Do you not suppose that most of them joined the church because others did, or because it seemed the proper thing to be done next, or somebody that they wanted to please urged them to do so?' "'I don't know,' said Glyde sorrowfully. I would not like to say so. One would not like to call in question the motives of others. I think we have acted very much that way, all of us perhaps. I have, I know. But, oh, Marjorie, I don't want to. I didn't join the church simply because others did. I joined because I meant it from my soul. But I haven't lived so, I know. I have lived as though religion was a very secondary matter indeed to me. I want to be different and I want others to be different. I wish I knew how to reach and help somebody. I would like to know this Mr. Maxwell if he is the kind of Christian you think. They are so helpful, such people. I met one or two in New York. I had only a few minutes' conversation with them, but I cannot tell you how much they helped me. Glyde made not the slightest attempt to analyze the feeling which led her to use the plural pronoun in speaking of her interview with Mr. Burwell. But now she had embarrassed her audience. Marjorie had not had the least expectation of awakening so humble a confession. Heretofore, her sarcastic criticisms in these directions had called forth only indignant protests, or the good-natured reminder that she was talking about something of which she knew nothing. Glyde's tremulous voice and humble words were of another world than any which Marjorie knew. She had no reply ready, and was meditating a change of subject, to muffins or some other safe commonplace, when Glyde began again. "'I'll tell you what I wish, Marjorie. It isn't a new idea.' I have thought about it a great deal all this week. I wish with all my soul that you were such a Christian as you could be, and as I think you surely would be if you gave your heart to Christ's guidance. You could help us all so much. You know you have influence among those who need helping in this very direction. They are used to following your lead, and are glad to do so. You could almost certainly lead them toward Christ." Oh, dear Marjorie, won't you think about this matter seriously? It seems to me I have thought of little else since the idea first came to me. Every time I have prayed, I have asked the Lord to let me speak some word which might possibly influence you. Not that I wanted to be the one to do it. I was willing that anybody should do it, if you would only listen and take hold of the matter with the energy which you give to other things." Marjorie's embarrassment deepened. She was as unaccustomed to direct personal appeals upon this subject as Glyde was to leading in a religious conversation. She was deeply moved, too, for almost the first time in her life. 
as she watched Glyde's expressive face and thought of what she had known of her heretofore, she told herself that here was a genuine experience. Glyde knew what she was talking about and meant what she said. And behold, she was appealing to her, Marjorie Edmonds, for help in a direction of which she knew nothing. Glyde waited for her answer. It was evident that she expected one, and Marjorie did not know how to frame it. "'You dear little girl,' she said at last, bending over and kissing the flushed cheek. "'I did not mean you when I made my sweeping, and, I presume, ill-natured remarks about a certain class of church members. I believe in you, and in a few other people. But about myself, as for my helping others, you are woefully mistaken in me. My influence is a mere name. The girls do not really follow my lead in any matter of importance, and never did. It is well, perhaps, that it is so, for no one could be farther away from leading them in the right direction than I am and I never felt my influence over others less, or felt less inclined to exert any influence than at this time. I do not want any one to follow me, I am sure. I am too far from being satisfied with the road I am travelling to desire any person to take it with me. But, Marjorie, what I want is to have you follow Christ, and follow him so closely, that the rest of us who are not so strong as you will be led to follow in your way. It isn't all a name, Marjorie, just joining the church and nothing more. Believe me, there is a reality in it, and a help such as nothing else can afford. If you really are dissatisfied with yourself, I am sure you will find it the very thing you need." but I confess frankly that I was not thinking so much of your needs as of those of others. You seem so self-reliant always that I cannot realize your needs as well as I can our own. It is the same with Ralph. I was saying something of this kind to him the other night. If you and he, I told him, were only Christians, such Christians as you could be, it seems to me that you could take all our circle for Christ this winter." surely that would be an ambition worth living for she coupled their names as a matter of course this young girl who was really thinking of more important matters than a possible coldness between the two had forgotten if she had ever heard shrewd surmises of trouble between them no one save the parties immediately concerned knew of a certainty that such was the case it happened that this season, usually so gay, was one of marked quiet in their circle, owing to the fact that there was illness of a more or less serious character in the families of two of their number, and also because several of the young people, prominent in their set, were away for the holidays. Moreover, Ralph Bramlett had not found his new position the mere sinecure that the commercial traveller had almost led him to expect there was plenty of work to be done, and some of it of such a character as to require over hours, and much puzzling to straighten out. It came to pass that more often than otherwise, instead of coming home on the six or even the five o'clock express, as his employers so often did, he was likely to have to wait for the seven-thirty accommodation, and, cold, tired, and cross, make his way out to the Bramlett farm, supperless, some time after the hour when the evening entertainments generally commenced. Those who knew these facts, and knew no others, saw abundant reason why both Ralph and Marjorie were absent from the few entertainments which the more courageous planned at this time. Even Estelle Douglas was not sure that Ralph had not called upon Marjorie a number of times during the past weeks. It was impossible for Marjorie not to change color under the sound of the familiar words which she had not heard for so long, and which were once of almost hourly repeatal, you and Ralph. She looked at Glyde closely, with a shade of suspicion. Had she grown into a shrewd young woman, and was she trying in this way to win confidences which were not intended for her? No, Glyde's face was pure, and her glance free and sweet to act a part however small would be foreign to her nature her whole heart was evidently absorbed in matters far removed from such as those 
what did he say marjorie asked under the power of the thought that she must say something and feeling too that it would be a comfort to hear from ralph even at second hand oh not much he is skilful at evasion you know when he wishes to be i had very little time to talk with him it was the night of the stoddard lecture he came for estelle i suppose because he knew you were not at home and it was only while we were waiting for her to come that i had any chance marjorie gave a little start he had taken estelle to the lecture then she had not heard of this before she had been in town that day on a shopping excursion had chosen that particular day indeed because of the lecture and the thought that for almost the first time in years when a lecture of importance was to be given ralph would not ask her to enjoy it with him she had not been able to decide to accept mr maxwell's invitation to her mother and herself to keep him company so she had persuaded that watchful mother that no other day would do for their important shopping in town she had been tardy with her shopping and they had come out in the accommodation marjorie told herself it was because they had been necessarily delayed but in her heart she knew that a central reason for it was because she had heard that ralph often took that train he did not take it that evening though she watched furtively every muffled traveller until the train was well out of the station she thought of him as possibly detained for a still later train for some reason it had not occurred to her that he would be at the lecture with estelle douglas by his side i do not think ralph is interested continued glyde humbly i do not suppose my words to him did any good i have thought since that perhaps they even did harm but how easily you could influence him he is always so ready to join you in any way how can you bear not to use your power he needs to be influenced now i think more than ever before by this time the muffins were ready and there came a summons to tea much to marjorie's relief she felt that she could not have borne another word to the surprise of the girls mr maxwell made a fourth at the table your mother tempted me he explained gaily to marjorie she was taking up the muffins just as i brought the mail of course i could not resist the temptation to say that they looked like my mother's what son could and she was cruel enough to consider it a hint that i wanted some of them though i give you my word of honor that no such thought was in my mind he was a delightful addition to the family party glyde who was at first inclined to be half afraid of him frankly admitted this when the tea was over at all times a good talker he exerted himself on this occasion apparently to entertain them all in his heart was a desire to relieve marjorie from the burden of talking she looked so wan and worn that he could not help feeling a great pity for her one significant question he asked glyde at least it became significant because of her answer it was your first visit to new york i believe what was the best thing you brought away from there the question was awakened by a passing curiosity to know how this young creature rated life what would she regard as a best thing her quiet serious answer took him by surprise a fuller knowledge of the lord jesus christ i knew him before but not in the way in which i met him there nor as i have realized his presence since then you brought away the best knowledge that life has he said heartily it is not possible to improve upon that except in degree though you should live a hundred years but what a place in which to find such a pearl mrs edmonds does not such testimony go far toward redeeming the reputation of new york who is it that says we find what we are looking for it was found to be a not difficult task to persuade glyde to remain for the evening reading she confessed her hearty desire to do so and explained that she had looked forward to an evening alone for the girls were going out and as father was not well mother would be likely to spend her evening in his room ministering to him no in answer to mrs edmund's careful inquiry 
they would not be troubled by her late coming. She had prepared them for that by saying that she would perhaps stop at Auntie Bennett's for the evening. Auntie Bennett was their next-door neighbor. They presently settled themselves for an hour of enjoyment. Marjorie brought out her work, and Glyde established herself in a corner of the sofa beside her with a view to helping, and the reading began. One-third of the book had already been read aloud, but Mr. Maxwell showed himself to be an excellent synoptist, and Glyde was a good questioner, so she presently had a very fair idea of the opening chapters, and was prepared to listen to a somewhat elaborate description of some New Year's calls. "'They had a better time with New Year's calls than I do,' she announced, in one of the pauses for conversation which made these readings so delightful. "'I always dread New Year's Day.' "'Are calls from your friends particularly disagreeable to you on that day?' mr maxwell asked oh i do not receive not formally i have almost no gentlemen friends my sisters nearly always receive with some of their particular friends and the callers we have are some of my father's business acquaintances who keep up the formality more for old time's sake than because they particularly enjoy it i think men call whom my father rarely sees at any other time and does not particularly care to see i fancy but they sit and talk ever so long and drink coffee which i have to serve and even smoke some of them i have to be in attendance all the time to wait on them the most of them pay not the slightest attention to me still there are a few who do notice me and then i wish they wouldn't I am always glad when the day is over. End of chapter 17。Chapter 18 of Making Fate by Pansy。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。Chapter 18 。Isn't it fun? The talk thus started interrupted the progress of the book for some time. Glyde, being drawn out by questions from Marjorie, gave somewhat in detail her experiences of a year before, and moved them all to laughter by her vivid account. Marjorie added at its close, with some vehemence, that she also hated New Year's calls, and hoped that her mother would not consider it necessary that they should be victimized this year. "'Well, now,' said Mr. Maxwell, "'my experience differs from yours.' I like the old-time custom well carried out. Provided I can have the arranging of my program, I do not know any other day which I enjoy better than the first one of the year. "'Do you always make calls?' asked Glyde, and her tone expressed surprise. "'Always,' he said, smiling. "'May I know why you put that exclamation point into your voice?' Glyde laughed and blushed. I did not know there was an exclamation point in it, she said, but I confess that I felt surprised. You did not impress me like the kind of man who makes New Year's calls. They could not help laughing over this, and Mr. Maxwell declared his inability to decide whether he had been complimented or otherwise. Then he said, I wonder if I could not secure some allies for my calls this year. I do not know many people in this region, and my enjoyment will be limited, I fear, unless I can take friends with me. How would it do for you three ladies to depart from your usual custom and make calls with me? Glyde's eyes opened wide. Why, Mr. Maxwell, ladies do not make New Year's calls, do they? Yes, indeed. I have had the pleasure of taking ladies with me on several occasions. You see, the calls which I plan are not of the conventional order. We take our refreshments with us, even to the coffee, Miss Douglas, though I own that sometimes the ladies have to pour it. Oh, said Glyde, her eyes growing bright. I begin to understand. You call upon poor people, those who have no pleasant holiday, save the part you bring them. Is that it? Must not that be lovely, Marjorie? Oh, I wish I could do it. I would like to go and call on some of those girls I saw in that meeting in New York, and take them some pretty things, and have some good talks with them. 
new york is too far away said mr maxwell will not some girls in your own town do in short for the next half hour the book was practically abandoned while they discussed with steady growing interest this new plan by the time they were ready to return to the story it had been decided that the three ladies should give themselves up for the entire new year afternoon to mr maxwell's directions and guidance it was evident that he knew how to guide them to glyde's exclamation that there were no people in her own town like the girls she meant he had replied that if a town having ten or twelve thousand people in it could be found who would not be the better for the sort of calls he was planning then that town must be ready for the millennium after which he had instanced so many of whom even mrs edmonds had never heard that she frankly admitted his superior knowledge in certain lines at least of the town where she had spent twenty years of her life and he not so many weeks new year's day dawned in glorious beauty and was welcomed by glyde douglas for the first time since her childhood with a certain gleefulness her father not being so well as usual this winter had determined weeks before this not to receive his old acquaintances and glyde was therefore at liberty the girls who had been invited to join some new friends of theirs the McAllisters, and were expecting an especially exciting day had time only to question glyde a little as to her plans and to exclaim over the oddity of it all and over marjorie's willingness to do anything out of the common order however pokey it might be but mrs douglas entered with some zest into the preparations the douglas family were it is true what they called poor but they were ready to make unlimited cake and sandwiches for almost any occasion so glyde's basket was well stocked and it was with very bright eyes indeed that precisely at one o'clock she opened the front door of their home in response to mr maxwell's ring and found a handsome sleigh awaiting her with mrs edmonds in the back seat and marjorie holding the horses miss edmonds was good enough to manage my horses during several stops which we had to make explained mr maxwell as glyde wondered whether she was to have the honor of the back seat and therefore it became necessary to separate her from her mother i will leave you and she to decide who is to have the pleasure of sitting with mrs edmonds now glyde said marjorie would you be afraid to hold these animals while mr maxwell stops at the express office and the market and the confectioners and a dozen other places i never held horses said glyde her eyes dancing but i think i could then that settles it i shall keep my place and lend my mother to you because mr maxwell stops at these places or some other every few minutes and my mother's neck at least is too precious to admit of any aid from novices i have held horses before and i rather enjoy holding these there was a sparkle in her eyes which her mother had not seen for weeks she looked almost like her own bright self at that moment they were off like the wind in a few seconds more as they passed the McAllister home where there was a temporary lull from the stream of callers estelle douglas standing by the window exclaimed isn't that a splendid turnout i declare if that isn't mrs edmund's lodger and marjorie sitting by his side as erect as a princess i really do not know now but that is getting to be a flirtation somebody ought to warn ralph bramlett he is so busy nowadays poor fellow that he doesn't have time to look after her and he doesn't drive such horses as those either entirely oblivious of the eager tongues which thus started were used for some time in discussing their affairs the sleighing party went merrily on its way mrs edmonds was right in thinking that her daughter seemed more like herself but she would have been almost sad over it perhaps had she understood how much effort of will there was about the matter these holiday seasons were times of trial to marjorie such as it would have been hardly possible for one not in full sympathy with her to appreciate 
Christmas and New Year's days, and all the days between, had been so distinctly associated with Ralph Bramlett as far back as her memory reached, that to arrive at such a season, with all association entirely cut off, had about it an element of bewilderment. Christmas Day had been more endurable, because she had learned incidentally that Ralph had been suddenly sent away on important business for his firm, two days before the holiday season opened, but he had returned and the same busy agents who are sure in towns of this size or indeed of almost any size to report in certain sets the doing of others informed her that he intended to make calls as usual it was this fact more than any other which had made marjorie set her face like a flint against keeping open house on that day ralph would not call of course it would be almost insulting in him, after ignoring her for so long, to come on a day when any one who had a bowing acquaintance with her was at liberty to call. Nor could she decide to sit, smiling and talking with other young men, knowing that Ralph was smiling and talking with perhaps Estelle Douglas at the moment, making it apparent at last to everybody that he was not on calling terms with her this might be avoided at least a little longer by letting it be distinctly known that their home was not open to guests on new year's day this she had caused to be made known her next decision had been that she would not sit moping at home for her mother's sake she would rouse herself and do something to make the day pass brightly because her heart ached was no reason why she should selfishly condemn her mother to loneliness and silence. Therefore she had received Mr. Maxwell's proposition with interest, and entered into it with a stern determination to be herself in every respect, so far as outward appearance went. She succeeded remarkably well. The clear frosty air was exhilarating, and Marjorie, always fond of horses, liked to whirl along the streets holding these splendid specimens in with skilful hands not a little to her surprise she also enjoyed the call which they presently made it was upon a teacher old and worn who with his old bent wife occupied two rooms in a large boarding-house and did what they meekly called light housekeeping mr maxwell it appeared knew that their housekeeping was very light indeed that their suppers consisted often of crackers and tea and their breakfasts of bread without butter and tea because they had oh such a tiny income to depend upon and when illness or accident or the utter giving away of some long mended article of clothing necessitated an extra expenditure the butterless bread and the very weak tea followed as a matter of dollars and cents until they could make up the extra sum think what it must have been to set out the little round table for such a couple and laid it with such luxuries as turkey and cranberry sauce and delicious homemade bread and butter which smelled of june roses and pie and cake and cheese and fragrant tea and many another dainty the like of which the old teacher and his old wife had not seen for many a day not only a dinner for this new year's day but enough to crowd the meek little cupboard in the corner with dainties to last them well into the month. It was such a delight as even Mrs. Edmonds had never before experienced. Then what a rare pleasure it was to hear this old couple talk. Glyde Douglas watched, and listened to them almost with awe. How old they were! How white were their hairs! Yet they were refined and cultivated, and sweet and bright the old professor greeted mr maxwell like some beloved pupil of his earlier days called him my dear boy yet talked with him about the latest deliverances in science and the recent paper on anthropology with the keen relish of a man who kept in touch with the present and knew that his views would be treated with respect and the little bent woman with her white satin hair and her dimming eyes and her years fast hastening toward fourscore, had yet her eager interests. Had they heard the latest news from our mission in Syria? 
and wasn't it blessed that in that land of all others the name above every name was beginning to draw the people glide listening to her learned more about the progress of the cause of christ in that faraway portion of the earth than she had ever known before while they listened they worked she and marjorie making everything ready for the feast which the two were to have when they were gone putting away the extra packages of tea sugar and other extras which mr maxwell had marked for them isn't it fun whispered glide while mr maxwell replied with respectful courtesy to the old professor and mrs edmonds listened thoughtfully and interestedly to what the little wife was telling her isn't it fun and isn't it grand in him to think of such fun as this and marjorie her eyes bright with real interest acknowledged that it was when all was ready they gathered round the fire which mr maxwell had replenished royally for he knew that a coal wagon was following in his train and kneeling the old man prayed such a prayer as the patriarch jacob might have made leaning on his staff only this jacob never would have said few and evil have my days been his heart seemed overflowing with gratitude and good cheer and the little old wife suddenly reached forth a trembling hand and placed it tenderly on the head of marjorie who was kneeling nearest her and whispered low bless the child even with a father's blessing did her sweet fading blue eyes discern by the light of another world than this that marjorie was in special need of a blessing this is the nicest time i ever had said glide when they had shaken hands all around and were in the sleigh again mr maxwell i do not in the least wonder that you like to make new year calls if this is a specimen of your kind but they were not all like this the fourth call was in quite another part of the town where the factory tenement houses were mr maxwell knocked twice tried the door then said i think they must all be away from home but at that moment a little curly head appeared at the window and a piping voice called out we're locked in look up high and you'll see the key sure enough dangling above their heads was a small key attached to a string mr maxwell reached for it opened the door and entered with his party a small room with a bed in one corner an old table in another a broken stove where was no fire and children everywhere five of them the oldest who had given directions about the door stood and stared curiously at her visitors the others ran and hid behind the rickety table and the broken chair well marietta said mr maxwell cheerily are you housekeeper and nurse today as usual where is your mother i thought she would be at home isn't this a holiday at the mill yes sir but mamma went to wash for miss wheelock she broke her leg and can't wash and she promised ma some old clothes and a bag of meal if she would come and ma says she's got to do extra work to pay for the doctor's bill and things when jimmy was sick the idea said mrs edmonds a mother with five little children leaving them home alone and going out to wash on new year's day at that said mr maxwell this is her extra you understand a sort of holiday entertainment on ordinary days she works in the mill from six in the morning until six at night this little girl is the woman in charge during her mother's absence was she afraid to let you have a fire marietta yes sir the stove is broke so she thought it wouldn't be safe the baby he tears around the stove and jimmy ain't much better besides we ain't got much coal we are going to have a fire when mother gets home and some potatoes we ain't had our dinner yet the ladies exclaimed over this such a condition of things was a revelation to them but mr maxwell seemed to have heard of such before this family belongs to the class that we occasionally hear of he said to mrs edmonds called the deserving poor the mother is a widow her husband was killed last fall by an accident at the mills 
and she is trying to support her five children and pay doctor's bills and funeral expenses. I am at a loss whether to give the children their treat, or set the basket out of their reach somewhere, and let the mother have the pleasure of ministering to them herself. What do you think? It was Glyde who answered, all her heart in her eyes. Oh, Mr. Maxwell, I know how to plan it. Couldn't you let me stay and clear up this room a little, and put the children in order, and set the table, and make things a little bit homelike for the mother's coming? I should like to do it ever so much. I have some toys and picture books for the children, and some fresh aprons. I could make them look so nice in their mother's eyes. And you could call for me on your return, could you not? Mr. Maxwell's eyes were almost as bright as the girl's. I could, certainly, he said. If you are sure you want to be left here, it is a dreary sort of a place for a young lady. Mrs. Edmonds, what do you advise? Why, if there could be a fire, said that lady, doubtfully, and Glyde is willing, of course it would be a beautiful thing to do, but I should not like to have her stay in the cold. Oh, there must be a fire, he said gaily. I will manage that part if Miss Douglas will engage to keep Jimmy and the baby away from the stove. Marietta, where do you keep your coal? I'm going to make a fire, and this lady will stay a while and help you watch it. Tell your mother that the coal closet will be filled to the brim before night. As he spoke, he threw off the heavy cape of his overcoat and set to work about the old stove, with such skill that in a very few minutes a brisk fire was crackling, and the children, whose noses were blue with cold, despite the sunshine from the one window which the mother had counted upon for warming them, began to creep out from their hiding places and crow and gurgle over the sense of cheer and warmth. She really enjoyed the thought of staying to help them, Mrs. Edmonds said of Glyde, as the sleigh sped away without her. Did you see how bright her face was over the thought of the changes she could make? It was a beautiful thing to do. Some girls would not have been willing to sacrifice themselves in that way. Glyde is very fond of sleigh riding, too, and gets extremely little of it. Her two elder sisters have all the extras in that home. She can make changes, said Mr. Maxwell. I have a sufficiently vivid imagination to be able to foresee what a difference a little soap and water will make there, to say nothing of a few aprons. I think she spoke of aprons. It is fascinating work. I confess I do not wonder that it caught her. Nevertheless, it is true, as you say, that some young women would not have been so caught. Do you remember that Miss Douglas told us the other night that the best thing she had brought away from New York was a more intimate acquaintance with Jesus Christ? I was struck with her words. She shows marks of the intimacy. Marjorie said no word. In her heart she wondered why Glyde had done this thing. There was not dire necessity for it. The children were as well off as they were on most days, probably, and would be again. She could not have done it not that she wanted to ride or cared for the ride, she simply could not have brought herself to the effort. Once she could, but not now. She did not want anything. Was her heart dead, so that she cared not for her own pleasure, nor for the comfort of others? If she had that intimate acquaintance of which Mr. Maxwell spoke, would it make a difference with her? End of chapter 18chapter 19 of making fate by pansy this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 19 you pray their next call was at a very different place a speck of a home part of a tenement house but the part that they entered looking very unlike the rest the doorstep was clean, the coarse white curtains at the windows were clean, and a pot of geraniums in the window bloomed as though they did it for very delight in life. The small room was in perfect order, and a bright fire glowed in the bit of a cook-stove. 
the furnishings were very few and plain the only easy chair the room contained was drawn close to the front window and in it sat a woman of middle age who smiled on them as they entered in response to her invitation but made no effort to rise i'm glad enough to see you she said holding out her hand to mr maxwell i've been thinking you would remember me ever since you told me that you sometimes made new year's calls oh yes i'm quite alone jim couldn't take a holiday a boy who has a helpless mother to support cannot stop for holidays he managed to find some overwork for which he will get extra pay he went off as gay as a lark this morning telling me he would have an extra supper to-night in honour of new year's there never was such a boy ma'am as my jim this to mrs edmonds who had been duly introduced and seated in response to some kindly question the mother was glad to go on yes he's my only one i buried the others when they were babies but jim lived and what i should have done without him i can't even guess it makes me tremble sometimes merely to think of it you see ma'am i'm a cripple i have to be lifted from the bed to the chair and from the chair back to the bed again just as much trouble as a baby would be it is going on four years since i've taken a step it's rheumatism ma'am and taking cold being exposed you know to all sorts of weather i'm a widow yes i've seen hard times my husband was unfortunate as good-hearted a man as ever lived and a skilful workman if he could have let the drink alone but he couldn't the temptations were too much for him he worked for snyder and co the big distillery men and the sight and smell of the stuff seemed to get into his very bones there were a few years when i lived in mortal terror lest my jim should follow his father but he didn't he's as good as gold and i have everything to be thankful for he fixes me up like this every morning before he goes away and here i sit until he gets back at night jane next door comes in at noon and gives me my bit of dinner and she fixes it almost as nice as jim could she works near by so she can run home at noon but jim doesn't she's as good a girl as ever was and couldn't be kinder to me if i was her mother you see she and jim are going to get married if they ever can poor things but i don't see how they ever can while i'm alive and yet they do every blessed thing they can to keep me here both of them yes i don't deny that i get pretty lonesome before six o'clock sometimes if i could read a little it would be different but my eyes are pretty well used up the trouble settled in them one time and i liked to have lost them both they won't read and they won't sew but that last is of no consequence for my hands are so twisted that i couldn't hold the work still my eyes are a good deal of use for i can see the folks passing and i can watch the sun setting we have beautiful sunsets out of this window oh i've lots of blessings isn't it a comfort to be kept so clean and neat all the while i was a master hand for cleaning when i could get around and jim declares i shan't pine for soap and water anyhow and sundays jim reads to me all the morning and jane she comes in the afternoon and she reads some and sings she and jim sing beautiful and we have a bit of a tea together oh sunday is just heaven i have to live all the week on the reading i get sundays she glanced at the little table where lay a book and two papers jim brought me them this morning he thought jane would be at home to-day and i could have some reading for new year's but he hadn't been gone an hour when she came to tell me that she had got a chance to earn an extra dollar and away she went she don't let no extra dollars slip through her fingers she's too eager to help jim for that it was a phase of life utterly unknown to marjorie this clean bright elderly woman sitting in her chair from which she could not move counting her mercies and rejoicing over jim and jane 
as marjorie thought of them and of the pleasant times they must have together caring for the grateful mother she felt that she could almost envy them the tears actually started in her eyes and she moved toward the other window to hide her feelings miss edmonds said mr maxwell will you help me unpack this basket and arrange the goods in mrs baxter's cupboard marjorie went at once and busied herself with the packages her mother was still talking with the crippled woman she came over to mr maxwell presently smiling as she spoke i believe i have caught glyde's disease i would like to stay here a little while and read to this poor woman don't you think she has a letter from her sister in scotland the postman brought it this morning and she is waiting for evening and jim or jane in order to hear it have you another errand which you and marjorie could do while i read that letter and a scrap or two from the paper and a few verses from the book that is the way she speaks of the bible jim always reads a few verses from the book she says before he puts me to bed mr maxwell signified his entire willingness to carry out his part of the program and of course there was nothing for marjorie but assent she was however not disturbed but the rather amused by this turn of events is there not some old woman or baby with whom you can leave me she asked laughing as they drove away then you might take your drive in peace and quietness what if we should take the drive first he asked i have only one more call on my list we shall probably be detained there but a moment and i am afraid the letter from scotland will not have been read by the time we could return i am disposed if you do not object to drive out on the foundry road for a mile or two the sleighing is exceptionally good on that road and selim and his friend are impatient for one real spin it was a regular spin his own fine horse was well mated and being allowed free rein they fairly flew over the road the sleighing was as mr maxwell had said superb and despite her belief that her heart was dead marjorie could not help enjoying the exhilarating motion it was when they were on the return trip that the blood flowed in unnatural waves to her face and then receded for there passed them also making rapid speed a single sleigh in which were seated ralph bramlett and estelle douglas ralph had departed from his usual custom then and instead of making new year's calls was giving the day to estelle a sudden conviction came to marjorie that the two were engaged and with it the feeling that if this were so she ought not to even think of ralph any more she could not know of course that estelle instead of taking a sleigh ride should have been at that moment in the McAllister's parlors receiving calls nor that she had said to ralph who came in his sleigh to call that she was just dying for a breath of fresh air the rooms had been so crowded and so overheated all day didn't he want to take her a few rods up the road until she could get her breath now ralph had determined in his own strong mind that the very next call he made should be upon marjorie edmonds also that he would act as though he supposed of course that she was receiving as usual and perhaps he would make a formal call just as any gentleman of slight acquaintance with her might do he would be guided by circumstances having decided while he was at the McAllister's upon this sudden course of action he chafed under the delay involved in taking estelle for that breath of fresh air but he could not well refuse a point-blank request of the kind and then they had passed selim and his friend rushing over the ground with mr maxwell and marjorie this was estelle's opportunity upon my word matters are really getting serious in that direction what do you mean ralph by allowing it glyde says the edmonds lodger spends all his evenings with the family reading aloud and visiting he even takes tea there very frequently glyde is cultivating an intimacy with marjorie since she came home and is always meeting mr maxwell she was to drive with them to-day she and the mother edmonds for appearances sake i suppose 
but they have done something with both of their companions and are whirling along quite alone they have been out since noon i must say that if people did not know that you and marjorie belonged to each other it would look like a serious matter as it is it looks queer do you honestly enjoy such goings-on excuse my asking the question we are friends of such long standing ralph was white to his lips but his voice was perfectly steady you have an alarming way of taking things for granted estelle why should people suppose that they know so much about my affairs i have never taken them into confidence as a matter of fact mr maxwell is at liberty to take marjorie edmonds for as many drives as he pleases i mean so far as i am concerned i never meant to be selfish in my friendships i might as well say i did not like to have you ride out with your friends as to object to her doing it once for all estelle marjorie edmonds is on exactly the same footing with me as are my other old friends and she is nothing more i am very glad said estelle with so much feeling in her voice that he could not doubt it glad for your sake i mean forgive me ralph for saying so i might have known that you were man enough to look after your own interests but i felt so sure from things that glyde has told me and from what i have seen and heard myself that marjorie was getting very deeply interested in mr maxwell that i feared i really did that there was trouble in store for you ralph laughed a harsh unmusical laugh and begged her not to borrow any trouble on his account but all this of course marjorie did not know she was at that moment being helped from the sleigh in front of one of the dreariest tenement houses at which they had stopped that day i am very much interested in the woman i am going to take you to see mr maxwell had told her as they drove she is a young wife and an unhappy one she married a poor victim of snyder snyder and co's business married him not knowing how deeply he drank i believe and has learned it since to her terror and horror he is one of the cruel kind when he is intoxicated has actually kicked her more than once and she is a slight frail creature it makes my blood boil when i think of what she has suffered already from that man and what she must suffer if she lives the last time i saw her she was ill with a violent cold i could not help thinking that perhaps that was to be her way out of the tragedy which she has made of life but i do not know those frail creatures sometimes live and suffer will you give her some of those oranges you brought miss edmonds i have a basket of nourishing food for her she looks to me as though she might be quietly and systematically starving herself then they had knocked at the dreary door again and again receiving no reply mr maxwell looked above and around him for a key this cannot be another case of locking in i should think he said for she and her worthless husband live alone i should like to lock him in and leave him until he acquired some sense but i am afraid she would not resort to any such measures miss edmonds i am going to open this door it is not locked and i have a sort of presentiment that something may be wrong saying which he turned the knob and as the door swung open there was revealed to them the face of a figure on the bed who seemed to marjorie to be all eyes i said come in she explained but i could not speak loud enough even this brief explanation was given with difficulty the speaker stopping again and again and panting for breath mr maxwell looked inexpressibly shocked you are suffering very much he said how can we help you are you alone she nodded her head explaining again with great difficulty that her neighbor on the left was kind and often looked in to help her but today she was gone away and the folks on the right didn't speak to her then gathering all her strength she put it into an earnest question could you find my jack i don't want anything else 
i haven't seen him in four days and i must see him again before she did not finish her sentence it was only too evident what she meant i will try said mr maxwell and i will bring you a doctor right away you must have help she tried to shake her head and to explain again about the only thing she wanted but a terrible paroxysm of coughing seized her mr maxwell supported her head as well as he could and marjorie came in haste with a cup which seemed to contain water the woman tried to take a swallow and presently fell back utterly exhausted mr maxwell tiptoed from the room motioning marjorie after him she has gone down with incredible rapidity he said it is three weeks since i last saw her could you would it be possible for you to remain here while i go for a doctor and some help the houses on either side seem to be deserted and we cannot leave her alone can we no said marjorie we cannot i will stay of course but never in her life had she so shrank from what was a manifest duty if her mother were only here he saw the thought in her eyes i will get your mother as soon as i can miss edmonds but she is quite a distance from here remember and i think there should be a physician without delay the woman looks to me as though she were dying he was untying and unblanketing his horses while he spoke and with the last word was off marjorie returned to the apparently dying woman a great terror was upon her heart what if the poor creature should die while mr maxwell was away she could not help feeling that in such a case the woman might as well be utterly alone for all the help her presence could afford what did she know about death she had never in her life seen any one die to her childish eyes her father had looked much as usual on that last night when he had kissed her and smiled on her and held his hand on her head while he prayed for her and then she had gone away and slept and in the morning her mother had told her gently very gently trying to smile through her tears that the angels had come in the night and carried her father away to his beautiful home but it was not possible to surround this dying bed with any idea of beauty or any suggestion of angels the woman was in mortal suffering was in need of help and she could not help her the extreme exhaustion which followed the last paroxysm of coughing did not pass marjorie moistened her lips bathed her forehead and fanned her gently but the gray pallor which had overspread the woman's face deepened rather than lessened she looked at marjorie with great hungry eyes that had a mute appeal in them which was worse than words what is it the girl asked gently holding herself to outward quiet by a supreme effort is there something i can do for you try to bear it for a few minutes mr maxwell has gone for the doctor and for my mother they will be able to do something to help you but the hungry look remained in those great sad eyes the power of speech seemed to have left her at last evidently summoning her waning strength for one mighty effort she spoke distinctly one word pray oh said marjorie with blanching face and her voice sounded like a groan i cannot pray she looked like one in mortal terror she turned and gazed beseechingly toward the door if mr maxwell could only come if anybody would come who knew how to pray could she let this woman die with that one beseeching word on her lips receiving no response yet how was it possible for her to pray to attempt such a thing she felt would be mockery she knew much theoretically of the character of god she had learned many verses in her childhood verses which indicated his willingness to hear the feeblest cry they thronged about her now and pressed her with their questions ought she not to try to speak for this departing soul 
he would know that her words were sincere and that she did not know how to pray under the spell of those solemn inquiring eyes which seemed to burn into her soul she dropped upon her knees covered her face with her hands and cried out o oh god have mercy on this woman for christ's sake and give her what she needs just that sentence nothing more pray said the voice again from the bed and she repeated the same sentence again and yet again no others came to her after a little she arose and continued her small ministrations bathing the temples moistening the white lips trying meantime to find the thread of life in the woman's wrist for her eyes had closed and she was lying again as one dead the sound of bells broke on the intolerable stillness and in a moment more marjorie heard mr maxwell's step at the door he came swiftly over to the bedside and spoke to her in a low tone the doctor will be here in a few minutes i did not wait to get your mother she is a mile away in the other direction and i thought perhaps you would prefer to have me wait until the doctor came before going for her has your patient made any sign of life before marjorie could reply the great troubled eyes opened once more but they seemed not to see and fixed themselves on vacancy her lips moved and formed distinctly that one word again lower than it was before just a faint shadow of a word now pray mr maxwell bending to listen caught the word and was on his knees in a moment marjorie knelt beside him it was so good to have one who could pray then the poor woman's needs were presented before the king in the words of one who had long known how earnest direct in language simple as a child would use it seemed to marjorie that no human speech could be better fitted to her needs yet there was a restless movement of the sick woman's hands presently she turned her eyes and sought marjorie's face and said in a solemn whisper you pray mr maxwell looked well nigh startled as marjorie herself had done he knew that whatever ability this young girl might have to minister to human pain she had not learned this supreme need of the soul miss edmonds he said she is asking you to pray oh said marjorie again in bitter anguish i cannot pray why does she want it when you are here kneel down mr maxwell and pray again do she cannot mean me it was evident that the woman understood you she said distinctly with her eyes on marjorie that same prayer mr maxwell looked bewildered but marjorie understood she must be calling for those very words which had been spoken in her extremity could she possibly speak them before this man who knew that she did not pray yet what was any man now in a few minutes the woman would be in the presence of god could she let her go with her last cry refused she must say those words again in much less time than it has taken to record them these thoughts passed through her mind and once more she was on her knees saying oh god have mercy on this woman and give her what she needs for christ's sake amen said mr maxwell again said the voice of the dying and again marjorie's tremulous lips cried the prayer have mercy for christ's sake it was the voice from the bed which repeated those words slowly distinctly once twice three times pausing many times for breath the voice grew fainter ceased she lay quite still but her eyes were not closed they were lifted upward and on her face there was the semblance of a smile end of chapter 19chapter twenty of making fate by pansy this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty questions needing answers 
let us rejoice that we have a god who is always ready to hear said mr maxwell as the solemn silence having continued for some minutes they arose from their knees this has been a very trying ordeal to you he added kindly i did not realize that she was so near death or i would not have left you asked marjorie in an awe-stricken voice her face almost as pale as that of the silent woman on the bed the pulse has stopped with her last breath she said for christ's sake let us hope that she is even now in his visible presence life here had certainly no joy for her and but little hope there is nothing more that we can do miss edmonds but i think we must remain until the doctor comes there are no neighbors to whom we can appeal the doctor must surely come in a few minutes even while he spoke there was the merry jingle of bells coming to a halt before the door at the same moment the back door opened and a woman with a shawl over her head appeared how is she she asked nodding to marjorie as she spoke i've been gone all day and i couldn't help kind of worrying about her she seemed so low and miserable this morning oh mercy you don't say she is gone dear dear i was afraid of it and yet i didn't think it would be so sudden or i would have let the dollar go poor as i am and stayed with her and she has been alone here all day i suppose poor young thing it seems awful cruel doesn't it but there what else could we do poor folks has to work and i thought i could afford to get some extra bits of comfort for her with this day's work oh no ma'am she ain't nothing to me except that i'm her next-door neighbor and i've tried to do for her as well as i could i've looked in every morning before i went away and every night when i came back and saturdays and odd times i've took hold and helped do up her bit of work i felt sorry for her on account of her being so young and so sick and having such a worthless husband she mourned for him so that's just what has broke her down she ain't seen a sight of him now for three or four days by and by he will come snivelling home and go on at the greatest rate because she is gone and he did nothing for her while she was here i ain't no patience with them kind of men jack would be a decent fellow too if he could let the whiskey alone it is that awful whiskey that makes such times for poor folks ma'am and then to see decent people helping the trade along that beats me well we'll do everything we can for her now she's gone that's mr maxwell isn't it i thought i knew him he's been awful good to her been here time and again brought her oranges and things and coal and once he built up a fire with his own hands and he's talked and prayed with her and everything he's a saint that man is if ever there was one i'm glad he was here to-day i wonder if he knows anything about jack dr potter suddenly turning her attention to the physician to whom a single glance at the bed had revealed the condition of things he was drawing on his gloves again while he exchanged a few words with mr maxwell dr potter don't you know where we could find jack taylor you know him don't you that good-for-nothing fellow who is always drunk nowadays when he isn't at home sleeping off the effects he ain't been home for almost a week that's what has run her down so but he ought to be looked up now for decency's sake if we could get him sober enough for the funeral it seems as if it would kind of comfort her the doctor had no information or advice to give beyond the suggestion that they see some of the distillery men from snyder's he had heard that jack taylor was hanging around there trying to get work again though he had been twice discharged they ought to keep him said the woman significantly he begun this thing out there was as nice a fellow as ever i see till he went to work for them they might finish up their work i think there wouldn't be any need for their business anyhow if it wasn't for the drunkards or those who are travelling that road as fast as they can then while the doctor made haste away she turned her attention to mr maxwell 
that gentleman however cut her short in the midst of a sentence and did much of the talking himself he spoke low so that marjorie could not catch a word save that as he turned away she heard him say i will come to-morrow morning and give you any further help you may need i think you understand that you are to do whatever is needful yes said the woman nodding her head there was an undercurrent of satisfaction in her voice which it was impossible not to note i understand and i thank you kindly too i was troubled to see how we could give her decent burial and we so poor all of us and him so shiftless and worthless it is very good of you and we won't forget it she was too much of a lady to be buried by the town they was a nice young couple once mr maxwell a woman i used to work for used to know her before she was married she says she come of a good family and they didn't want her to marry jack but she would and they kind of got out with her and now they are gone father and mother both but jack was sober enough when she married him had been sober for quite a spell and she thought she could keep him from drinking any more just as lots of women folks do it is queer how one after another we women make exactly the same blunder and no one learns from the last one that good woman loves to talk mr maxwell said with a faint smile as he helped marjorie to her seat in the sleigh but her heart is in the right place silence for a few minutes then he added with a heavy sigh the woman is right miss edmonds day after day and year after year the tragedy goes on being played before our eyes woman after woman grave after grave not only women but little children sacrificed to our moloch and the christian world looks on and sometimes sighs and oftener smiles and lets it go sometimes i get so wrought up about this liquor business that it seems to me impossible to live longer in a country which permits it i wonder that the victims do not lose their reason and rise in protest a strike of the wives of drunkards miss edmonds a riot made up of the wives and children and mothers who are victims of the saloon can you imagine it the connection might not have been plain to all persons but despite her effort to put the thought away there arose before marjorie just then the image of a bookkeeper in a distillery what had he to do with jack taylor the drunkard who had broken his wife's heart he was merely a bookkeeper and bookkeeping every one knows is legitimate employment new year's day was over at last and marjorie was in her room alone free to go over all its varied experiences and let her face flush and pale and her heart tremble if it would without fear of being watched and commented upon mr maxwell had been very thoughtful of her during that homeward drive shielding her as much as possible even from her mother we struck sorrow in one of its most desolating forms he explained and your daughter has been tried in strength and nerves then after giving her a very brief account of what had taken place he began to question her in regard to the old lady to whom she had ministered leaving no room for questions upon her part concerning the tragedy they two had lived through when glyde joined them the way was easier she was in a high state of excitement and enthusiasm they had had wonderful times she and the children it had been so delightful to wash their faces and comb their hair and make changes in their dresses which amazed them it had been such fun to sweep the room and clear off the shelf and put everything in order even to the washing of the few poor dishes and they had set the table with dainty things which the baskets furnished and gotten everything ready for the mother's homecoming then to see that mother's face when she finally came that was beyond even glyde's descriptive powers she had never had such an experience in her life before she knew now just what she would like to do in the world didn't they have city missionaries or town missionaries in some places whose duty it was to go around among the people and do just such things she had read of them she thought 
wouldn't it be possible for her to get some such work to do didn't they pay salaries for such work she wouldn't want any pay now of course but if she should take it up for a life work one wouldn't want much just enough to buy very plain clothes and a little food every day how perfectly delightful it would be to give one's whole time to work like that mr maxwell entered heartily into her enthusiasm helped her plans along by suggesting ways out of difficulties which presented themselves to her mind and evolved new plans by his very questions it is true he thought that it would be necessary for her to wait until she was a little older but he assured her soothingly that time was a very fast traveller and that some morning before she knew it she would awaken old enough to take such work upon her shoulders she argued that point with him a little why did everybody persist in thinking her so young she was nineteen nearly as old as marjorie who everybody knew was a young lady while they spoke of her as a little girl that was simply because she had two older sisters who themselves considered her a child but why should she wait to be old children would like her better as she was and it was the children she wanted to reach she wanted to tell them stories such stories as would help them why they were startlingly ignorant those children with whom she had been visiting they knew almost nothing of the bible and their ideas of god were really shocking it was true mr maxwell said gravely home missionaries were needed in just that line and in the very town in which she lived perhaps she could do something in a small way even while she was so young but there were difficulties to be considered in many families where the children were in sore need it would not be safe for a young lady to visit for instance he would hardly have left her where he did had he not been quite sure that the husband and father who lived just next door was not at home and would not be during the day sometimes it was very unsafe for a stranger and a lady to be in the neighborhood when he was at home the trouble is miss douglas he said gravely that rum makes husbands and fathers and neighbors into wild animals sometimes it is that element in some form or other which renders it unsafe for young ladies to do a great many things which they might otherwise do it is however only too true that if it were not for rum a great deal of the work would not need to be done so the problem is complicated throughout these conversations mr maxwell almost pointedly left marjorie outside even answering for her once or twice when glyde appealed to her it was done in such a manner that she could not but understand him as planning rest for her overstrained nerves he by no means forgot her the slightest disarrangement of the robes which were carefully tucked about her was noticed and remedied on the instant and in a dozen little unobtrusive ways did he let her know that his thought was for her once he gave her the reins for a moment and bending forward rearranged the wrappings about her feet while he did so ralph bramlett's sleigh passed them and that young man glowered at him in a way that he would not have understood had he noticed it as for marjorie she missed the look mr maxwell was leaning forward in such a manner that she could not see who passed them alone in her room that evening she thought of those quiet attentions and was grateful she saw in them only added marks of his thoughtfulness for womanhood how gracious and courteous and kind he was always truly kind and truly good she realized it that evening as she had not before she told herself that it was pleasant to have such a man for a friend and that she would never forget all the kindnesses he had shown to her mother and herself then she turned her thoughts from him and allowed herself to gaze steadily at ralph bramlett for a few minutes realizing in the depths of her heart that it was a sort of farewell gaze it had now become very plain to her that he had settled his future when next she met estelle douglas 
she felt certain that she would have a story to tell which would prove the truth of this such being the case it should have something to do with those letters and gifts which she had decided long ago not to return that decision had not been reversed but she must keep them no longer since ralph bramlett belonged to another she had no right to treasure the tokens of his long friendship for her there was a cheery fire burning in her grate more for pleasure than necessity as the house was heated by furnace but it would serve her purpose well to-night she brought out the locked box and untied package after package to assure herself that nothing besides ralph's notes had by accident been included with them then not allowing herself to read so much as a page she consigned them one by one to the flames it was a slow grave piece of work as one might steadily and knowingly put away what had been part of one's very self not only letters but valentines pretty boyish ones which had come to her in the days when both were children and had spent hours in studying what selections to make for each other then there were dainty booklets ribbon tied two or three of them heart-shaped and there were cards with very special verses underscored some with verses written on the reverse side in ralph's own fine style he was a good penman and had always enjoyed doing especially fine work for marjorie's eyes these cards pretty as they were must be sacrificed to the flames even the underscored sentences were such as it would not do to have on exhibition now there were dried flowers half-blown rosebuds withered before their time and pressed violets by the handful the flames leaped up about them eagerly seeming to rejoice in this wholesome holocaust marjorie lingered over a photograph of ralph taken when he was just nineteen it was a boyish handsome face surely she might keep that people had photographs of their friends she held it long clasped it in both hands and considered the conclusion was that she leaned forward solemnly and laid it on the coals she would be true not only to herself but to that other woman who had a right to claim ralph now this could not be like other photographs standing about on easels on library tables or family room mantles to be handled and chatted over by friends this had memories and associations which could never be separated from it she did not want to keep it it was not hers any longer she did not hurry through any part of this work she was slow and grave more like a middle-aged woman who was taking a retrospective view of her long-ago past rather than a girl who was putting away what was so recent and vivid in truth ralph's management of this entire affair had removed him so far away from her and made the time seem so long that sometimes she almost thought it must be years since she had met him familiarly all the while she was at work there was in her mind a solemn undertone of feeling that there was something else something of infinitely more importance which must be considered she was not one who could get soon or lightly away from the experiences of that afternoon death in one of its most solemn forms had confronted her she had almost been alone with it she had realized its certainty as never before the thought had forced itself upon her heart that here was one who would be faithful no matter how long he delayed he was absolutely certain to come at last and he might appear at any moment how suddenly he had come to the woman whom she had watched die taking the miserable husband so utterly unawares that perhaps he did not even yet know that his wife had escaped from him forever for such an absolute certainty as this the merest common sense would suggest that one ought to be ready but there was more than this thought pressing upon her heart she felt alone dreary desolate in need of a friend such a friend as jesus christ seemed to be not only to mr maxwell but to glyde douglas the young girl who was maturing so rapidly and so sweetly under his guidance 
what must it be to have an ever-present friend to speak to as mr maxwell had spoken to the lord jesus that afternoon what must it be to be able to realize his help in trouble in little troubles as glyde had said as well as in the heavier ones which were weighing down her soul she believed in christianity she believed in the lord jesus christ as a personal saviour she knew there were people who had so accepted him and who lived in daily realization of his presence suppose that the great mass of those who professed this were merely church members as she had hinted to glide the other day what had that to do with her since there were some genuine christians must she needs to be a hypocrite or a worldling or a self-deceived professor in the depths of her heart she knew that from her childhood there had been an intention to some time give her mind to this subject and settle it for herself for the first time in her life this intention presented itself before her as something not much better than an insult so long as it was delayed was it possible that she could be the sort of person who would be willing to dally with such offers of love and help and care as this besides what utter folly it was could a reasonable being find one excuse for it that hour of death about which she had thought why not get ready for it that poor woman struggling for breath gasping out her wants in language almost unintelligible ought to have had no such serious business to attend to at that hour ought to have been ready moreover she might not have had even those few last moments in which to try to repair her lifetime of neglect the moment marjorie thought this that other thought about the insult of it all presented itself to her in a new form could anything be meaner than for a girl like herself for instance young and strong with such opportunity for work before her perhaps to deliberately put away the claims of this one who asked for allegiance now put them away until some hour when she should feel herself in sore need and then cry to him to give her what she had refused at his hands through the years imagine an earthly friend so treated marjorie's heart was very sore just then over earthly friendships she knew just how silence and coldness and indifference could sting was it a possible thing that jesus christ wanted her claimed her love would give her love in return and she had been treating his call not with scorn but with what was in some respects worse utter indifference how could she expect him to tarry much longer waiting for her why should she wait didn't she need him oh didn't she need him now could she do it could she be the sort of christian that she should she had been held back she knew for years by the feeling that there were too many christians now of a certain kind and that she would only be another of the same sort but since there were experiences which seemed to change one's very nature could not she have such a change as this how did people get it End of chapter twenty Chapter Twenty One of Making Fate by Pansy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty One Give Me What I Need. Theoretically, Marjorie Edmonds knew a great deal about conversion, yet when it came to the practical, she realized that her knowledge was very unsatisfactory. The words repentance and regeneration had been as familiar, all through her childhood, almost as her own name. The catechism of her mother's church was ABC to her, so far as mere words were concerned, but she had not understood their meaning any better than Ralph Bramlett had the meaning of the Lord's Prayer. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, was one of the familiar verses which floated through her mind. What did it mean? she had believed on him all her life she knew that he was a reality and a saviour but she knew also that she was not saved seek ye first the kingdom of god and his righteousness was another verse which came and stood before her 
that indeed she had not done she had put his claim deliberately from her too many times not to be sure of it but how did one seek and how long a process was it it ought not to be very long she reflected because there was that faithful messenger who might come what was there to assure her that he might not call for her that very night even while she slept people did die so she had heard of more than one instance and that recently of sudden death no she was not frightened she was not in any sense of the word a coward she did not suppose it very probable that she would be called to die before morning she was simply like a person of common sense she told herself looking at the possibilities besides she did not want to wait for long processes she wanted to settle it now oh marjorie won't you think about what i asked you glyde had murmured as she clasped her hand for good-bye that afternoon there had been no opportunity for further words but marjorie had understood glyde had not known what she had been through nor how certainly she would have to think about these things this evening but surely they required more than thinking about she felt very far away indeed from christ felt as though some tremendous change ought to be wrought within her before she would dare intrude upon him yet this was not in accordance with her theoretic teaching it must be however something like what people meant when they talked about conversion but how did they get it she looked for her bible with a vague feeling that it ought to be able to point the way she knew no better where to read than ralph bramlett had done but she had no idea of starting with the first chapter of genesis she had not yet learned how to find christ in the old testament and it was christ she wanted she opened it at random and read jesus answered and said unto him what wilt thou that i should do unto thee the blind man said unto him lord that i might receive my sight jesus said unto him go thy way thy faith hath made thee whole and immediately he received his sight and followed jesus in the way the story though perfectly familiar to her sounded new for some reason it touched the fountain of tears and they began to gather for the first time in many days how short it was that prayer shorter even than the one she had offered for the dying woman and how instantaneous and complete was the answer immediately he received his sight and followed jesus in the way was she ready to follow him certainly she would be she thought if she only knew what following meant in her case if any man will come after me let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me this verse her eye rested on as she turned the leaves was she ready to deny herself but deny herself of what the cross yes she had a cross and it was heavy but the lord jesus christ had nothing to do with it so she thought it was altogether a human cross and she was bearing it alone if there were another to bear for him she would be almost glad of it but she did not know how to find it if he were here so that she might speak to him as the blind man did if he were out on the street she would go this minute in the night and the darkness and hurry until she caught up with him then what would she say lord that i might receive my sight yes that would do it was what she wanted such mental sight as would enable her to understand his ways in which she wanted to walk would he say to her go thy way thy faith hath made thee whole perhaps faith was what she needed yet she believed in christ still she owned to herself that she did not believe could not make herself believe that he really and truly cared for her as an individual that he would pay any attention to what she said why should he there was nothing in her to win his love nothing about her that he could enjoy it was inconceivable that he would be willing to hold intimate companionship with her day by day yet if he should it would make all her life different it is that which i need she said aloud and sorrowfully i need to be entirely different 
to be made over but after all that is pure selfishness i do not suppose he answers selfish prayers i suppose i want him because i am so utterly tired of myself oh i don't know what i want nor how to do any of it the words of prayer which she had repeated so often that afternoon recurred again to her if that was prayer it might answer for her as well as for the dying woman god have mercy on me she might say and give me what i need she sat and stared at the dying fire and the ashes of the treasures which she had committed to it for several minutes longer then rising slowly knelt before her chair and laying her head wearily on its cushions repeated the words of which she had been thinking o oh god have mercy on me and give me what i need for christ's sake he who knows the uttermost need of the human heart could tell better what that prayer meant than she could herself long she knelt using no other words not repeating those again not praying consciously simply waiting she was not even thinking there seemed to have come a lull in her thoughts presently there came to her the memory of a little old book hidden behind finer ones on the library shelves its title was how i found the way it was an old-fashioned book and its language was quaint and queer at least it had struck them so she and ralph had laughed together over some of its phrases but the title was suggestive perhaps it could point the way for which she was seeking she wished she had the book there had come to her an overpowering desire to have this matter settled she felt almost afraid of putting it from her again something she was almost tempted to think that it was some one was saying to her soul now is the time why should she not go downstairs and get that old book the door was closed between her mother's room and hers as it often was during these days her mother must be sleeping she could go so quietly as not to disturb her besides it could not be late she had come early to her room if her mother should hear her it would be a commonplace enough explanation that she was in search of a book not giving herself time for further thought she softly unlocked the door and slipped down the heavily carpeted stairs match in hand she meant not to light the gas until she reached the back parlor but the back parlor was lighted and standing before the bookcase open book in hand was mr maxwell he turned as the door swung open and spoke at once miss edmonds i hope i have not frightened you your mother gave me permission to mouse along these old books of hers i am in search of a quotation of whose authorship i am not certain miss edmonds i hope you are not ill can i serve you in any way for he could not but note her extreme pallor and in her eyes was a new look of whose meaning he could not be sure he came towards her as he spoke and instinctively placed a chair for her she did not look able to stand i came for a book said marjorie taking a sudden resolution but perhaps you will do better than a book there is something that i want to know if i can help you in any way be sure i shall only be too glad to do so he spoke with exceeding gravity something in her tone and manner indicated that what she wanted to know was to be met with utmost seriousness she dropped into the chair he had drawn toward her and sat for some seconds looking straight before her into the fire which still smouldered in the grate saying nothing mr maxwell she began at last that woman who we saw die this afternoon she was not ready to die was she no said mr maxwell she was not ready to live therefore of course not ready to die the claims of the lord jesus christ had been pressed upon her many times and she had put them aside for what seemed to her more important matters yet miss edmonds we have so wonderful and so merciful a saviour that i can but hope and believe that he had pity for her ignorance and sympathy for her sorrows and heard that eleventh hour cry of hers 
and took her to himself i am sorry that one so young and so unused to trouble as you are should have been suddenly thrust into the midst of such a scene i know that it cannot but have made a deep impression but i hope you will not let it wear upon your nerves it isn't that she said quickly i am not nervous at least i have never supposed that i was i don't think it is because i am nervous that i have come to the conclusion which i have to-night perhaps it is simply common sense mr maxwell i want to know jesus christ to have a personal acquaintance with him such as glyde douglas speaks of i want him for a friend a burden-bearer her voice trembled a little as she spoke those last words but she hurried on apparently in fear that she might be interrupted i suppose i want what people mean when they talk about conversion but i do not know how to get it i have been reared in a christian home by a christian mother who tried to make the way plain the terms which people use in speaking about these matters have been familiar to me since childhood but some way they seem to be all words they do not convey any meaning to me the bible says believe on the lord jesus christ and thou shalt be saved now i have always believed on him there is in my mind no shadow of doubt as to his existence and his power and his love for that matter but i am not saved and i am conscious that i am not what is there for me to do are you sure that you believe on him if you do will you not follow his directions that is precisely what i want to do i am telling you that i do not know how the very first step to take is unknown to me give yourself to him miss edmonds she turned quickly and looked at him out of earnest troubled eyes mr maxwell how can i do it i do not understand he is not here not in visible presence how is it possible for me to give anything to him that is figurative language of course but it does not express anything to me what does it mean miss edmonds will you give that handkerchief which lies in your lap to me she glanced down at the square of linen then back to his face with a most surprised look after a moment's hesitation she said yes of course but i do not get your meaning she picked it up however and reached it forth to him he took it with utmost gravity thank you he said and then he wheeled a chair near her and sat down miss edmonds he said in passing this handkerchief over to me were you not conscious of a distinct act of your will you could of course have denied my request could have said distinctly no i will not give it to you or saying nothing could still have denied me instead you consciously deliberately passed it from your possession into mine now what i want to convey by that illustration is the thought that there must be a conscious effort of the human will in this transaction between the lord jesus christ and yourself he asks for yourself your power your strength your love your allegiance in short all that is comprised in that term yourself now you can refuse him you have the power you can do so deliberately with a heart determination or you can do it by putting aside his claim treating it with indifference allowing yourself to forget all about it or you can consciously and deliberately declare to him that you now from this time give yourself into his keeping to be directed guided managed it is as deliberate an act of will as it was to pass over your handkerchief to me do you get my thought in part she said after a moment's hesitation but not entirely after all to give one's self means to give one's affections and i cannot make myself love any one can i no you cannot but the lord jesus christ can that is his part your part is the surrender it is not a matter of feeling but of decision you might have disliked to give me this handkerchief you might not have had the least desire to do it yet you might have obliged your will to perform the act 
the mistake which we make in dealing with religious questions is to suppose that the matter turns of necessity on a question of feeling i admit that there is likely to be more or less feeling at such a time but not that it is to be taken into special consideration if there is an honest deliberate intention to give one's powers to the lord jesus christ to be known henceforth as his servant to wear his colors as it were to walk day by day in the paths which he directs to do as fast as we understand it his pleasure we may safely leave our feelings to take care of themselves he on his part is pledged to take away the heart which does not feel for him and give in its stead a heart of flesh the divine part of this matter the regeneration is something which we do not understand it is something which the lord does for us in his infinite love and infinite power but our part is very plain we are not to make ourselves love him we are not to wait until we do love him it is part of his infinite condescension that we are permitted even to say to him that we are not conscious of any love for him in our strange hard hearts but that we have resolved to serve him and he will hear us and accept us and ratify the covenant the marriage relation which is so often used as an illustration of this matter is not complete in all its parts illustrations rarely are in every true marriage the heart has passed over into another's keeping before the vows are taken but in this marriage between the lord jesus christ and the soul he accepts the vows even though we are not conscious that love goes with them because he can control the human heart when the will is given into his keeping and he knows that the love will follow am i making my meaning plain yes she said i think so it is something of that kind which has troubled me i did not feel sure that i loved any one i don't think i feel with my heart at all it is just my judgment is your judgment willing to make the decision and leave the feelings to him there was not an immediate reply to this question and after waiting a moment mr maxwell continued it was once my privilege to work in a series of meetings with an old and eminently successful minister of christ and i remember and have occasion to do so with deep gratitude the form of covenant which he used it ran in this wise i do now upon my knees in thy presence give myself to thee i do this honestly intelligently deliberately for time and for eternity are you ready to make such a surrender of self as that marjorie had removed her eyes from the smouldering fire and was looking down she was still silent for several moments then she raised her eyes to his face and spoke slowly i believe i am mr maxwell if i understand myself i think i am in dead earnest i have thought about this matter before of course but never as i have to-night i may say that i had reached the decision before i came downstairs i came in search of a book which i thought might show me the way to do it but i think i understand you perhaps better than i should have understood the book still i am not satisfied i feel mean it seems to me that i am taking all and giving nothing there is nothing in me for christ to love i do not know how it is possible for him to love me i am selfish and hard and utterly hateful yet i cannot help wanting his love and care the tears started as she spoke and dropped slowly down on the hand with which she suddenly covered her eyes yes i know that is what we bring to him utterly unworthy of his love selfish we seem to ourselves in our very longing for it unable it seems to us to do a thing for him in return yet he waits for just such gifts as these pledges eternal love and care and begs us to accept the gift may i kneel with you now miss edmonds and will you give yourself to him while he waits her answer was to rise and drop on her knees a moment's solemn stillness 
Then her voice, clear and steady, repeated, as nearly as she could remember them, the words which Mr. Maxwell had given her. Especially were the tones distinct and slow when she repeated that word, deliberately, and those other words, for time and for eternity. Amen, said Mr. Maxwell, then he followed with a few earnest words of prayer, commending this newcomer to the special and tender care of the covenant-keeping Lord. She remembered long afterward how earnestly he asked that her heart might be so filled to overflowing with the love of Christ as to make all other loves seem unnecessary. As they arose, he held out his hand to her with a grave smile. "'It is needless to try to tell you how much I thank you,' he said, for letting me be a witness to this compact. I feel that it means solemn business, not only for eternity, but for time. And there is a sense in which that is more important to us now than eternity. It is our opportunity for service. I am sure there has been a worker received into the army tonight. God bless you and grant you the joy of harvest. I have no fears whatever in regard to that matter of feeling." I hope you will not allow the enemy of souls to torment you concerning it. You will love the Lord Jesus Christ with a supreme and all-controlling love as soon as you come to know him better. A woman like you, who admires what is beautiful and good and pure, cannot help loving him. It is only because your interests have been absorbed elsewhere that you have not settled with him long before." He walked with her to the door and held it open for her to pass. It was at that moment that the sound of the doorbell pealed through the quiet house. End of chapter 21